Hello everybody, welcome to another installment of uh, Paradigm Shift and Educational Comedy, Google Hangout. Um, Merry Christmas everybody, and for those politically correct tightwads that become irately offended when I tell them Merry Christmas, how about just Happy Holidays, you know, now your, your little easily hurt butts can rest easy at least at least just for the moment because we're about to get into some interesting stuff that's gonna rile you back up again so it's all good <laughs> and we're here with um, Rich aka General Tate in theory oh I'm here I'm just in the background listening okay well anyway there's been a lot of December strangeness that uh, we're going to be getting into. And um, as a part of getting into this, I want to kind of use a bit of uh, an opening analogy, and hence the graphic switch there. Um, the sorts of things that are, that are all kind of happening at the moment as the whole awakening process, energetic shifts, whatever you want to refer to it as, has all sorts of crazy stuff happening and you know the people are getting a little butt hurt and the elites are getting butt hurt and everybody's freaking out not <laughs> quite knowing what to make of it. Um, here's my analogy. Imagine you could go back in time to uh, you know to, to medieval times and you know, take one of the people from that era and um, just, um, you know, let them step on board a bus, you know, like a regular public transportation type of bus or a school bus or something like that, and you sit them down. Then you have the bus driver start the bus moving forward. Well, there's one of two ways that that medieval person is going to interpret that seeing as they have no frame of reference whatsoever for what a bus even is. Um, either they are going to think that they are in a weird funky looking stationary building um, in, in fact the whole you know the way this, the seats are in a bus might remind them of you know a church or something so they might expect a pastor or something to be up at the front saying stuff or whatever. So they might think they're in a stationary building. And as they look out the windows, all of a sudden they think that the, the land has been possessed by an evil curse and is, is uprooting and, and jumping around around the building and that the land is just going, going crazy. Or they might see it for what it actually is, that being the land is fine and the bus is moving. So, um, with all of the, the interesting, um, crazy stuff that's, you know, been happening in the world, and especially all the crazy stuff um, for December so far, um, a lot of people, because of their belief systems, are going to have that whole, you know, oh, the land is cursed and it's jumping up and, and moving sort of view of events because a lot of them don't have a lot of the frames of references for what's going on. As a matter of fact, I think to some degree or another, even, you know, the people that are quote-unquote, shall we say, more awake to the quantumness of the reality shifts, even they have a very limited frame of reference as to what's going on because this is a very new experience for humanity. This is not something that's happened before. This is very new, so how in the hell can any of us really have any, you know, solid frames of reference? Uh, you know, uh, those of us that, um, you know, are a bit more expanded in, into the, uh, the energetic aspects of things, they're, they're equivalent to the the medieval person realizing that the bus is moving forward, but they still don't really understand what's going on because they don't know what a combustion engine is. They don't know about the fuel for the combustion engine. They don't know the, the whole point and purpose of a bus because, you know, they don't have these big modern cities like we do now. So, 
you know, even they're even though they can understand that they're in something that's moving forward and the land isn't possessed by an evil curse, they still have an extremely limited understanding of what's going on. In fact, they might think that the bus is being propelled forward by magic. Even if they aren't, you know, afraid or anything, and they they realize that the land isn't possessed by evil, they might think that they're in a magical um, horseless carriage, and that you know this horseless carriage is being propelled forward by magic. So they might still look at it that way. Am I making sense, Rich? <laughs> mm-hmm. Okay, Quite so. Soon. Especially within the last few days, and I kind of climaxed yesterday, um, and I guess this is what you might call, you know, some of the more new age people might refer to this as moving into the the twelve twelve portal opening, or so on and so forth. As a matter of fact, it's um, right now in my time zone. It's December eleventh. It's going to be twelve twelve in about nine minutes. Um, for other time zones, they're already there, and so on and so forth. But anyway, um, basically, what uh, what a lot of people um, don't realize, and I'm just going to give the brief explanation on this as far as um, reality, frequency, and energy, because I, I don't want to be too left right paradigm, but I don't want to be too woo woo way out there anywhere. I'm, I'm doing my best to hit a hit a middle ground. Um, you know, matter is made up of atoms, and atoms are made up of electrons and protons and neutrons. And we're taught that those things are made of energy, and that those only take up one percent of the atom. The rest of it is empty space, which that empty space has been discovered is just a different type of energy, dark energy, because we can't see it. <laughs> so everything is made of energy. And what were we taught energy is? Frequency and vibration. And what were we taught that is? Light. Yeah. So physical reality is a holographic illusion. And illusion doesn't mean it's not real. It just means that our understanding is very limited. So our brains are making all sorts of assumptions about what may or may not be. So because energy, everything's made of energy, so there's a lot of uh, electromagnetics at play. Um, the various frequencies within physical reality are, are electromagnetic. Um, your central nervous system within your body, because remember, your body is an electrochemical machine that you're utilizing, <laughs> and um, that's got electromagnetics. Um, computer hardware and machines and things like that, um, these things are electromagnetic. Um, the planet is electromagnetic, the moon is electromagnetic, the other planets are electromagnetic, the sun is electromagnetic like a mofo, and everything interacts with everything else. We've also been having a lot of solar flares lately too. So, you know, you've got all, all this electromagnetic um, interaction, everything interacting with everything else. Um, within electromagnetics, within the, in the central nervous system, what tends to happen is um, a lot of the societal constructs and, and belief systems, the walls that, that we put up um, for brief sporadic moments here and there, those walls can come down, removing our denial mechanisms so that we have to face ourselves head on. And um, these can be some pretty scary experiences sometimes. Um, you know, it can, it can manifest... Um, circumstances because we're, we're not willing to take a good hard look at ourselves internally because we got all these these societally programmed judgments that the uh, Fourth Reich educational system developed by freaking Nazis has brainwashed and MK ultra all of us with you know through all of our lives so you know um, we don't want to take that good hard look at ourselves because we're judging the crap out of ourselves so you know that that energy is going to be expressed in a different way. External circumstances that we align with. So, you know, things can start to get really crazy. Um, and, you know, not only um, our own personal experiences in our lives and not only the um, 
experiences of our, our friends around us that, again, we're all just kind of reflecting to each other. Um, but, you know, the, the global stage as well, the elites, the Illuminati, what, you know, whatever it is you want to call them, the banksters, um, you know, they're, they're going to sit there getting all freaking butthurt that, you know, shit isn't quite going their way. And, you know, they're going to get all freaking out and control freaking and react. And so, you know, you see all, all this increase in them trying to push through unconstitutional legislation and, you know, they just passed a bill that says, okay, you know, now we can go ahead and start writing up a declaration of war against Russia, which, you know, of course, it's completely freaking laughable. That shit's not going to apply. It's going to be an excuse for our military to clean house, if anything. <laughs> so, you know, you've got all, all this crazy stuff as energies collide. And I'm not speaking, you know, um, symbolically or new agey or airy fairy woo woo. I'm, you know, literally fucking energies. And um, I'm about to show you just how um, how visible in our external reality through circumstances and events that these energies can be. Um, I'm going to show everybody something that's been going on. There we go. Um, the first thing that when I saw this that, that struck me is all the lit up areas that you see as um, attack areas and um, this is attack traffic overview displayed are the current number of network attacks by major geographic region, state or country, highest volume regions are, are called out below, so on and so on. Um, what I also see, if you look at all these lit up areas, um, these also, in my opinion, accurately represent the areas of, you know, uh, various pockets of human civilization that are the, that are the most in denial, that have the most emotional clearing to do, that have been MK altered the most and have the most dysfunction. I mean, you got India, Pakistan, that sort of area. Um, you've only got a little bit in Australia. I think that people like Max Egan and Vinnie Eastwood have, have helped to make it so that this is far less than what it would have been otherwise. Um, and, you know, it's like you could see um, the more populated parts of, of Canada and then most of the United States here. Um, so, of course, when you look at um, how Russia has actually been handling this whole, you know, globalist temper tantrum about the declaration of, of war and all that all that stupidity. Um, they've actually um, been handling that rather well and as a matter of fact because it's um it's in Russian but they got they got the closed caption thing. If you try to download the video, you're not gonna download the captions with it. So near near the end of this hangout just for fun, I might actually go ahead and and, and show you guys that so that um, if anybody downloads this video, you know, they can they can get the, the captions with it. Because obviously if you just download the video and if you don't speak Russian, you know, obviously that's not going to be too helpful. As far as I know, YouTube doesn't have a way to download the uh, closed caption file with, uh, with the video itself. So we might go ahead and have a little fun and, you know, go ahead and do that at, at towards the end. Um, but I will tell you right now that what really pleasantly surprised me about the video is just kind of how new paradigm and the whole um, just awareness that um, that Russia seems to have and, you know, how they basically view the United States government as their enemy but not the people. They view the people as their friend and they want to help the people and just, you know, the way they're looking at it and the way they're they're facing their own mistakes and saying, yeah, you know, we got to do better for our own people. And they're not casting blame outwards for, you know, all of their circumstances. They're kind of owning their mistakes and being like, yeah, you know, here's how we screwed up and, you know, we need to do better, you know, towards our people and so on and so forth. And, you know, it's just really, really interesting how Russia's kind of been facing itself and just, you know, owning its own shit and just being like, you know, 
um, we got to move into a better direction here because you know this this whole thing is just getting to unprecedented levels of stupid. And so with that sort of you know consciousness shift that Russia has been going through as it's been you know facing its own bullshit, it's no wonder why. You know, look at look at most of Russia on this map. You don't see it really lit up too badly. So, you know, to me that that again is accurately, you know, reflecting, you know, the whole shift of consciousness. And you know, again, if you look in the areas that are that are lit up like little little freaking nukes going off, I feel those accurately represent the areas of the planet to where the people are the most in denial and have their heads most shoved up their ass. Um, you know, as far as like health and stuff, like Africa hasn't been really doing too good and they've got a lot of recovery stuff that they've been doing, but I've noticed that the overall consciousness of Africa has been has been rising. And of course South America in general has, you know, generally speaking, been in a pretty good state of consciousness for, you know, thousands of years. Not saying it's perfect down there. They've been through their, you know, their own messes of dictators and stupidity, but just generally speaking, shall we say, the more I guess the spirituality in South America, you might say, for lack of a better way of saying it, has been on a, on a more of an, an uptick than the, the so-called modern slash Western world or, or what have you. So I'm just kind of speaking in respect to, you know, relative comparisons that are kind of sitting there in parallel. I'm not trying to be absolutist and say anything is absolutely caused or not caused by any one thing or that anything absolutely does or does not have to do with any one thing. Um, so obviously, you know, this whole sort of lighting up of, of on this map that you're seeing could very easily be interpreted as some sort of an, a, like a major attack and um, when really and it, here's where we start putting information in parallel. Really, because matter and reality and everything is what it is, and when you shine a bright, bright light in a dark room, you got to face your shit. Um, that is really what is actually going on, and this is manifesting in physical reality. Now, to me, that means that, okay, maybe the electromagnetics are making technology glitch a bit, so it's nothing more than an electromagnetic phenomenon. It could be true. It could also be true that, that the energy shifts are putting the globalists into such a, a total tantrum that maybe they are launching some forms of electronic attacks. Um, that could also be simultaneously true as well. It could be both. There could also be a lot of other factors involved that, you know, we have no way to consider right now that, you know, will be forthcoming as time goes on. But, you know, it's all extremely interesting. And I know when things really started to climax last night, I had a really interesting experience. Um, my router, I have a, um, a Netgear ProSafe router. Um, it's, it's pretty high-end, and all of a sudden, my internet access by way of my router um, was down, and I tried to log in to, to the router, and I couldn't log in at all. Um, the router firmware was just completely scrambled, and so I had to hit the little reset to, to factory defaults. And, you know, and it was fine. Once I did that, I reset it, and then I, I went back in, and I... I reconfigured the whole thing, and, you know, then I plugged the internet cable back into it, and, you know, everything came up just fine, like there was no problem, you know. Um, simultaneously, a um, chick by the name of Blu-ray added me on, on Facebook, and we ended up talking and stuff, and then her computer started going woo-woo, and she started getting paranoid and freaked out, and I had to explained to her as best I could as to what was going on, um, the best I could from my perspective. And it was just an, an interesting synchronicity because when she added me, I mean, 
I was very much aware of, you know, what was going on as far as the energies. And, you know, she's got all these Facebook pages and stuff about energy and vibration and this, like, this and that. And I was just kind of laughing to myself. Well, yeah, that's an interesting coincidence. Not coincidence, but coincidence. We were taught to pronounce it wrong. Things which actually do coincide do have something to do with each other, but we just don't see the connections. And then, um, as I was talking to her, I, I was, you know, telling her about some of my friends um, online and stuff, and you know, giving giving her links to all sorts of people I know, you know, and. Um, when I got to, to posting Rich's link to her, all of a sudden, right as I was doing that, um, Rich is calling me on Skype. <laughs> and so I answered the call, and he was telling me about all of his crazy synchronistic stuff um, that was going on. And because he's actually here, I think I'll let him go over that. Well, yeah, um... Called Dave and you know Dave picked up the phone and or Skype more like it I guess it is like a phone but still he picked we started the conversation and um, well, what is there to say I was having a pretty crazy day last night I you know positive energies and everything was pretty good but anyway before I called my computer for whatever reason, it, it had been going through updates earlier in the day, you know, I shut it off earlier and it went through some typical Microsoft Windows 7 updates, you know, it was installing updates, but I started my computer up and the weirdest thing happened, it went to the update prompt screen and it showed it was updating the, you know, the computer and the OS and all that stuff and it was, you know, completing and finishing the updates, but then it popped up to my normal login screen, you know, had my name and stuff there, and, you know, so I log in, I type in my password, and hit enter, and this is where it gets really weird. What loaded was a factory stock preset page, and it said I couldn't access my files for whatever reason. It was really weird. I don't know why it popped up to a factory default preset page. It had the ASUS thing in the background, persistent innovation, persistent perfection, and it was, you know, everything was all stock and preset. There was all my customization, all of it was gone. My traditional profile page was not there. Or my profile my traditional profile for my computer wasn't there. It was just a fresh slate, factory slate. There was nothing there. Um, and it was weird. I was kind of like, okay, what the hell's going on? Why is it all, you know, why is it all <laughs> just default preset, you know? Did something get into my computer and wipe all of the data? And then I was thinking to myself, no, that's not possible. I didn't download anything or do anything that would cause that. And not only that, I've got Kaspersky antivirus, so that's really not a possibility because Kaspersky would have prevented it from happening from the get-go. So I'm just kind of sitting there looking around and, you know, it's got Google Chrome is on there and stuff, and I click on the Google Chrome thing and it pops up and it's all default and not logged in, and I'm just sitting here going, this is weird. You know, and I click on my... Uh, Start start menu, and it pops up, and it's under my name. It's like my profile, but it's not my profile. It's like my profile if it was stripped back to a default setting, like I had done nothing to it. Like I had just put it on there, and so I just thought, no, I'll shut it down and restart it and see what that does. And so I shut it down, and I waited... 30 seconds, just let it really shut off, and then I started it back up, and then it loaded like normal, and then I popped up to my, uh, you know, login screen, and I logged in, and then my normal profile popped up, and 
that was that, and everything was there. My background was there, and you know, all my stuff was there. My files were accessible again. There was, you know, I don't know why it loaded on that factory deset default preset thing. I have no idea why it did what it did, but it just did. And it probably had something to do with the fact that there were solar flares and all of that other stuff. You know, space weather affects computers as much as it affects human consciousness. So the computers are just nothing more than a quantum reflection of what we're going through, some of us more severely than others. And, well, it was it was really weird. I just, you know, <laughs> it's the first time a computer's ever done that to me, you know. And then I got on to talk with Dave, and that was that. I don't know. If, but, and yeah. he, then I told him that my router did something bizarrely similar, and, you know, but in the case of my router, um, I really did have to set it back to factory defaults. That, you know, with a router, it's not that big of a deal. Um, I didn't have, you know, any sort of uber con complex configuration and that router is pretty badass solid in its default configurations. Just had to change a few things and, you know, set things up the way I like them and, you know, so it's like it, it kind of, kind of put me out for about 10 minutes, which, you know, isn't, you know, isn't really that big of an inconvenience. The only thing I was thinking is like, man, you know, this sort of stuff has to happen, you know, like in the middle of the night, right? Could happen at four in the afternoon. <laughs> it happen late at night when I really don't feel like doing this. <laughs> but you know, um, but yeah, um, everything's just a reflection, and the whole idea of things going down and just you know, kind of like the phoenix rising from the ashes, being destroyed and recreated, so to speak, and, you know, and even, um, you know, today, um, I wasn't on the computer for most of the day, and I come back, and even, uh, yeah, I'm not going to get into all, all the details, but my friend, you know, Kristen left me a bunch of, you know, notes on, uh, on Facebook, you know, in the private chat and telling me about this, you know, all this unprecedented freaking craziness, um, you know, that had, that had gone on with her for that day, like totally unprecedented. Um, she didn't get into all the details, so I'll have to talk to her later about that and see what exactly was going on, but what little she was able to tell me at the time, it was really, really freaking unprecedentedly strange, like, you know, the freaking, you know, flying pink elephant going by that's not supposed to exist, but there it is anyway, and just all of this unprecedented craziness, and after she messages me with that, and then I look on my main Facebook profile, and here's this thing about, oh, America's under attack right now. And, you know, this little image that you're looking at right now, right here. And I'm like, wow, holy crap. <laughs> so, you know, it, it's it's just been completely nuts. And um, I want to show everybody the video right quick, short little video that uh, somebody made um, in, in regards to this. It's only 2 minutes and 17 seconds, so I'm, I'm just gonna, gonna play this right quick and, um, you know, see what, what everybody thinks about it and whatever, so here we go. Well, folks, um, this is Susan Duclo on News Pipeline. It's December 8th, 2014. I'm over at www akame.com, which monitors global internet conditions around the clock, and it has real-time data on global regions with greatest attack traffic, cities with slowest web connections, latency, geographic areas with the most uh, web traffic, traffic density. Now, what you're looking at, uh, I came to this, this link, and I went ahead and checked the attacks mode. Take a look here. America is under attack, massive attack actually, because we are in the reds and the oranges. 
this started because uh, actually we thought it was our internet connection it was just moving very slowly and then another writer and myself were talking and she said hers was going slow also and posted me a couple internet traffic links and if you take a look and go ahead and go to this site and hit attacks you'll see where the most are so right now America is under attack and if you notice that you can't get certain websites up but others are loading just fine some are slow some take five or six refreshes to even get it to load you see why something's going on here I don't know if they're testing some sort of internet kill switch and it's it's appearing to be attack. I don't know what it is. I have no answers. All I know is there is a problem. And you can see. Take a look at these colors here. You can see uh what what does it say? Five hundred and sixty six thousand seven hundred and ninety six attacks. And I believe that says an hour, but it's covered in the white there. But that's a lot of attacks going on. I mean, you can look some other regions of the globe are suffering some minor ones. But this is our whole country in reds and oranges. So if you're having a problem, you know why now. What do you think about that, Rich? Well, I mean, yet again, it's all based on perspective. I mean, you know, some can call it a cyber attack. Some can call it solar magnetic storms. You know, um, it's plausible. I mean, anything's plausible given the time and amount of resources. But, you know, honestly, for them to pull a kill switch, I mean, that's you got to have a lot of resources and a lot of manpower to do that. Just shutting down every server in the United States, even if you're doing a beta test, would be a nightmare. I mean, if you go clear back to, you know, what was it, 2010, 2009, when they tried to activate the emergency alert system, I mean, we saw how well that went. Like, not even 5% of the population got the official E, you know, got the official emergency alert message, you know, the majority of people just went about their day without even knowing it had occurred, you know, and then the news comes on in the evening saying, you know, there was a big fuck up and, you know, um, but yet again, I mean, you know, yeah, I mean, there's a potential of it, but I mean, what are the odds, you know, Google's really going to shut down its servers, you know, and throw its own company into chaos just because the globalists have got a stick up their ass and they're pissed off that people are waking up too quickly and figuring shit out, you know, I mean, that, that seems a little far-fetched, but, I mean, it's all within possibility, but in my honest opinion, I mean, you know, if it were something like, you know, a beta test or, you know, an electromagnetic pulse or something like that, you wouldn't be able to turn on your computer. You wouldn't be able to turn your car on if it was past 1985, depending on the maker model. You wouldn't be able to turn your cell phone on. You wouldn't be able to turn the light switches on in your house. You wouldn't be able to, you know, turn on anything that had a little electric circuit board, you know, inside of it. Not unless you had it in a little Faraday box where it was protected, you know. It would just be a very obvious sign that they had done something to fry the electronics. And not only that, even if they did, it's a temporary thing. And, you know, the electronics that did get fried would soon be replaced by new, unaffected electronics. So, you know, that's an EMP scenario. That one's been around for years. You know, shut down the global economy due to you know, an electromagnetic pulse. Um, but in this case, it sounds like it's within the servers itself if it is a cyber attack. I mean, there would be a lot more going on than just, you know, say, a router shutting down or internet connections being slow or, you know, it would, it would be kind of more uniform. The cases would be more uniform. It would be like, I can't get on... Like, I just can't get onto the Internet. The Internet's not working, you know. 
there's a problem with the web page or 404 bad gateway or something of that nature. And it, would just, it would just be even in the event it would of just like be a uniform, it would be a denial uniform of service. Uniform. Denial of service attacks, like when uh, anonymous attacks a website or something, uh, a yeah, corporate yeah, website. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Look at how yeah, much yeah. goes into that to take down one site. And this is something that's basically affected the majority of the Internet. Mm -hmm. I don't think see or anybody has the resource to DDoS attack the world. Exactly. Yeah, I mean, the amount of technical resources you have to have just to take down a website, good point, is astronomical. Like, say, for instance, you wanted to, you know, DDoS attack Facebook or DeviantArt, the amount of resources you would need to toss at that, I mean, the amount of just sheer energy you'd have to toss at that one website alone would just be astronomical, not yet alone trying to do it to the entire worldwide web super information highway. I mean, it's it's preposterous. You can block one lane of traffic, but you're going to need an awful lot of people to block all lanes of traffic. I'm sorry. And, you know, with an internet attack, if it was some, you know, electronically released, like maybe uh, jamming a jammer signal or a virus of some sort that could, you know, replicate itself and block all those high highways, you know, those information pathways, that would still take a lot of fucking programming at the current state of level of affairs where we are technologically. It would be very hard to do. And, you know, it would take a lot of maintenance to be maintaining that virus to keep it ahead of the power curve in terms of, you know, security updates, security advances, and people would get really smart really quick on figuring out ways to get around it and to fight it. But when it comes right down to it, why I think it's electromagnetic storm fluctuations is because, number one, all of the reports are different. I mean, some people are experiencing slow websites, while other websites are running lightning fast. Um, you were having problems with your router. I was having problems, you know, a minor issue with my computer while it was updating, and it brought me to a <laughs> factory slate default page, you know. Um, from what it sounds like, other people have been having similar problems to what you've been having, what I've been having. I mean, and back in the day, like back before technology, like modern technology, um, when a solar flare had come through, things had happened. You know, it, it would be minor. You know, you'd have your your radio signals would get all fuzzed up, and then you know you'd have telegraph wires that'd be sparking off like crazy and you know, but there was an indication that a solar flare had occurred. And yet again, we're more we've got more technology, so the more technology you have, the more sparks are going to be going off. And considering we are biological considering we are biological machines, yeah. there's going to be far more sparks going off than consciousness. Anyway. Yeah, the drama and craziness levels, like I illustrated with my friend Kristen and all that, although I don't know all the details of that, but if you look around, and you know, even within the last few days, how many people have been experiencing either un unprecedented amounts of really positive stuff or unprecedented amounts of really, really negative stuff or whatever, like you just said, you know, the body's a biological machine and it's electromagnetic and we have a central nervous system, so... Um, when you have people's central nervous systems being, you know, disrupted and taking down those walls that were built, that, you know, we were taught to build to put ourselves in a constant state of denial and Stockholm Syndrome, uh, when those shut down and we get to face ourselves head on, you know, that's all sorts of crazy that can happen with that circumstantially and, you know, gee, do you think solar flares and other electromagnetic disruptions and planetary alignments and whatever else are going to cause that sort of thing too? Well, yes, it's going to affect the biological hardware just as much as it's going to affect the technological hardware. Go ahead and continue. I was just adding to your point.
Uh, yeah, I mean, you know, we're biological machines, and, you know, the amount of activity that's been going on recently, and if there were more solar flares happening, well, from what it sounds like there were, and a couple of days prior to that, there were more solar magnetic storms, and I've been noticing crazy-ass crap at work. Last night I made a $1,500 till, which is a record for me. Um, you know, and a lot of you are probably wondering, well, what the fuck does that have to do with anything? He made a $1,500 till, so what? Who cares? Whatever. That's not the point. <clears throat> it's just when you start to notice these things and let go of the ego and let go of the bullshit and let go of the I'm right, you're wrong type syndrome and let go of your Stockholm syndrome, only official sources are correct, you know, narrative. Only scientists can have an opinion. If you have a paper, you can have an opinion, you know, that says you're smart at this or good at that, you know. And otherwise, you're just a stupid, dumb moron who doesn't know anything. If you can let go of that for, you know, a second, let go of the ego or just let go of it altogether, you know, and just start to look around and really pay attention and realize, hey, you know, there's a little bit more credibility here. You know what I'm gonna, what I'm saying has a little bit more credibility because you've let go of your ego and you've let go of the ignorant, the uh, celebration of ignorance, if you will. The well, you know that can't be possible because if it were, I would already know about it. And right now, basically, what's going on and why so many people are just, you know, fucking ramming cocks up their butt is because. They're struggling to hang on to that arrogance of, you know, I know everything, and if, you know, I don't know about it, it must not be true. People are starting to come to a realization that, oh, maybe there's more to the puzzle than first meets the eye. Maybe there's more pieces to add to the puzzle that, you know, I've had for a long time that I've played with, that I've stared at, you know, wondering what the hell the image on each individual piece means, what it represents. Well, this paradigm shift or paradigm shit, whatever you want to put it under, is basically just a mental process of elimination to where you're taking those puzzle pieces, putting them together and going and, you know, standing back and going, oh, okay, that makes sense. And that's essentially what's going on right now. And, you know, if you've gone through the process, you know, a long time ago, it's going to be pretty easy in these high energetic states to just kind of fluctuate and go with the flow and go with the shift and just ride the wave and, you know, do a few surf tricks while you're doing it, hang ten, whatever, lay back, you know, ride the, ride the pipeline. And for those who aren't there yet, they're going to get washed up in the surf and they're going to get pissed off. They're going to go, why can't I hang ten? And it's like, well... Because you're still full of ego. <clears throat> you know? And the universe isn't going to argue with you thinking you know everything. It's just going to keep raping you in the butt until you finally figure it out. <laughs> you know? And, you know, we're just going through an energetic shift right now. You just got to keep hanging on and keep on keeping on and just keep going and, you know, lay back and go with the flow and let gravity take its course and you know, just let the universe do its thing and just realize it's okay. Yeah, people in their arrogance tend to forget that the laws of physics actually do apply to them. Like, you know, with a lot of things, you know, people don't think of things like circumstances and psychology and emotional states and interaction between humans as being something that's governed by physics because they think that, you know, physics is, you know, measuring the difference between lead and gold in a laboratory, and oh, that's physics, that's it, and they don't realize that they're basically arrogantly proclaiming, well, because I'm a human being, the physics does not apply to me. It's like, well, wait a minute, when you're feeling those emotions and psychologically, psychological states and interacting with other humans, isn't your body still performing its functions? Isn't your central nervous system still what it is? 
aren't you still interacting with all the matter and energy around you? Doesn't aren't you still on this planet that's got other planets around it in the solar system with a big fucking sun in the middle of it and inside of a galaxy and so on and so so on? It's like don't you think all that is going to affect emotions and psychology and the central nervous system and and you know the state of affairs between human interaction? But we're so fucking arrogant. We're like, oh no, we're exempt from physics because physics only has to do with a bowling ball hitting the pins. That's all. That's all physics is. And it's like you know people have got their heads stuffed so far up their ass and. You've got this pseudo-intellectualism where people are going around on the internet being like, I know everything, and if you disagree with me, you're stupid, and you're a moron, and I'm going to call you a fuckhead, and, and DMCA shit that's yours, but I'm just going to claim it's mine, because I'm going to be a fucking William Cock troll bitch, and, and you know, and there's all these different attitudes and egos about that, and, and the worst is the... The ones that claim they're atheists because they think that atheism and intellectualism is the same thing. When atheism is just theism with an A at the beginning, because theism has you know nothing to do with God. Look at the word religion; it means to bind, to narrow, to bind to a doctrine and say this is all there is, and anything else, fuck you. You know, so it's like. These tightwad pseudo-intellectual atheists are no better than the tightwad spiritual fascist, uh, you know, fundamentalist, you know, God believers or New Agers or whatever else. It's still, you know, people just bickering and bitching and whipping their dicks in each other's faces and going, "I'm right." See so, you now, suck my cock, suck my cock of righteousness. So, you know, it's like, and, and you know, the, I think the worst psychological projection really is is the truthers. Because, um, you know, uh, all the data that, that's put forth about, you know, the globalists, the bankers, the Illuminati, the pyramid of enslavement and all that, yeah, though all that is true, it is still simultaneously a psychological projection, which brings me to a short little video that I made the other day called They Are You and I want to include it here because this is kind of a you know tossing it in you know in, in the face of the butter egotist sort of things and, and bringing out some you know rational you know thinking and some clarity that is sure to offend everybody <laughs> so I'm just I'm just gonna play this really quick it's another short one and then we'll go from there that shit is there. 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 Katy Perry music videos, Super Bowl halftime shows, all of these things implausibly tied together into one theory. I'm a builder, bird, this world is like a video game I maintain when I leave them. Bird, you all know they can throw your life here in the dark. No builder, bird! Now spin it and put it down any one of my parts and I pick up a game with racers up there, every go bars, get in my balls, I'm rolling with the I M M high equity, I grab my pen and sign them checks off, then I sidestep with high step flex. You are off the mercy pick, now you're f***ing depressed You're just like the rest, I'm the NWO Totally unknown, you can't f*** with my huge bankroll I'm about to glimpse, you can't do this, you can't do that yeah. Who said so? I do what I like, too big to fail Too much gold to hold, you can't f*** with the chosen one I, 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 I own your life, I'm just a bird Williams a bird? That's right, kids, or Bill if you prefer I heard someone call for me, so I'm here to convert I was right, I told you all, they exist I can finally tell the world So, the new world order 
Can you confirm or deny it? Both. Oh, yeah. See, things in life are seldom black or white, left or right. If I might be the next and fourth right, please, that's what we like. Trust me, you're not gonna like it. I'm about to reveal a conspiracy so vast and silent that those within it can barely recognize it. The plain truth is deep in the latter part of last century. As you finally emerge from your ignorance, you gradually begin to realize your legacy, your true role in history, but couldn't deal with the reality. So you retain a sense of self and innocence. Your inner psyche conceived an alter ego of pure evilness, which you could blame and ascribe to the most heinous crimes that gave rise to your current way of life. So the new world order doesn't actually exist? Oh, it exists, and how? Ask the slaves whose labor built the White House. Ask the slaves of the day, tied down to sweatshops and brothels to escape hunger. Ask most women, second-class citizens, in a pervasive rape culture. Ask for non-human creatures who inhabit the planet. Whales, bears, frogs, tuna, bees, slaughtered farm animals. Ask the natives of the Americas and Australia, on whose land you live today, on whose graves your factories, farms and neighborhoods stand. Ask any of them this. Ask them if the new world order is true. They'll tell you plainly, the new world order is you. What can we do? It's simple. Tough on the terrorists. By bringing down the elite dwelling at the very top of the pyramid. You can attempt it, but this structure is your own edifice. Far greater than scale and stature than you care to know or admit it is. It extends down. As you can see in this picture, I've corrected to include all those beneath you on which your privilege has depended. It's impossible. We are victims. I'm a victim of the freaking system. And that, jeez, is how the pyramid ensures its existence. Through our failures to envision our position within it. Welcome to the new world order, bitches. I hope I've been of assistance. Ay, ay, ay. I need an alibi. I need a projection to sanitize my life. Ay, ay, ay. You are my alibi. I need a projection. Need a projection. Well, truth seekers, it's time to close this episode. Over the course of our lives, as we seek to explain the state of the world, we pass through states of enlightenment that expose the unknown. But the deeper we go, the more our quest seems to lead closer to home. Yes, injustice is real and undeniably abundant. Conspiracies, false flags, oppression, bribery, corruption. But can we fight injustice with any depth of purpose if we ignore our own roles in causing it in the first place? For the target of our struggle is never merely the tyrant on high, but also that piece of the oppressor planted deep inside, inside every one of us. And that's where the revolution first must arise. Till next time, Robert Foster, The Internet. Good night. Perfect, thank you. If you really want enlightenment, then just lighten up. And that, to me, describes most of the um, most of the the attitudes in the truth movement because they don't want to they don't want to put it together. They're just there for a, for a big old dick wagging contest, essentially. And you know they have all these different theories and stuff. And granted, they they all have different pieces of the puzzle, but none of them realize it because they they're all in this self-righteous egoic dick wagging thing that they even fight each other and you know because we've been raised by the globalists in a globalist system to be Nazis and it's all we know I mean you wouldn't expect a dog to act like an elephant or a lizard or something a dog only knows how to be a dog that's you know that's how the dog knows so what we know is what we've been taught and what we've been taught is all we know until we hit that point of usually a point of desperation <laughs> desperation breeds genius when we get sick and tired of the same old same old and we're willing to make ourselves an empty cup like Jesus said and you know a lot of other the masters and prophets and whatever said similar things that when you let go of all this indoctrination and be willing to get curious and ask, why is this? Why is that? Instead of, you know, shoving your dick in people's noses and going, <coughs> I know why it is. And if you don't agree with me, you're stupid. Because I know what reality is. I know it all. Fuck you. That's how most of these truthers come off to me. As per my little graphic I have, I have up there. Conspiracy theorists and cynics both agree. If I don't like what's being said, I should just dismiss it as crap. So these truthers are just as 
head in the sand as any sheeple or cynic. In fact, I would say the truthers are more like that picture because now they have an excuse to be complacent. Now they can say to themselves, well, I'm enlightened and I already know everything, so I don't need to look at anything else. And anybody who has knowledge that's different is beneath me, so fuck you. And, you know, this is the attitude that we're facing that's getting reflected. Um, we act just like the globalists because you know, the globalists are the same way. You see, these globalists, they're not, they're not like, oh, well, we know better. You know, we, we know what there is to know, so we're just going to screw with the minds of the public and we're going to do so knowingly. It's not quite that simple. They're more like a bully. And if you look at bullies, bullies are, are, are in the biggest states of victimization at all. They are, so, they are so insecure that they think that they have to control everyone and everything around them in order to be in control of their own lives. So they are, these globalists are legitimately terrified, you know. And it's just like for anybody who's watched the movie uh, V for Vendetta, um, people should not be afraid of their government. It is the government that should be afraid of its people. And that is absolutely, totally true. Because government, uh, in other words, um, to uh, con mind control or to control mind, governmental control mind, anybody who's in that mind control apparatus that feels they have to control everybody in order to keep them themselves uh, safe, they are the most. They're more insecure than a 14-year-old emo chick on crack. I mean, seriously. So we've been taught to be like them. So we're all psychologically projecting to each other, and everybody feels self-righteous and indignant, saying these globalists are doing this, and this is the way it's been, and so that's the way it will be. And and we're 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 poor little me. We're powerless against them. And da 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 da. And it's like it feels good to say that, like a drug. Like yeah, I'm high on my drug of self-righteousness. I'm not gonna look at solutions because that would be a buzzkill. I'm not gonna come together with my humanity, my fellow human beings because that would be a buzzkill. I want to be high on the fumes of my own arrogance while pointing fingers at everyone else's ego. Yeah. Good drug. Cool. Destroy ourselves. Well, well, well saying we're freeing people and talk all about freedom while we're acting like Nazis. Yeah. Drugs. Good. That's, you know, that's the way people are acting. And if you look around, it's very simple and common sense to see. That's how people are acting. And now, we're being faced with our own mental malware, as Larkin Rose might like to say. We're being faced with our own hypocrisy and bullshit at the same time as the globalists are being faced with their own hypocrisy and bullshit. So it's all a house of mirrors, folks, and that's what we're waking up to. And I'll let uh, you take the soapbox. Oh, well, yeah, essentially, I mean, you know. What else is there to say to that? I mean, you know, yeah, we're all pretty much locked in our own egos, and or a lot of us tend tend to be locked in our own egos, you know, um, some more than others, and it's just kind of a continuing uphill battle, and it's just something you got to learn to fight, you know. And I've kind of come to a place where I've realized that, I mean, it's good to have an ego to a sense, but it's also good to, how do I put this, emotions are something that need to have checks and balances. I mean, the ego is a good thing in the sense that it gives you pride, it gives you strength when you need it, it helps you in moments when you really need ego to, you know, keep going, you know, it's kind of the survival mechanism, if you will, but it's like anything else, you know, checks and balances, you know, you gotta, you gotta kind of have a balance, balanced mindset, you can't, you know, allow one emotion to outrule all the others, or, you know, you kind of just become a Nazi, whether you allow, whether you force happiness out of yourself, you know, you exert happiness above all your other emotions and quell everything down, or you decide to be a goth, emo, in denial, 
cunt who, you know, is so sad and delusional and feeling sorry for themselves that, um, you know, all your other emotions get drowned in your own misery, you know. You got to learn how to kind of have self governance for yourself and. Now, how do you put that? Dang. Uh, long day. Um, you you've just got you just got to have balanced emotions, kind of like you know, founding fathers envisioned having a government with checks and balances. You gotta you gotta keep yourself in check because if you allow one emotion to overpower all the rest, you become the danger not only to, not only to yourself but to people around you. You know. You become no better than a Nazi. I mean, look at what happened to Hitler and all of the other psychopaths throughout history. They just, you know, they allowed their emotion, you know, certain emotions to overtake them. And, well, you saw the societal result of that. They all started with good intentions. I mean, even Hitler was a Christian, but mm. they were all basically like Anakin Skywalker um, I'll, I'll let you go into that, seeing as that's one of your favorite analogies. <laughs> yeah, they were like Anakin Skywalker, you know. And anybody who's watched Star Wars, you know, definitely knows that revelation of the story. And I don't give a shit whether or not you like the prequels or not. I, you know, that's another discussion for another time, whether or not you like the prequels. I personally liked them. You can say I have horrible taste in movies or whatever, you know. Obviously, I think people who dislike the prequels are just annoying cunts who don't know how to have an emotional recourse and just can't handle emotion, but whatever. Anyway, yeah, you know, I mean, you look at Anakin Skywalker, he started out as a young kid, innocent, and, you know, full of life. He was relatively happy, you know, he had everything he wanted, except for the fact that he was... A slave, and he was insecure. Those were his two main weaknesses. He was very insecure as a child, and that insecurity would later sabotage him. He allowed his own insecurity to, you know, self-sabotage and destroy him. As he got older, you know, he was very protective of his mother, and, you know, when the Tuscan Sand Raiders killed his mother when he was, you know, 19, you know, that didn't help. He freaked out, and then he became of this own personal vendetta that he wasn't going to let it happen again, and he just stressed himself to the point where everything he was hoping wouldn't happen happened, and everything he really didn't want to happen happened, and he became exactly what he didn't want to become. He basically self-sabotaged himself into misery, and... Right now, humanity is waking up to that little psychological syndrome that we've been carrying with ourselves for the last 10,000 years. And people are beginning to realize, oh, wait a minute, if I keep stabbing myself in the arm, it's going to keep bleeding and it's going to keep hurting. The pain isn't going to stop unless I just pull the knife out and treat the wound. You know, it's like smashing yourself in the foot with a sledgehammer, it's, you know, it expecting a different result. It's just kind of like, you know, it's only going to be one way. You know, you're going to break your, you're going to break your foot and it's going to hurt. <laughs> it's not going to be smash your foot and you're going to see rainbow dash and vomit out of your mouth and pretty rainbows and flowers and you're going to be skipping through a field like, you know, Mary Poppins or something. I mean, it's, it just fucking doesn't work that way. You know, you're going to be fucking hurting and crying about it. And, you know, Anakin Skywalker is just a <clears throat> Hollywood example of the classic insecurity complex of the individual, you know. His insecurities coupled with anger and hatred, you know, overtook him, and he basically, the good man that was within him got consumed and for a time destroyed, even though not entirely, you know, well... Destroyed isn't a proper word because no person truly gets destroyed. It's severely, severely, severely repressed. 
severely repressed, yes. A person gets severely repressed, some more than others, and some take longer to clear through all of that stuff than others. Some people just go through it at a young age and they don't really have a problem with it. And like me, it's just kind of a natural thing. And you grow up to be a stable human being and, you know, shit just kind of comes easy. And with some other people, it's not so. It's really not so. You know, they have to literally fall on their ass 12 million times before they realize, okay, sure, why? you know, got to try something different. <clears throat> what I've been doing hasn't been working, and if I keep doing what I'm doing, it's not going to work. And the more you and, understand you know, bullshit, the more you understand the bullshit of your own psychology and emotional states, um, it becomes easier to, to relate to others, and you're kind of less of a Nazi and more understanding, and it even takes less energy and effort to ward off bullies. Like, um, I'll be I'll be general because the the details um about this um in their specifics are yours and yours alone to divulge further if you want to. But I'll just say there's there's a, a certain female persona family member since you know you've been little that is just like this bipolar freaking control freak Nazi bitch who um, um, she had always in intimidated Rich and then recently you know within Rich's shifts and gains and understandings um, you know he ended up you know seeing this person again in a family me meeting and it took less than one sentence to you know just kind of throw her off the deep end to the point where now she doesn't even want to like be around him because she's all butthurt and insecure because now she sees that that little easily intimidated insecure little boy has it started to become a, a responsible clear thinking man and you know she can she oh, no longer has the power that, that, that process began long ago I mean it wasn't that I was insecure I was very vocal about my dislikes it's just I learned to stop taking it seriously. I wasn't insecure about her. I was angry. And she'd capitalize off that anger and misery. She she got something out of it. And she'd just, you know, <clears throat> she'd poke at it. And her first name is Diana. I'm not going to say her last name. But, um, yeah, she, she capitalizes off that anger. She capitalizes off of that, you know, that misery and that suffering, you know, like, any typical psychopath does, energy vampires, and, you know, I've had recent clearings and, you know, been figuring things out and growing made in, my, you growing made in yourself, my path. You made and, yourself. Oh, hold on, hold on, I'm getting, let me explain. Just a quick statement, you made yourself. Uh, you know, you, you, I'm, I'm, yeah. And I'm going to explain that just as easily as you could explain it. <laughs> that's all I wanted to say. You made yourself a dry well. That was the only thing yeah, I was I made myself a, yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Toma I say tomato, you say tomato, yes. <laughs> but, um, you know, she she would, you know, she would just, she'd play this, this psychological mind game. You know, she'd find these little things, you know. One thing wouldn't turn anything up, and she'd just, she, she would, you know, she would just sift for things to find, and I dealt with this since I was 11. It mainly started when I was 11, and when you were just a little kid, <clears throat> that's when my dad started going out with her. Well, she started going out with him because my dad just kind of bends over and just kind of allows himself to be synchronistically raped, and he's still going through it, and he's still got a lot to learn, which he will. He's a smart man. He'll figure it out. If he hasn't figured it out already, he just doesn't really know how to act or how to build up the courage to act. I think it's more the latter. But anyway, you know, it started as a kid when I was 11 years old. And when you're 11 and you're a boy, you're a dirt. You, you, you get dirty. You stink. You smell. And... Yeah, 
you know, that's just part of being a boy. It's just kind of an, an American thing, you know, kid, kids grow, go through this stage of not wanting to clean themselves or be hygienic. And she's held on to this notion that I'm a stinky, smelly son of a bitch since about that age, even though I went through that stage fairly quick and I took showers and, you know, <clears throat> and I take showers regularly all the time anyway and put deodorant on, etc. I'm not a stinky person like she claims. But anyway, you know, she just, she, she, she used that, that little tiny smidge because that's all she had to, you know, belittle me, bully me, whatever, you know, and the rule was, you know, if she's there, I had to take a shower or whatever, even though I could have taken one five minutes before, but, you know, if I didn't take one in her house, you know, it's like I never took one and, well, you have to do it because I said so. And, you know, because I was living under my dad's roof and, you know, I didn't have a job for a long time and I was still just technically a kid in the household, I did it because it was, you know, I didn't really have a choice. I couldn't really say no. I didn't have a car yet. <clears throat> and I need to get some water. That's dry. But, um, yeah, I, it would just, you know, I'd do it because it was, you know, my dad, I'd do it for my dad mainly because she'd get after my dad and yell at him and, you know, get all nasty and throw shoes and, you know, just be a complete psychotic frothing at the mouth of bitch. And I hope she watches this video and just fumes because it would just make my day and I'd just laugh and laugh and laugh. But anyway, um, yeah, she, she, she just had, she had real issues. I mean, she does have real issues and she's just a real crazy out of control, psychotic individual, and it, it just it, it it amazes me, you know, it, to the lengths she would go. She would literally she she would just go to these ridiculously weird, awkward, you know, lengths of stupidity over it. You know, one night um, I came in for dinner. I was probably 17 at the time, and, you know, I took in a shower in the morning. I didn't smell dirty. I wasn't dirty. But she insisted I was dirty because I had been working for, like, nothing more than an hour, and I hadn't rolled in the dirt. I hadn't done anything that was really dirty at all. I would hardly done anything that had counted as dirty besides break a sweat, and my sweat is not the type of sweat that smells it's not that fat man, 500 pound BO type sweat that makes you go, woo, you know. And I would know because I've had many other female Get friends. Get my belly! Hold, oh, hold. <laughs> you can make jokes when I'm done telling the story. Then we can laugh and then we can... I, I want, I want... I, 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 I know, get, yeah, get in my belly. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <clears throat> Na, 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 na. <laughs> sumo, you know, but, um, yeah, I mean, it's, it, it was just, it, but anyway, you know, come in, wash my hands thoroughly, so, you know, watch me do it, and then she accuses me of not washing my hands, which is like, what are you smoking, or what aren't you smoking, what, whichever of the two, you know, go sit at the table, and she's like, oh, you can't, you can't eat in here. You have to eat outside with the dogs. If you're going to, you, you fucking smell, you have to go outside. Blah, 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 blah. Starts bitching and moaning, bitching and moaning, bitching and moaning. So I just pick up my plate, I go outside, and it's like, okay, whatever. Eat outside. One, that's one instance of something she would do. I mean, she'd just go on stupid. She'd just get stupid. Act like a freaking dumbass bitch. And then there was another night, another day, I should say. She's also very paranoid about people on her computer for whatever reason. And she was having trouble with her computer or whatever and because it wouldn't play videos for whatever reason. And I knew exactly what it was. She needed to download Adobe Flash Player and she claims to be a genius at computers even though she hasn't even proven it to me once <clears throat> that she's good with computers. I honestly think my left testicle knows more than she does about computers. 
But anyway, I say, okay, I'm going to get on your computer. You know, I tell her what she wanted me to do it. She, <clears throat> she wanted me to do it. So I sit down, I get on, and I download. I, I told her, okay, I'm going to download Adobe Flash Player. You know, I get on Google Chrome, and she got pissed off that I downloaded Google Chrome a long time ago because she was bitching and moaning, and I overheard it not too long before that, that Internet Explorer is slow, I wish there was something else, blah, 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 blah. So I download Google Chrome because... Any man who has a basic understanding of the internet knows Google Chrome is one of the fastest browsers out there, you know, or Mozilla Firefox or whatever, whatever, pick your poison. I download Google Chrome because that's what I use personally, and it's a fast, moving, good browser. And she flipped out, went into a tangent over that, so that I, <coughs> I'm going to go get a fucking bottle of water. I can't. I can't fucking talk. <clears throat> I'll be right back. Yep. No, we'll just wait a moment for him to do that. Won't take him too long. So just kind of bear with us here. He'll return in a sec. I personally prefer Firefox, but uh, whatever anybody prefers, um, there's Chrome, there's Firefox, there's Opera, there's all these different web browsers. Um, I run Linux, I don't run Windows, but um, all basically most of the same web browsers for Windows are also available for Linux and so on and so forth, and usually for Mac too, so, I mean, you know, whatever anybody prefers. Um, you know, whatever floats your boat, but Internet Explorer is a total piece of crap. Internet Explorer eats glue. It eats glue. It's literally the kid in kindergarten that eats glue. It's the slowest, worst piece of shit I've ever. I don't even. I don't even use Internet Explorer. If Internet Explorer pops up on <coughs> pops up on my computer, I get. I just, I, I just, I, I, any computer that's a piece of shit to begin with that has Internet Explorer on it, I just want to pick it up and toss it out a second story window and watch the computer go <laughs> and shatter into a million pieces. I, I hate, if Windows, if Internet Explorer was a computer, a physical computer, I would take that fucker to the range, and I would put a thousand rounds of ammunition through it. I hate that. I hate that search engine so much. It's it's terrible. It's slow. It crashes. Browser. Yeah. Bro <laughs> search it's engine. Well, Internet Explorer is pretty much like a search. I mean, whatever browser. I mean, it's I call like, it Internet Exploder. Internet Exploder, exactly. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Hmm. Mm. Anyway, so moving on with your um, with your story with the uh, the mm -hmm. psychotic crazy but, bitch. But, 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 Unfortunately, but, but, her, but, yeah. her career field, uh, from what I understand, is dealing with people who are emotionally fragile. So God only knows how many lives her arrogant ass has ruined. Yeah, but can... she's a victim's assistance advocate for Jackson County. Uh huh. <laughs> Isn't that ironic? Yeah. I bet all of you are thinking, like, why the hell is the psycho... Well, I guess that kind of makes sense. It takes a psychopath to know a victim. <laughs> sounds familiar, don't it? Uh, sounds like a criminal fiat government that's currently ruling the United States. <laughs> Any, anyway, anyway, it gets better. Um, yeah, I download, I download Google Chrome because it's fast, you know, and it works. And she she flips out over that. She she just like oh she he downloaded a virus onto my computer. He's downloading fucking viruses now. Nah, 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 nah. You know, just stupid stupid ac accusations. I mean, just stuff. It's like what are you talking about? A, a browser is not a virus. 
That's like saying the grass is blue and the sky is green. Where's your logic there? There is none. Well, I think Internet Explorer is a virus, but that's a whole other topic. And she likes Internet Explorer, so there you go. But anyway, I do that. And then, you know, this is probably a month and a half after that whole fiasco <clears throat> with Google Chrome, maybe even six months after. I don't even really remember. It's I, I, I've dealt with so many instances of the shit, half of it I don't even remember because I don't give a shit anymore because I've moved on. She'd remember it all because she still gives a shit. So she'd remember every last niche of it. And it probably sparked my memories and go, oh, yeah. <clears throat> but anyway, fuck. I apologize. My throat is dry. <clears throat> Sounds like some uh, throat chakra issues there. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, you could say that. <clears throat> but anyway. <clears throat> Dealing with that, you know, I'm helping her. She wanted me. She wanted me to help her because I said I would because it's the right thing to do. So I sit down and get on her computer. I said, "Okay, I'll download Adobe Flash Player for you." And you know, she's like, "Okay," you know, out in the living room. My dad's right there. You know, my dad's backing me up. He's like, "Okay," he knows what he's doing. My son's in the computers. Blah blah blah. And Diana was going along with it at first. And then I said, okay, I'm going to download Adobe Flash Player. And she's like, great, he's fucking downloading more shit on my computer. And she totally freaks out. And, you know, I know she's not that stupid. She knows what Adobe Flash Player is. I know she's not that stupid because she works with computers at work. But anyway, she flips out. She just totally flips out. She grabs my little brother, yanks him, grabs him. Takes him out to the car and says, I'm fucking leaving. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Fucking downloading crap on my computer. And my dad's like, hey. And he's like, you know. And then my dad gets all pissed and he's like, turn it off. And I'm like, well, what the fuck good would that do? I kind of want to just take the laptop outside and just throw it at a tree. And my dad's like, well, that wouldn't do anything. And I'm like, well, screaming at her and just yelling, hey, doesn't do anything either. You could just go out there and unplug the batteries to her car and just take the battery and just chuck it down the side of the cliff, but I mean, you know, you know, I, I mean, that, that woman needs to be set straight. She literally needs to be hung upside down and beaten with a freaking metal baton. Just, just saying, she needs to have her brain rearranged a little bit because she's psychotic, psychotic. But anyway, I, that, that's another instance, you know freaks out about that you know and it's just it's little things it's little things like that whether it be downloading something or you know whether or not I took a shower or something just stupid shit stupid shit you know and then she went on a tangent at some point that she was getting in me and my dad's way and that you know she had to go somewhere else instead and blah 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 you know I'm getting in your guys' way, whatever, you know, creating these... It, she creates drama. She finds things. She makes up stuff, you know, because she can't have a normal life. Normal to her, like it is you, to you and me, is horrible. Tragedy to her is normal. What's not normal to us is normal to her because she's a psychopath, and when things are bad and things are out of control, she's in control, because, you know, she has that major in psychology, and, you know, things have to be hectic and out of control, and this is a woman who is married to an abusive drunk alcoholic who'd go down to the bar and sleep with other women before she met my dad, and, you know, but me, but me and my dad were, were just the devil's children. You know, we're horrible because we're, we're individual sovereign people who are normal. And she can't have normal. And mind you, she had a stepson that was the previous husband's of her stepson who lit, the house, who lit her older house on fire. And that was okay because, you know, 
that's that's to be expected. That's normal. That's okay. Lighting a house on fire is totally normal. Being an arsonist is normal. You know, I mean, I guess I guess burning curtains and destroying half a wall is okay. But you know, there was one time she got me so mad that I punched a hole in a in a wall, and that was okay because that's normal. But see, when Dave when I met Dave, Dave kind of completed the puzzle, or helped me complete the puzzle, and then I kind of did all the pieces with her, and I'm like, oh, I see how she works. You know, I finally figured out her inner mechanisms and what strings I can pull. And once you really kind of unlock the, <clears throat> the psychology of the human mind, which isn't hard to do, all you have to do is let go of the drama and let go of the bullshit. Go within yourself, untangle all the shit inside yourself, take all of the experiences you've had, good and bad, and then you have human psychology like that. You've got a psychology major just like that. You don't have to go to school. You don't have to do nothing. It's all within your head right now. Every person that's listening to this, you have the capability to do exactly as I did. And whether you're willing to act upon that is completely up to you and within your own limits and your own time constraints. But anyway... Or as Tobias Lawrence might say, you have to deal with your demons and face your shit. Exactly. Well, yeah. Essentially, you have to deal with your demons, face your shit, and then, you know, once you've done that and you've got all the pieces inside, you figure, you begin to connect the pieces in the external, and then it all really makes sense, and then you're just like, wow, you know, then you become a psychology expert, and then you become an expert in science and physics, and then you start really piecing things together, and then it's like, wow, this is actually really simple, no shit stuff. But anyway, on to the further point of where I'm going with this. This will take a little while. One of the first instances where I got really mad was me punching the wall. I was probably about 11 or 12 at the time. I don't remember what she said. She just pissed me off about something, accused me of something, and made a big fucking deal out of it. And I just slammed the door and... <clears throat> But that's how I used to be. I used to be that kid who'd just it'd convert to anger and I'd just fucking punch a wall or, you know, get really mad and just, you know, get nasty with her or something like that. <clears throat> She'd use my own weaknesses against me. And once those weaknesses were gone and I was just my own self, you know, and she realized that, and she just kind of had an internal explosion because she realized she couldn't pull the strings anymore, and she's like, oh, shit, he's got me figured out. But anyway, um, the reason why she'd make so much shit out of stuff is because she couldn't find anything on me to begin with, and you know she'd capitalize on that, and she'd try. She she'd just pick at little things. She you know, like I've said, like I've reiterated a hundred times now. She'd pick at little things and try to get me to react. And you know, once I talked to start talking to Dave, it just kind of all came together, and you know. Then I decided to go over to my dad's house because I hadn't seen him in a while. And this is that was the last time I'd been up there. I haven't been up there since because she's totally just segregated me from the place. And my dad's being a freaking slave to it. And he's just not going to be a man and stand up to it. And I hope he watches this too because I'm going to say it here. But um, my dad... You know, he just kowtows to it. He bends over and gets raped up the butt by her and just allows himself to, you know, he just allows himself to be controlled. And it's amazing because my dad, to me, has always been kind of like the reincarnation of William Wallace, Indiana Jones, and Benjamin Martin from The Patriot. I mean, he's just that kind of guy. He's brilliant, he's smart, he's an aircraft mechanic, and he's got skills and abilities and that just inspire me. That are just, you know, he's one of my biggest inspirations, and he's, you know, he's just a hell of a guy. He's been all over the world. 
He's ridden bikes in Africa. He's done. He's done things. Rich, your mic just dropped out. There we go. Wake up, Mike. Yeah, l last I heard you say, um, he's done things, and then that's where it dropped. Well, as I was going to say, he's been around the world. He's ridden bikes in Africa. I mean, he's done things that... Most people go, yeah, right, that's a Hollywood fable. There's no way he he could have possibly done that before the age of 21. I'm here to tell you he's done it. He's got pictures to prove he's done it. <coughs> but anyway, he's ridden across Africa. He's done, he's done a lot of cool things. He's been across the Gaza Strip. He's been in Egypt. He's been to Israel, you know. It's been in Europe. He's been, it's been just everywhere. But of course, he hasn't been to Africa since forever ago. I think it was like 1989 was the last time he went to Kenya, and his last experience there was horrible, and it still gives him PTSD to this day. And that's another time for another. To that's another topic for another time. But. Um, Anyway, my father is an inspiration to me. He's somebody I look up to, and I always have. You know, he's smart, he's intelligent, he's, and above all, a friend. He's a mentor, and I, I just—it's it, kind of—it's kind of a shock to see a man of his caliber just kowtowing to somebody like her. You know, I realize he's got a five-year-old son next to her and that he's, you know, staying around for him, you know, or, well, staying around mainly because of him and, you know, he wants to raise him right and do the right thing and he's there mainly for my, my little brother and, <clears throat> you know, but I, I'm just thinking to myself, it's, it's like you couldn't just find a good job with your talents, you know, and just figure something out and just tell the bitch to hit the road and to get lost. Is that so hard to do? But, um, you know, anyway, the main event of this whole pre prelogue story, this background here, and this isn't even the entire background, everything I've said is just kind of selected of what I can remember and what I can kind of reiterate on at this point. I'll probably be able to reference it more in the future, the more things as they come up and I remember them and whatever, but anyway, the main story of what happened is, I think it was around Thanksgiving, somewhere around there, it was like a Thanksgiving thing up there, and or no, it wasn't. What was it for? I think it was just like a housewarming type thing. It was like for, I can't even remember. So yeah, I just, I, I've been in the state and paradigm of just not caring and <laughs> my friends just kind of let it go, you know. It's kind of nice to let things go because you just don't, you don't really remember nor care about them anymore, but I'll, I'll say it to the best of my ability. But anyway, it was a it was a family gathering thing, and there was food there, and my dad cooked burgers and hot dogs and stuff. And my dad was distant that whole night. You could tell it was just eating him up because he knew it wasn't right, but he was just being a pussy and wasn't saying nothing. And you know, earlier in that earlier that morning, you know, she said if certain people aren't clean around here and not looking ship shape for me, they will be asked to leave the property. And me being in the new paradigm field, I just kind of was like, you know, I just kindly was like, okay, whatever, you know. And she left and she slammed the door and she just went to town and I just told my dad I ain't doing it. And his face went white, and I was like, Dad, I'm a full-grown adult. I work for a living. 
And I'm not going to have a bitch tell me how to live. I'm not going to have a bitch tell me what to do. I'm not going to, you know, kowtow to this woman anymore. You know, I'm 19 years old. I work. And I don't need to be told by her, you know, how to breathe, how to eat, how to sleep, how to walk, you know, what to what to wear. I don't I, I don't need that. I never did. And, you know, he sits down and he shakes his head and he's like, Okay, you know. You are an adult, you have a constitutional right to be as clean or as dirty as she perceives you to be, you know, that's your constitutional God given right. I'm not gonna be your mu I'm not gonna be her muscle anymore, I agree with you, you know, it's wrong. You're a full grown man, you know. You're sovereign, you're your own individual, and you know. Essentially he was just trying to say that he loved me and respected me and blah blah blah, but anyway. So we came to a consensus and agreed, and we, we caravaned up to my grandparents' house, you know, and I told Kogo and my Aunt Caraway what happened, and they were all just confused and shocked, and they were like, whoa, what, what, why is she doing that? Why is she saying that? And I explained to her the simple dichotomy behind, you know, psychopaths, and they were sitting there kind of, you know, trying to figure it out. They're like... Maybe when I get done with the story, Dave can go into the descriptions for people who are of an older generation and older paradigm, so that way they can kind of sort of under, begin to understand, if you will, what we mean when we talk about insecure psychopaths. Because, you know, they well, were... Well, I'll, better than, I'll do better than that, because even though I've done this before, I'll just load up Lark and Rose Mental Malware... That'll that'll cut my explanation in half because he says it better than I do. Exactly. But anyway, you know, I explained it to him in the language that Dean Dave used, you know, and I was very simple, and I even broke it down into more simple bits. And one of my cousins, who's African American, um, you know, she's got she's going for a major in psychology as well, but she's not an insecure. But the difference being that she isn't insecure and she isn't insane like Diana is. She understood what I was saying. She knew exactly what kind of language I was referring to. She was just sitting there shaking her head. She knew exactly what I was saying. But, um, you know, we talked about it and my aunt and my grandmother were still just sitting there, just kind of baffled. Well, why? How can you? How can you feel this way? You know, you should be like this or like that. And I'm like, no, no, no. You don't understand. I don't care. And they're like, well, how can you not care? This is. And I'm like, because it's a simple state of not caring. Who says I have to care? <laughs> and they're, you know, and they're sitting there just trying to figure out how I could possibly not be mad or angry or disappointed, and I explained it to them the best I could. I was just like, you know, I, I don't have to care what somebody else thinks about me, you know, whether she you know, you thinks make, on you me. Make, you make a good point. I, I've had the same thing where as I've shifted and, and things happen and I just kind of take things lightheartedly and I'm not getting butt hurt, people are like shocked and horrified, like, oh my god! How could you not be butthurt? That's not normal. Have you turned into a robot? Are your emotions deleted? You should be butthurt and flying off the handle. Oh my God! What happened? So it's like they see it as this horrible thing that you're reacting positively. Now, when you're reacting negatively, they'll be like, "Okay, now calm down. You should react more positive because that's just you know this negative is getting you nowhere." But then when you get to the state of acting positive, they're like. Oh my God! Is something wrong with you? You need to go to the mental hospital. You should be butt hurt and flying off the handle like a moron. And you're not. Why aren't you? Ooh, that's not normal. <laughs> yeah, exactly. It's it's you know it's. <clears throat> I I don't think their reaction was necessarily like that, but I mean you know it was something along those lines of that fact. You know, it was just it was you know. They were all just kind of, they were saying it's not okay for me to be feeling that way. And I'm like, how come it's not okay for me to be feeling that way? You know, I, I even explained to them my dad, you know, understood 
what I meant when I was being the way I was. He was like, you know, okay, you know. And then they were just kind of in a state of just kind of dismay and disbelief. They're like, like, you know, it's something I don't think they'd really witnessed before. It was kind of something new. Well, maybe they have, just not very often, but they were fairly surprised at how I was taking it. But anyway, you know, we all agreed we were going to go up there and do that. And so we did, and later on in the day, we caravaned back up there, and I went in somebody else's car, you know, because I knew exactly what move she was going to pull. And we get out, and we go up there, and, you know, I'm all bundled up in my camouflage jacket, and I got my new new digital camos on that I just bought from Amazon. And Diana was, you know, getting all, you know, invited everybody in and then she saw me, saw me downstairs. You know, or well I kinda there's kind of a driveway thing. It's kinda hard to visualize. But there's a driveway that goes up to the main door entrance and then there's a driveway that kinda goes around and down to the side of the lower downstairs of the house. There's a little patio area that me and my dad had worked on earlier in the day. We cleaned it and got it ready. But anyway, I went down there next to the fire because the fire was gone and, you know, it was all heated up and, you know, I'm just standing there next to the fire. It's nice and warm. And Diana sees me. She comes downstairs. She comes out. And she, she's like, you know, she just sits there and... <laughs> She comes out and she has that psychopathic, you know, looking at me like I'm trash look on her face, you know, thinking she's so high and mighty and clever. And I just, you know, she asked me, did you take a, sh did you take a shower? Did you take a shower like a good boy? You know, and I just, you know, sit there and I just, you know, kind of suck it up on my face. And I'm just like, no. And her face turned from a placid, I'm God look to, I shall give you the answer you seek. <laughs> kind of thing. She's like, Bwah! <laughs> She just totally flips out and she just runs inside, slams the door. But what, does, Di what goes, does Diana need with a starship? Uh, uh, excuse me. What does God need with a starship? Who is this creature? He he has his doubts. You doubt me? I shall give you the answer you seek. <laughs> you have not answered the captain's question logically. What does God need with a starship? <laughs> I mean, yeah. But she, anyway, she went inside. She went upstairs. She's totally flipping out. She's like, ah, you can you can hear her from outside, inside. And she walked up the stairs like, you know, freak out. You know, my cousin Becca's walking inside, and you know, I just I, I I look at her with a big grin on my face, and I just you know I put my hand, you know, my fingers across my throat, you know, doing the death cut thing, and she just looks at me and grins. I don't think she knew what I meant by that until later. But, um, hey, Rich, look at the screen. Okay, hold on. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Anyway, so I walk back around the gravel driveway upstairs up to the upper level of the house, and you know, I go stand out on the deck next to my dad. He's cooking the birds, and he's just I can just see the look in his face. He's just like, he knows what's coming. He's like, oh, shit, here it comes. Here it comes, you know. And she comes out, and she's like, ah, ah, oh, shit. Ah. And she's like totally just fucking freaking out. And I just, I, I can just hear it. And I can just feel all that negative energy just radiating off of her. She's just, because I'm not playing into her ploy. I'm not playing into the tactic. I'm doing something totally different. And she's just not prepared for it and not ready. <laughs> And she's just like, oh, you know, and she yells at my dad, where's my keys? Where's my keys? You know, oh, fuck, he didn't bring his own car. Damn it, damn it. You know, and she's just like, you know, 
because I just totally collapsed her plan, her evil foil, you know, and she's just freaking out. And so she runs back inside, and she's like, ha ha ha, and just freaks out and goes back inside and slams the door. And <laughs> she just, you know, goes and finds her keys and then tries to, like, run around and then, like, you know, my family isn't even aware of what's going on because they're not even of the paradigm to really pay attention to any of that, even though they claimed, if she does anything, we're leaving. And I'm like, yeah, that's about as good as a negatory. And, you know, but anyway, she comes back out and she, you know, my dad, she's like, go get your keys, you know, he's going to take you, you know, and she's like, Ah, oh, shit, my car's blocked. He can't get in my car and leave, you know. You know, so she gets my dad's keys, and then she tries to force me to leave in my dad's truck, and I'm, I just stand there, and I go, no, I'm not leaving. She's like, you have to leave. I said so, because I'm the property owner. I'm like, no, you're not. My dad is the key property owner. The title is in his name, and according to my dad, I am still welcome here, so you have no right to say it. Anything. And then she just laughs in a maniacal evil voice and walks back inside. So I walk back downstairs because I want to get away from her. I'm not, I'm, you know, I want to keep that energy away from me. I want to stick. I'm not a dramatic person. I don't care much for drama or conflict. I just like to keep things at a distance. And, you know, and then, you know, as I'm walking back down to go below, she comes back out, and she's like, you have to get out of here, and I'm like, no, I don't, by law, you cannot force me to leave, and she's like, I'm going to call the cops, and I'm like, you go ahead and call the cops, they're going to fucking agree with me on that, if the main property holder says, I do not have to leave, I am welcome on these premises, and then she just laughs in this maniacal voice, and she just yells something, damn it, and then she walks back inside, and then Nothing else was said. I just kept my distance from her because I had made my point, and my dad didn't look at me in the face for a majority of the evening until the latter part of the evening when she went back upstairs and I was able to sit downstairs and grow s'mores. But anyway, I stuck it to the bitch. And I told that cunt what was what, and I just said, you know what, fuck you. I ain't going with your program. I'm my own man. You can't tell me what to do. Suck it. And, you know, we discussed it on the way back home later that night, and, you know, they, they, I told her what happened, and they're like, what, she did that? How did we not? And I was like, because you guys weren't paying, you know. I was like, I tried to tell you. And it's like, well, we figured something was up. You were upstairs, and she was down there while you were up there, and, you know, she was singing with her, with her uh, daughter, and, you know, brother-in-law, or, or no, son-in-law, and, you know, and they were all saying, and they were downstairs while I was upstairs eating dinner, because I just didn't want to even be next to her, because the energy radiating off of her was just, you know, it was that negative type of energy, it's like, I don't want to be around that, no way, <laughs> keep that shit away from me. It's like sitting next to a McDonald's shit burger. It's like, yeah, I don't want to eat this. No, thank you. It's like, I, I, I don't like I don't like the filet of fish. Sorry. No. Trash. And, and suddenly, pineapples. And suddenly, pineapples. <laughs> yeah. But anyway, she's down there singing hymns with uh, her daughter and stepson, and they're all laughing and making smart-ass jokes. I don't think... Brittany and Robert really re realized, well, Brittany didn't realize what was going on. She knows better than anybody who the psychopath of the house is, and it's her, because Brittany is my stepsister, and she had to grow up with that shit since she was a kid. And, anyway, you know, you know, they're all singing and acting like nothing's going on, and then when that ended, you know, I'm just sitting up there enjoying the view, you know, smoking on my cigar that I have, and I'm just laying back and enjoying life, listening to the music, regardless of the fact that she's down there not giving a shit. You know, because I'm making my point, and it's eating up my dad, and I know exactly what point I'm making, and it's eating up everybody else, because they know. 
to some extent what's going on, but not entirely. But anyway, she goes back upstairs, and I come down there. They call me down there. They're like, Richard, come down and make s'mores with us. Come on. And I'm like, oh, all right. I'll come down. If she's gone, I'll come down. You know. And I came down, and we made s'mores and sat together and talked. And That was the most decent part of it. But, um, yeah, when we left, uh, Becca was like, that was the most awkward thing I've ever done. I'm never going back. I don't care. You know, they ever want to do something else, I'm never doing it ever again. And we all went on family consensus, agreed, and we told my dad, you know, I'm not going back up there ever again. And he understood why. And, you know, anyway. Yeah, I mean, it was just, it was stuck it to the bitch, you know, stuck it to the psychopath. I proved a point. The universe proved it for me just by using her as a scapegoat. And she proved my point for me without even having to say anything more than no. And what I said to her in regards to the law. But, um, yeah, I stuck it to Fence Witch. Or William Cock without a penis or whatever you want to call it. I stuck it to him. And, you know, she's been avoiding me and segregating me ever since, which is totally fine with me because she's a cunt, and I don't give a shit because she's a cunt. And, you know, I'd say to her face that she is a bold-faced cunt. If she has a problem with it, well, she can go get a reality check and a second opinion. But anyway, it's just, it is what it is, and I just kind of, I lay back and relax and don't take it personally and just kind of view it as it is and just view the person as who they are and they're locked in their paradigms and it has nothing to do with me. It has everything to do with them. I just, you know, go, okay, cool. You want to align with that? You can. I'm not going to participate in that. I'm just going to say no to that and just, you know, you can respect my right to that or, you know, GTFO or get the fuck out, you know? Even though I said get the fuck out twice, but whatever. It's an acronym for that. It's just I... I'm just in a state of not caring anymore. It just doesn't matter to me. She doesn't, you know... It's like the saying from a movie that some may know of and others may not. It's a movie called Heartbreak Ridge. It was done by Clint Eastwood. But in the words of Stitch Jones, we no longer mind because you no longer matter. And that's all there really is to it. I just, I called it for what it was and I just let it go and, you know, she did the rest and I went away from it with not a negative experience. I was just happy that I proved a point and, you know, It was an honor to be able to stick up, stick it to her, you know, and call her on her shit and say, look, you're a bitch, shut up, I don't care, go away, you don't like me, leave, because I ain't leaving. Those are your options, you can either put up with me or you can just leave. Those are your two choices, because I ain't going to give you another choice. But, uh, yeah, you know, what else is there to say? It's, it is what it is, and that's all there is to it. Anyway, I'm going to step down off of my soapbox and let Dave get back on to reiterating some of the points I've presented in this long spiel and, you know, make it a little bit more simple for others to at least have some sort of relatively simple understanding of what I was saying, if you didn't catch what I was saying the first time. Well, the only reiteration I feel compelled to do is being shown up on the screen right now, and you know exactly where I'm going. Mm -hmm. Removing mental malware by working us. Exactly. Hey, Dave Kelso. This is, uh... William Cock. 
apparently you want me to stick my log up your ass. You can't uh, play that mental malware. That uh, really <laughs> turns me off. I uh, I like raping little kitties who don't know any better about uh, mental malware. Uh, yeah, we we still gotta make we still gotta make another Google Hangout. That basically, summarizes the whole thing that happened with William Black. But there's a a fun little little creepy factor I'll mention. His, his real name is William Wesley Crouch. <laughs> yeah. William well, Wesley Crouch. Well, that besides that, um, ends up um, seeing its Google Voice isn't a perfect system. There was a, a voicemail that kind of ended up in the bit bucket for a while, so to speak, and resurfaced after <laughs> um, all the whole thing was over and said and done, and Crouch is no longer trying to, you know, be an Oscar the Crouch and stick his penis in, in your DeviantArt group's butthole. But anyway, um, I get this. Um, he actually it, he took the time to track down my Google Voice number on Google, you know, searching and whatever, which... I have it listed, you know, publicly on purpose. I mean, it's a Google Voice number. Who cares, you know? And but he's probably thinking like, oh, I'm gonna scare him. He's gonna think I'm a hacker because he found his number. <laughs> you know. So he calls up and leaves this creepy fucking voice message like, Dave Carlsell, it's uh, William Black. <laughs> you know, he's like all. Like, yeah, uh, give me a call. My number oh, okay, is 1 800, 1 800 Starship. You know, it's like, what the fuck? And the, the caller ID says it's a it's a 773 area code. So, like, Mr. Crouch actually, like, is local. So, you know, uh, I, I thought, you know, I thought there was a big crow up in the tree over there, but apparently it's a Crouch. <laughs> Well, yeah, that's funny. I can reiterate that call perfectly. Dave Kelso. This is uh, William Black. Apparently you want to have a dialogue. Give me a call if you're under 18 at 1-800-773-506-PEDOFILE. No, 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 no. I was going to say... Don't uh, don't actually give any real numbers there. No, <laughs> no real number. One eight hundred seven seven three five zero six pedophile is not a real number. Okay. I'm just making sure you weren't. I don't even remember. I don't even remember the real number. I just remember the seven seven three and the five zero six. I don't even remember the rest of it. You've got a good memory, so. <laughs> I don't remember the rest of it, and I ain't gonna state the real number. I could just to scare him, but I'm not going to. Are you feeling the love, Mr. Crouch? But that was, like, really, really creepy. But it was so funny that... It I really was. Look. It was hilarious. This it's is like, a, yeah, when out and track me down and, like, call me, it's like, oh, my God. <laughs> oh, man, talk about psycho stalker with no life. You pissed me off on DeviantArt, and I'm five thousand dollars in debt. I'm a college dropout. He sounds. You called me on the College on the East Coast or something, because um, he doesn't sound like a Chicago, and he sounds like, you know, like well, no, he sounds like he, from, he, uh, he sounds like New York. He sounds like somebody out or Harvard, Harvard Yard. Yeah, like he like New York, like somebody, somebody. Maryland, or New Jersey, or something like that. Yeah. This is uh, William Black. He kinda, no, he kind of. I want to shove my. He, I want to shove my. I want to shove my twin towers up your rectum there, so you know, get all. <laughs> no, he's he kind of sounded more like he was from New England or something. He kind of had a New England accent to him. I mean, he had that. He had that kind of New England. It wasn't <laughs> that New Yorker kind of accent. It was more of that. You know, kind of new. I could hear kind of a little bit of a New England tone to it. But anyway, regardless, he was from somewhere around there. Definitely did not sound like Chicagoan. No. 
I mean, I don't have a perfect Chicago accent either, but there are certain aspects of the Chicago accent that are within my own and, you know, people who, who know enough to know. Plus, you know, us Chicagoans always love ending all of our sentences with unnecessary prepositions like, you know, hey, if you're going to the mall, can I come with? You know. And plus, we measure distance by time, not miles. Things are always ten minutes away, or half hour away, or an hour away. <laughs> yeah, you can pretty much tell a Chicagoan. And are you being quiet, or did your mic take a dump again? I think your mic took a dump. Now he's got to, like, oh, beat on this. Okay. I was going to say, yeah. I guess... I, I, I guess you're having to beat on on the thing you're gonna beat on your microphone like William Black beats on his dick every night to like gay porn or something. I don't know, but <laughs> William Black's gonna, gonna DMCA this and sue us for defamation of character, even though his name isn't a full real name. Yeah, and I mean you could tell we're that, not, that we're 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 not saying William Wesley Crouch is, we're saying William Black is, which is only a persona. That would be like him saying General Tate instead of Sky Tate. Yeah. Or Rich does this. I mean I don't we're I don't not even saying he does it, we're just saying that he is a high likely candidate to do such things because he really strikes us to be that way just by the way he's acted. In my opinion, that might not even be his, his, like, his actual, you know, real name anyway, because the, the how we got that name is when he DMCA'd um, the YouTube video, um, male, male Egotism and Insecurity, um, the one hangout that we did, and he tried to fraudulently DMCA that, and it's been restored fully, by the way, but um, when he did that, when you DMCA somebody, it gives the other person your information. So the name that he listed, you know, is that. I mean, that could very well be a completely fake, you know, name. Obviously, when you put information into YouTube or Facebook or whatever, there's no guarantee that somebody actually put in their real information. Plus, um, as far as the caller ID entry within the Google Voice interface, it did not, you know, list you know, his, you know, whatever his name was, it just listed the number, so logically, you know, for as far as I know, the name that he picked was completely fake, as far as I know. But unsolicitedly frickin', you know, calling somebody uninvited and calling them when, you know, like, oh, gee, I'm cyber-stalking them on the Internet, so now let's upgrade that to a phone call. Let's stalk them down. That is kind of sort of illegal. I just, you know, in case he is listening, just want to remind him, statutes of limitations is two years. <laughs> so, you know, just so give him something to think about for a couple of years there. But, yeah, should I play the mental malware video now? Yeah. Let's go ahead and do that so we can reiterate on psychopathic thinking, the thinking that the elites have programmed into us. So here we go. The title of my talk today is Removing Mental Malware. Malware as in computer malware, where somebody writes a program and sticks it on your computer by way of a virus or something. It'll be the mental version of that. Step one is, do you want to know the truth? If you really want to know the truth, that requires you to put everything you believe at risk, to question everything you assume, to question everything you think you've already figured out. If we believe what we're taught, if we believe what we hear everyone around us telling us, what our teachers tell us, what our parents tell us, what the community around us tells us, you may have some pet theory, some conspiracy theory, or some weird theory that other people think are weird. And if you found out the truth, you might find you were actually wrong. That your theory was bogus. And if you are not open to that possibility, then you're not really going for the truth. On the other hand, there may be somebody who says, well, I believe what the mainstream believes, and I believe what everyone around me believes, and I'm not going to consider anything that sounds unusual or weird. They want to know the truth either. Wanting to know the truth requires risking what you already have and what you're already comfortable with 
which is why most people don't want to know the truth. Assuming you actually want to know the truth, how do you get there? By using the scientific method or the scientific process. I'm a huge fan of the scientific process. I think it's the only way to reach rational conclusions. However, I'm also a huge critic of a lot of people who stick the label scientist on themselves. The scientific process, in a nutshell, is you take in evidence, you take in data, and from it you try to extrapolate an explanation of reality, or pieces of reality. You try to get a worldview that actually matches the world outside of you. And sometimes you find out, whoops, well, that data made it look like this, but now this data makes it... And so you have to test your theories and sometimes throw them out. A lot of people who wear the label scientist and pretend they like science, what they do is take in a lot of evidence, look at the stuff that already fits what they already believe, and the other stuff, that's just weird, we're going to pretend that didn't happen. So by the scientific process, I don't mean come to the results that are now usually labeled under science. I mean the actual scientific process of look at the world, take in all the evidence you can, and then try to figure out reality from that. Even if the evidence is weird and disturbing and goes against what you already want. Another problem that stops people from using the scientific process is when it starts to point at a conclusion that they don't like. They will often bail out. If you start to see a rational examination of the evidence pointing towards you were totally wrong about something, most people will bail out around the other way because they're invested in what they already believe in. Now, this is especially true if it's something you believed in your whole life and worked on. Maybe you've devoted your career to something, and somebody comes along and says, I want you to consider this and rationally look at the evidence and find out that your entire career was based on a gigantic lie. There is a huge motivation to not look at that, to not use the scientific process. That's what each one of us has to look out for inside our own heads. Are there any walls we put up because we think, I don't really like where that evidence and logic is leading me, I'm just going to kind of stick a wall there and pretend I didn't see that. That's the comfortable easy thing. There are lots of conclusions people don't want to reach. There are lots and lots of conspiracy theories, and when people say conspiracy theory, they're usually bashing it, and what they usually mean is, I don't want to consider the possibility that the explanation for this event that happened is something that's really going to creep me out. So I'm going to call it a conspiracy theory. That is not scientific and that is not rational. When you have things happen like what happened in Boston in 9-11, I don't even bother telling people what I think very often or arguing the evidence. I just go to people and say, did you look at this evidence? Did you approach this wanting to know what happened? Or did you approach this determined that this will be the conclusion you reach no matter what? And that's most people, because most people don't want to know the truth. And the only people who ever move it forward are the ones who say, yeah, I want to know the whole truth. It might be unpleasant, and it might totally mess up my view of the world, and it might mess up my life and everything else, but uh, yeah, truth's got to come first. Assuming we want to know the truth, and assuming we know the scientific process, why do we come to so many different conclusions? What messes things up for us? Checking for warped perceptions. The primary problem in the world is not greed, and it is not hatred, and it is not malice. It's the fact that people's perception of reality is hugely twisted by things they're taught, by things they hear all around them, by their upbringing. I think it's pretty self-evident that if you have one huge group of people who means well and wants truth and justice to prevail and sees reality as it is, and another huge group of people who wants truth and justice to prevail, and they see reality as it is, they probably wouldn't be trying to murder each other. Which means the underlying problem in every war is not the hatred, even though there's obvious surface animosity while they're trying to kill each other. It's warping of perceptions. At least one side, and I would say both sides every time, their perceptions have been warped such that they think trying to kill that other guy is necessary for humanity. And the guy over there thinks trying to kill them is necessary for humanity. And if the one side or both sides whose perceptions were mangled could fix their own perceptions, the war stops. Because they suddenly realize, okay, you think you're the good guy, I think I'm the good guy. 
If we both understand reality, we'll probably stop killing each other. The problem is, this is something I refer to as mental lenses, things that are inside our head that warp the way we see the world. Everybody thinks he sees the world as it is. It's impossible not to. You think you see reality, you think you have a pretty good grip on reality. There, there may be things you say, well, I don't know about this and I don't know about that, but I have a general grasp on what's going on. Nobody thinks his own perception is messed up. Now, everybody can point to all sorts of other people. And pointing out that somebody else is delusional doesn't make them not delusional, even if they are. The only thing that moves humanity forward is if somebody dares to look inside their own head and say, are there things that are messing up my perception of reality and making me do stupid stuff? Because the only one you can actually change is yourself. And unfortunately, most people would much rather shoot at other people than say, maybe my belief system is based on some bogus ideas. So for the past 10,000 years or whatever, we've just been killing each other because I'd rather kill you than think about my own paradigm. Not a good situation, but it is changing with events like this. Why would our perceptions be warped? When I talk about mental malware, I mean stuff that was put there intentionally to mess you up. Most of what we believe is passed on to us from our parents, our teachers, our friends, people around us, our society as a whole, the media, all the things we're exposed to. I do not believe that everybody out there telling a lie is trying to tell a lie. I believe the vast majority are just passing on lies that they were taught because they don't know any better. When parents teach their children stupid things that they learn, they're not thinking, ha ha, I'm gonna get my kid to this one. They think they're saying reality to the next generation. When teachers teach the same garments that they were taught that's untrue and based on a bunch of false paradigms, they're not trying to be nasty, they're just passing on their own misunderstanding. And this is why, number one, is important, we have to want to know the truth. Because if someone who cares about you and loves you is telling you this and they sound so sure of themselves, the hardest thing in the world is to think, well, you know, Maybe you're totally wrong, Mom and Dad. You know, I know you mean well, I don't think you're trying to take me out, but I think you and everyone around me might be totally wrong about this. You know, another reason people don't want the truth is if you're the only one who believes something, it's really uncomfortable. I suspect people in this crowd know that a lot more than the general public. Not being in the majority is an uncomfortable place to be, which tends to push us into a majority that all and feel confident that together they believe their own destructive things. For the purpose of this talk, what matters is getting it out of your head. Those of you who know about the depression indoctrination system and like John Taylor Gatto's work, you can very much see the openly admitted intentional design of programming people to be easily controlled and, and unthinking machines. It doesn't even matter if you got these warped perceptions by way of misinformed but benevolent sources or actual psychos trying to control you. Because either way, if they're stuck in your head and messing with your perception, then they need to be fixed. The primary example of malware that I talk about is the malware revolving around concepts of government and law and politics and authority and crime and all the terminology and all the thought processes that tentacles come out from the belief in authority. It's really easy to point to some bad guy, to point to some tyrant, to point to some regime and say, that's the problem, they're scary, they're bad, let's go do something about them. The main problem isn't the bad guys. The bad guys will keep being bad guys. The main problem is the power they get from the warping of the perceptions of their victims. And if you fix the perception of their victims, the control freaks don't have any power. Everybody believes in government. They believe it's real, they believe in the law, they believe in authority, and they have all these perceptions that they think are based on reality. That is a great sign that you have somebody controlling what's in here. But if you're convinced that it's law and it's government and it's authority, literally people feel profound moral guilt at doing something that doesn't hurt anybody but disobeys the group of people who claim to be government, who claim to have the right to rule. I love the term law-abiding taxpayer because it's people proudly displaying their malware for all the world to see. 
I am proud that I give my money to a bunch of crooks and I do whatever they tell me. Law-abiding taxpayer. That is all it means. Lots and lots of history is good people who are taught to believe the lie of authority, either just spectating and doing nothing, or actively helping to dominate, oppress, or even kill their fellow man because authority told them to. And that's what I mean by the fact that the problem is not the psychos. There's only one reason we know the name Adolf Hitler, and it wasn't because of Adolf Hitler. It was because lots of people in Germany believed in the thing called authority. And so if the guy is in a certain position and has a certain job description, and he tells you to do something, well, you do it. You follow orders. You enforce the law. If they didn't believe that, what could one goof all with a stupid mustache possibly have done on his own? Same thing everywhere. Red China, Soviet Union, you can go anywhere you want. The mass oppression was not because all the individuals doing it thought, yeah, today I just want to go hurt somebody. It's because they were raised with the malware of authoritarianism and government and law and all these concepts that go together so that they literally feel guilty about doing what they know is right. The Stanley Milgram did experiments which totally show that this applies to Americans as much as anybody else. We know what is right and wrong, and we will do the wrong thing if a perceived authority tells us to. That's the horrendous punchline. And I highly suggest everybody go check out the It Should Be Required. People should be forced to read that book. Stanley Nolan's book is called Obedience to Authority, and it goes all through his experiments, which is really creepy, but it's an outstanding expose on mental malware and the destruction it leads to uh, making good people do really nasty, evil stuff. Even inside the freedom movement, because the malware is so lodged in most people's heads, even the vast majority of people say, I want freedom, they don't recognize their own malware. They don't even check for it. Because they think, the problem's in Washington, D.C. Those guys are bad guys. And yeah, they are bad guys, but they're not the problem. And we have to go do something to that. And whenever that's the focus, you lose, because you miss the underlying problem of the world. The entire idea that we have to do something to the ruling class, whether we have to vote in people who will stick our hand or petition them, we have to have a protest, we have to have a revolution. <clears throat> there is nothing you can do to the control freaks who pretend to be government that will fix reality. As long as that power is in their heads, it doesn't matter what you do to the current ruling class. Elections and petitions, even revolutions, they're pointless because that isn't the problem. If the problem is inside your head, shooting somebody in Washington isn't going to fix it. But if you imagine a world in which the malware is gone, and tomorrow 300 million people wake up and say, I don't really feel a need to give a bunch of my money to them. In fact, I don't feel a need to use their crummy currency that keeps going down in value. I don't feel the moral obligation to obey their arbitrary stupid commands, and I definitely don't want to fuel their war machine in their police state. So, now, if one person does that, out come the jackboots and he gets stomped and killed and thrown in the cage. If 300 million do it, we're done. The end. As long as you're focused on doing something to the rulers, nothing fixes because they're not the problem. And all of their power comes from the malware in our heads, our perceptions that they have the right to do this, that their commands are law, that when they say, give me money, it is robbery, it's taxation. These ideas in the heads of the victims are the problem. But what it comes down to is when people understand the malware, it goes away. Don't be scared of chaos and anarchy. Be scared of the guy who says, put me in charge and I will fix the world. He is not your master. You are your master. All right. Um, <laughs> there we go. I really wish that um, Katarina was around at the moment, but seeing as she's not, I'm going to tell you an interesting story that she told me that happened to her the other day. Um, she's been traveling around the world and stuff, and her latest stop has been um, in the Austin, Texas area, and she'll be there for the foreseeable future until her and her husband, you know, venture on to somewhere else. Um, but anyway, 
she was at this one, well, her and Paul were at this one guy's house um, who was just like this total new agey hippie, but like old paradigm, not new paradigm. And he has legitimate intuitive abilities and stuff, but what people don't realize is that an intuitive ability is like a hammer. It's just, you know, it's a tool. But our paradigms still get in the way. So when he uses his abilities to see certain things, that data still has to pass through his mental malware <laughs> and then ends up becoming really screwed up by the time it gets to his perceptions. And um, he was kind of detecting that Paul was going through his own paradigm shifts, but because these New Agers have really no concept of paradigm shift or integration or balance or anything like that. They're more, more like, love and light, shun the dark, when their intuitive abilities see that someone's going through a paradigm shift. How they perceive it is there's an evil entity or energy attached to them. Oh my god, purify, must purify with the light. Well, you know, there's some group of people who also were all about purification, and they were known as the Nazis, <laughs> you know. So I refer to that sort of thing as spiritual fascism. And um, Katerina and I, we are going to be, um, once again, on... 32 Degrees of Insanity with Donnie Gilson. Haven't haven't really been on that show at all since like 2012. And, you know, we could see the, the nice little logo here. And I did up this graphic. Positive timelines and how to deal with left-right paradigm cognitive dissonance. Barbecue grilling the sacred cows of the... Cynics, conspiracy theorists, New Agers, status, and anyone in society has stuffing themselves into a box of collective Stockholm Syndrome. Leave your dogmas at the door. Well, the story that Katerina had told me kind of inspired me to some funny little spoofs. Because I was like, okay, let's, let's go through the different, different paradigms then. Um, this could be interesting. So, first I have the original logo. Then, because of the controversial nature of this type of radio show, we thought it would be fun to take a look at how we will be interpreted by different worldview paradigm ego lens filters. And this one, selected butthurt ego lens filter, fundamentalist theism. So, as we could see, I kind of did, did up the little ed edit. So, we have... Ogarina instead of Katarina there, and you know I've got the devil horns, and it's satanic timelines and how to burn in hell with your host Satan. <laughs> you know, and so kind of poking fun at the fundamentalist view there. Um, then the next one is more to what Katarina was talking about. Selected butthurt ego lens filter, new age spiritual fascism. So there we are done up all creepy. Katarina's like this, eh, and like I'm this undead zombie with like a hole in my head and you know my eye all screwed up and everything. Negative timelines. Don't listen to these guys. Your entities will harvest your soul. They have an evil, dark energy attached to them. So you must ignore them and shun them and meditate and wait until the Galactic Federation of Light lands in their spaceships and saves us all from these evil, dark, dark, dark things. And then we will ascend into 5D where it's always light all the time. Yeah, Heil Hitler, yeah. Okay, and the last one I've done, I'm probably going to do a few more of these, but the the last one that I've done here is um, Conspiracy Paranoia. 
because that's that's another good one, you know, talking about like what we're saying about the truth movement and stuff. Illuminati timelines. And these guys are an Illuminati psyop for the New World Order. <clears throat> All Masons are evil. And these three evil people are working for the Rothschilds, Bushes, and the evil gray ETs and reptilians. And they only want to confuse you. So don't believe anything they say ever. Just close your ears and minds and shun these evil people. Then for those of you who have ever watched the Andromeda TV series, with your host, Drago Musevni. <laughs> so Andromeda fans will understand that joke, and everybody else will be like, who in the hell is Drago Musevni? But, um, yeah, I, I thought it was just, you know, incredibly amusing to, uh, to go over that, because it shows a lot of this, uh, the mental malware and the... The divisionism, you know, even within the truth movement where bickering and bitching and attacking each other and calling each other trolls and shills, of course, is much more important than actually bringing about, you know, freedom and equal rights and the end of the banksters and so on. Yeah, sticking our penises in people's faces is much more important. Yeah. Um... Rich, I have a question. Have you ever seen Storm Clouds Gathering video called um, Revolution and Instruction Manual? Uh, I don't believe so, no. Oh, that's another really good one. It's, I guess, kind of similar to the Mental Malware one, but it, it covers more like the idea that the revolution of the mind must come first for the revolution of the body, other otherwise you're just, you know, repeating history. Um storm clouds gathering revolution. Okay, so I think I should play this one real quick too. It's about as long as the mental malware one, but I think that um some really good points are made in this and Seeing as you haven't actually seen this one yet, um, this should be a bit of a treat for you too, but for those people who obviously want the better quality, more full screen, better audio version than what will be coming through this uh, Google Hangout here, obviously you can you can see what I searched for and you can see what it looks like and you can see that the channel is Storm Clouds Gathering, so you can you know go ahead and get this on your own if you want, that's fine. Um, I'm going to load this up. This is a fun one, I really like this one. Marino's big year-end savings. Okay, let's. I just wanted to turn that down for a second. Okay. When you have a government that operates without limits, which proclaims the right to arrest, torture, and kill anyone, anywhere, with no warrants, no trial, no due process, when you have a government that militarizes the police and grants the armed forces the power to operate with impunity within your own borders and beyond, a government that views you, the people, as the enemy, and treats you as such, when you have a government that lies to take you into wars of aggression, toppling country after country, killing countless innocent civilians, and sending your sons and daughters, your fathers and brothers home in flag draped coffins, or disfigured and broken in mind and body, their lives destroyed in wars that serve only to line the pockets of an unelected cartel of bankers and corporations. When you have all of this right in front of you, so blatant, so clear, with president after president towing the line of the same agenda, you shouldn't have to be convinced that both parties in this political puppet show are owned and operated by the same interest. You shouldn't have to be convinced that these overrated corporate popularity contests that some call elections are distractions that achieve nothing. And if you see where this is headed, you shouldn't have to be convinced that the system that you're living under must be brought to a halt. These are obvious conclusions for those who've been paying attention. So we won't try to convince you here. This video focuses solely on how to bring that system to a halt. Think of it as an instruction manual for a revolution. There are those who will be taken aback when you start using the word revolution. Revolution, the act of revolting and overturning the current power structure, is an extreme measure, one that should be handled with extreme caution, and in most cases, they should be avoided. Revolutions are dangerous in every sense of the word, and it is difficult, if not impossible, to predict their outcome. But there are times when allowing those in control to stay in control is even more dangerous. Right now, the question you need to ask yourself is this. Are we at that point yet? Can the current system be reformed? 
and then it wants me to click and answer the question. To me, the obvious answer is no. Revolutions begin with a no, may end with a yes. Revolutions begin when you say no to those who claim to have power over you. And revolutions end when you accept a new status quo, a new normal, whether that new normal is an improvement or not. The causes of revolution are numerous in form, but there is one common root, and that's discontent. Discontent is the emotion that builds and builds under the surface. It is a storm which brews in the mind of the people, just waiting to be unleashed. The trouble is that it's much easier to unleash that storm than it is to get people in agreement as to what should come next. It's not easy to get people to see eye to eye regarding what needs to happen after the current system falls. So this is usually put off or avoided altogether. And that's a serious mistake. Without clear objectives, chaos usually sets in soon after the old regime falls. And then, when the power vacuum is created, a tyrant rises to bring order. As a result, the systems that follow revolutions are often just as totalitarian or more totalitarian than those that they replace. It should therefore be abundantly obvious that discontent is not a sufficient driving force for a revolution. That is, if your goal is to actually leave a better world for your children and grandchildren. In order for enough people to have positive results, it must be driven by a clear and realistic vision. A vision that accounts for the world and humans the way that they actually are right now. Not the way that we wish they would be, or that we hope that they might be. And it must differentiate between that which can and cannot be changed in the short term. There is nothing more dangerous than armed men with utopian dreams. So, let's be realistic, shall we? We the people are divided. We have divided ourselves into classes and subclasses, liberals and conservatives, libertarians, anarchists, socialists, anarcho-socialists, minarchists, state-based free market capitalists, anarcho-capitalists, resource-based economy advocates, and more. There is absolutely no chance that any one of you is going to convince all the others that your way is the right way. Unless, of course, one of you rises to political power in the fray and enforces your beliefs by the barrel of a gun. This is the way it usually happens throughout history, and this is what we must avoid repeating. The movement is only successful if it starts with an idea that is strong enough to take root in the mind of the population and inspires and motivates people to spread. It is possible for a diverse and divided people to form a coalition in times of great need and unify around an idea, but it only works if that idea meets the following three requirements. One, it must articulate a clear and defined common interest which allow the people to work together. The necessity for unification, even if that unification is temporary, needs to be evident to all stakeholders, and it must be accompanied by a sense of urgency which impels people to reach out to others in their community and spread the idea. Two, a clear vision of what you're working towards. What are you going to replace the current system with? Ironing out the fine details isn't actually productive. What's needed is a broad and abstract vision based on principles. In human societies, extreme and abrupt changes are usually destructive. All efforts must be made to retain social stability. This means steering clear of any sort of utopian fantasies. Time to rewire humanity is not during a period of crisis. Historically, such attempts usually end in tragedy. Three, a plan of action and a clear understanding of the rules of engagement. We'll refer to these three elements collectively as the conscious revolution paradigm. You don't have to get mystical about it, it just means think before you act. Let's start with the common interest. Establishing the common interest is easy if you're informed. And if the people around you aren't informed, then your job is clear. Inform them. Whether you consider yourself a liberal or conservative or none of the above, the bankers and the corporations which hold the puppet strings of the state have placed us all on a path that leads to complete and total destruction. Our common interest is the world that we're leaving our children. The clear vision of what we're working towards is much harder. Again, there's nothing more dangerous than armed men with utopian dreams. And there's no greater symptom of utopianism than the illusion that we can convince the entire world to accept one monolithic belief system. Yet, at the same time, all great movements are driven by an idea. They're driven by a vision. How do we resolve this apparent contradiction? How do we find a common vision without falling to the naive fantasy that we can unify all world views? The answer is actually pretty simple. And that's a good thing, because only very simple ideas can be transmitted from person to person without breaking down. Our vision must start with the foundational understanding that there's not one single right way for humans to live on this planet, and that it is unacceptable to force others into any system without their consent, or to use violence or coercion to compel them to obey a set of rules that they never agreed to. That should just be common sense, but it's really not for most people. Most people like to use government thugs to enforce their good intentions. They just don't like it when it comes home to roost and the gun is pointed in their face. When the current system falls, there's going to be no way to reconstitute it in its old shape and size without violence and coercion, and even that probably wouldn't work. Therefore, the only real ethical option is to accept that Humpty Dumpty isn't going to be put back together again. When it's time to rebuild, we don't need to figure out one system that everybody can fit under. 
Rather, we need to figure out an approach which facilitates multiple systems side by side. What would this look like? Well, imagine a network of small, voluntarily formed communities bound together in loose federations that cooperate for mutual defense and trade as needed, with decision-making taking place at the local level. It's a simple concept, one that's been applied many times throughout history. The most striking example, however, is the Iroquois Federation, which unified six tribes, each with their own cultures and traditions. The Iroquois Federation existed before the arrival of Columbus and lasted until 1779 when they were conquered militarily by the U.S. Many historians believe that the Iroquois Federation served as the original inspiration for the United States. The most striking difference being that the Iroquois Federation never had a central government. No one at the top had the power to force the member tribes to do anything whatsoever. And yet, this system worked, and it worked well for a very long time. So clearly this is not a utopian fantasy. It's a viable option, and it's the only option that can be enacted on a voluntary basis. The final element of the conscious revolution paradigm is the plan of action, strategy, and tactics, the short-term and long-term goals, and the structure of the movement. So let's start with the top-level strategy, and move towards tactics. Some think of revolution in terms of bullets and bombs, but this is a misconception. Revolutions are about pulling the pillars of power out from underneath the state, one by one, until it falls. The state leans on three primary pillars of power. One, the control of the group mind, ideas, and beliefs. Two, the control of money, finance, and thereby human activity. And three, the monopoly on violence and the use of intimidation to extract obedience by fear. There are three stages of revolution, and they are sequential and they correlate directly with the three pillars of power. The first is the ideological revolution. This is where we undermine the belief systems which support their control. This is where we systematically erode their illusion of legitimacy, their aura of power. We expose these criminals for the scoundrels that they are, and we inspire discontent among those who the state depends on for its functioning. If you're new to this, welcome to the party. It's already in full swing, and guess what? We're winning. The powers that be have lost control of the dialogue, and they know it. In recent decades, Worldwide social change has experienced unprecedented historical acceleration, particularly because instant mass communications, such as radio, television, and the internet, cumulatively have been stimulating a universal awakening of mass political consciousness. The resulting widespread rise in worldwide populist activism is proving inimical to external domination of the kind that prevailed in the age of colonialism and imperialism. Persistent and highly motivated populist resistance of politically awakened and historically resentful peoples to external control has proven to be increasingly difficult to suppress. The second phase of the revolution is strategic noncompliance, or more accurately, defiance. This can take many forms, and multiple approaches can be used at the same time. The goal of strategic noncompliance is to interrupt the chain of obedience for as long as possible, as many times as possible, to publicize that interruption on as large of a scale as possible, to document the police and or military brutality that follows, and to distribute that footage far and wide. The purpose of this is to damage the ruling party's image, because power is all about image. It's all smoke and mirrors. Once that image starts to break down, this inspires others to disobey. Monkey see, monkey do. And when this catches on and contagion sets in, it becomes a force of nature, like a tidal wave. It's all about reaching critical mass. What's crucial to understand here is that revolutions are almost entirely psychological in nature. In this context, building confidence is the most important element. Therefore, it's better to do small, successful operations and build up from there than it is to start with large, high-stakes events. The third stage of the revolution comes when the people have built up the necessary momentum to take the monopoly on violence out of the hands of the current regime. In the best of circumstances, such a transition can be relatively peaceful, but this is only possible when a significant portion of the police and the military have taken the side of the people. The police and military are the enforcement arm of the state, and without them, the powers that be have no power at all. Faltering governments almost always resort to brutal repression to attempt to stay in power. But this is often a fatal error. Even one refusal to follow an immoral order can set off a chain reaction that destroys the illusion of authority that they so carefully cultivate. Once that happens, it's game over. In East Germany on November 7th, 1989, the Communist Party ordered the military to put a stop to mass protests which had been growing throughout that year. The commander of the army refused, and he ordered his men to stand down. This sent a clear message that the Communist Party was no longer in control. This realization spread quickly through the population, and communism fell. Now since this is such a crucial element in the equation, 
it's not something that should be left up to chance. Every effort needs to be made right now to reach out to the police and military, to help them wake up to what's going on, and to let them know that the people will support them if they break the chain of command. Now that we've outlined the big picture, let's look at two other key elements, leadership and organizational structure. Our current system relies on a hierarchical chain of command, a social pyramid which allows a small handful of individuals to control everyone else. In sociology, this is referred to as vertical collectivism. If our long-term vision is not compatible with such a structure, it would be foolish to build a resistance movement which copies it. Ends don't justify the means. The means will determine the end result. So if we want a decentralized, non-hierarchical federation of autonomous communities to replace the current system, the movement must be decentralized and non-hierarchical as well. This doesn't mean that there's no place for leadership. To the contrary, leadership is essential. The distinction needs to be made between leaders and rulers. Leaders walk ahead of the crowd. Rulers place themselves above the crowd. What's needed is a vast network of leaders, independently motivated and capable of thinking for themselves, working to organize groups both locally in the real world and online, unified not by obedience to a single leader, but unified by an idea. Now, while this approach does present some challenges logistically, it has the advantage of making it virtually impossible to destroy the organization merely by getting rid of one or two leaders. A distributed organizational structure is much more resilient. So where are these leaders? Well, don't wait for them to appear. We need you to be one of those leaders. If you don't know how to be a leader, learn. Dealing with crowds is a skill, one that you can refine through practice and study. Anyone who wants to learn the basic psychology of uprisings and how to work with the public should study the following books intensely, reading them several times taking notes and reflecting on what they say. Three books, The Crowd, The Psychology of Revolution by Gustave Le Bon, and From Dictatorship to Democracy by Gene Sharp. These books are all available online to read and download for free. You'll find links to these books in the description of this video. Now, a word of warning, these books contain politics, opinions, and prejudices that I did not endorse. Like all books, they should be read with a critical mind, questioning everything that's said. However, they do offer a great deal of insight as to how to take power out of the hands of a tyrant. Leadership takes many forms and can mean many things depending on the situation. However, the primary job of leaders is to inspire people to take action, to organize people into groups so they can be more effective than isolated individuals, and to train others to do the same. Now, the final element you need to start your revolution is tactics. In the realm of violence, the state has a definitive advantage, and it would be foolish to engage them where they are strongest. Instead, we should use tactics that engage them where they are weakest. Fortunately, there's no shortage of nonviolent tactics which have been proven effective in toppling dictatorships. Gene Sharp's book From Dictatorship to Democracy lists 198, but those are by no means the only ones that can be used. The tactics employed by each group will depend on the mission and the specific goals of the group. The military divides itself into Army, Air Force, Navy, and Marines so that each can be specialized in the tactics of the terrain where they fight. Likewise, a nonviolent movement should have specialized groups for specific issues. This is already developing. We have PANDA, People Against the NDAA. PANDA is a national organization which has been working to fight the NDAA on the state and local level and they've been having successes. What's most impressive is that the founder, Daniel Johnson, started this organization when he was 17. Also, there's the Oath Keepers, founded by Stuart Rhodes, which has been reaching out to the police and the military, reminding them of their oath, and preparing them psychologically to disobey when unconstitutional orders are handed down. The Oath Keepers have made a public stand against the NDAA, and they're gaining traction within the ranks. Others are organizing social media teams to collect and spread information. Others organize street activism, such as writing messages in chalk and sidewalks, or hanging up posters, or inserting small leaflets into books and magazines in the store. The possibilities are endless. Whether you start your own group, join an existing group, or act as an individual will depend on your disposition. No one can decide that for you. The most important thing is to take the first step and start doing something, anything. Take action and break the inertia of passivity. This is how you take back your power, one millimeter at a time. Now, right here in this 15 minutes, You've been given enough information to start a revolution. You might need to watch this video more than once, and you will need to read those books. But now you have an instruction manual, something you can hand out to people and help them to learn. If you'd like more people to see this video, please share it through as many avenues as possible. Post it on Facebook, Twitter, on your blog, or send it to your friends via email. If you have permission to download it, put it on disk, and distribute it on the streets. If you translate it, please post it as a video response so that it's easier for people to find. If you'd like more videos like this, subscribe to Storm Clouds Gathering on YouTube. You can find us on Facebook at facebook.com forward slash StormCloudsGathering, on Twitter at Collapse Updates. You can find us on Google Plus by doing a search for StormClouds Gathering, and our website is StormCloudsGathering.com. All righty. 
Now, when it comes to things like the idea of non-violent revolution, I want to make one thing completely clear with this image here. Um, Rich, are you still with us? Rich? Yes, I am. With this image I made the other day, violence is a form of rape. Being non-violent just means you're not a rapist. It does not mean you won't kill someone who is trying to kill you. And then I did the funny little um, parody here. Silly rapist, freedom is for everyone. <laughs> Making fun of the, you know, the tricks uh, commercials for the breakfast cereal. Silly rapist, freedom is for everyone. Alrighty, so anything you want to add, because soon before this gets too horribly long, I want to go into the, uh, you know, the uh, Russian, uh, you know, video so that the English transcription can actually get recorded onto a, a video screen instead of people downloading the video and be like, oh crap, where did the English go? <laughs> Rich. Yeah, I'm here. What? <laughs> well, I just asked if there's anything you wanted to add to all this. At the very least, how um, did you like the... Well, now that I've seen it again, I, I think I've seen it already because you showed it to me. Now I recall you showed it to me a long time ago. So, I have nothing to add. I'm just listening at this point. So, nothing to um, say about the points that were made in the video or anything like that? Nope. Nothing at all. Um, by the I way, just... I just noticed on TSU, um, in the private inbox, um, my friend Rochelle said, um, Dave, I, I had the most wonderful day today. So, of course, as I said earlier, the um, energetic upheaval isn't a completely quote-unquote negative thing. Um, you know, it's it, how it reflects is kind of just going to depend on the paradigms of the, of the individual. So, yeah, just another example of that. Go ahead. No, I just pretty much nothing much to say. I mean, you know, yeah. Just... <laughs> yeah. This pretty much backs up everything I've talked about already. The um, video that I'm going to go into is about the whole Russian thing, but First, I want to kind of can consult your uh, Deviant Art journal here, because I know that you made a post about it. There we go. Reckless Congress declares war on Russia. Today the U.S. House passed what I consider to be one of the worst pieces of legislation ever. And it just kind of goes, you know, into the details of the, the nonsense of that. And there were a whole whopping ten frickin' people who actually voted against this. So, um... Yay, you know, ten people who uh, don't deserve a, a noose around their neck as far as we can tell. Um, anyway, let's see here. Let 
turn down the volume on the advertisement here because this apparently can't be skipped. Four, three, two, one, blah, blah, blah. But okay, this is uh, geopoliticians discuss the Russian response to America's declaration of war. Let me just make sure I have yeah English subtitles. Okay. Um, anything you want to say about the Russian uh, situations before we play this? Because um, this is a 42-minute video. <laughs> well, nothing specific. Um, it's just. You know, I wish we had an English, like a literal English speaking person that could literally translate everything they're saying because, you know, for a lot of people it's going to be a pain in the ass listening to 42, of, 42 minutes of phonetic Slavic speaking peoples. But, um. Well, simultaneously, we well. English on the screen. <laughs> Well, yeah, you could re read it, but you'd have to put it into full screen. But anyway, whatever. Um, well, that's why I have it as expanded as possible in the view. I don't have it in that little bitty window view. I've expanded YouTube as far as I can manage to expand it. What, you couldn't put it in full full screen? I'm not I'm not sure that that would work. Um, uh, I can try. You, you look into the Google Hangout screen and you tell me whether or not this full screens it into like the whole thing. What does this look like on your end? Is it gonna do that? Because obviously it's full screen literally in my screen so I can't tell because I can't bring up the other screen because this thing is dominating it but you should be able to tell. It doesn't even look like you put it into full screen. It just still shows it as it was when it was in the expanded. It doesn't even show really? it as a full screen. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So unfortunately, I can't. Um, I can't do that then because that only that only shows it that way on my end. It doesn't actually show it that way as far as um you know displaying it in the hangout. Unfortunately. Yeah. Anyway, I don't have much to add on it except that, you know, well, the Russians are, are picked up on the new paradigms and they're figuring it out, you know, much faster than the West is, you know, and, you know, it's kind of ironic that the tides have turned, you know, now the Soviets are the ones on the freedom front and the Americans who have always traditionally been liberty and, you know, E pluribus unum, save France, you know, march into Germany, you know, defeat Nazism, you know. Now we're the, the communist, fascist, socialistic, you know. Yeah, now, now, we're, now, we're the, now we're the Fourth Reich, and Russia is the naive, complacent ones that are waking up into awareness and going, whoa, there's some Nazis that need to be dealt with. So it's like the tables have completely flipped. Mm -hmm. They weren't. It's like the Nazis have fled the Soviet Union and the, the Reichstag and, you know, have all come here, all the different forms of tyranny and, you know, if there are anybody who are politically into the buzzwords cursing at me right now saying, you moron, communism isn't fascism and fascism isn't communism, I'm like, I don't care what it is, I don't care what political, political buzzword spin you put on it, it's tyranny, whether it was... Communism in the Soviet Union or fascism in Germany, it's tyranny, you know. Stalin killed people, Hitler killed people, Mao killed people, Pol Pot killed people. I don't care what political bullshit buzzword you put under it, it's tyranny. And tyranny is tyranny. It doesn't matter if it's a monarchy or an oligarchy or a patriarchy or whatever form of archy, it's a... It's a monolithic control system of domination and repression, you know, and it ends up at some, it goes out to the same ends of, you know, just screwing over the same person who they're supposedly trying to liberate.
you know, that's just kind of my main political spin on that. The Russians are learning, and the tides have changed, and the Russians are not responding in a traditional, you know, well, you damn capitalists, we're just going to nuke your ass like the globalists were hoping they would do. The Russians are just like, bitch, please. I can't do yeah. that shit. I, I rock. Ironically, democracy has become the most tyrannical, because I forgot who made this quote, but it says there, uh, something to the effect of, there's no greater of a slave than a slave that thinks they're free. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, things have, things have changed. It's not, not what it used to be. We're a monolithic, controlled police state under the illusion of freedom that we once truly had. You know, and people who are just waking up to it and think, oh, it's right now, man, it's happening today, it's today, it's right now, it's going on, you know, the invasion is now. No, it's not. It was before you were even a twinkle in your father's eye. It was before your father was even a twinkle in your grandfather's eye. And it was before your grandfather was even a twinkle in your great-grandfather's eye. It was clear back in 1913 when they invaded. It was 100 years ago. And even earlier than that, if you want to go clear back to the 1870s when they started passing some of those unconstitutional acts and stuff and slowly reeling into power. You're going back to the days of Carnegie, Rockefeller, J.P. Morgan. We were invaded long ago. We're just in the end, the quote-unquote end phases. But what they were hoping for was to can't get rid of the Federal Reserve and replace it with a New World Order-esque government. But what they weren't mm -hmm. counting on is the sharpness of the average individual to catch it and go, hey, wait a second. They weren't. They weren't expecting the internet back in 1913, now were they? <laughs> no, they weren't. Give me control of a nation's money supply, and I care not who makes her laws. <laughs> oh, Nathan Rothschild. This Actually, is, uh, that, that was Mayor Amschel Rothschild. Uh, Mayor Amschel Rothschild, yeah, one of the older Rothschilds. Dave Kelso. This is uh, Marantial Rothschild. Apparently you want me to stick your log up your butt. Or my log up your butt. See, I can't even get it straight because it's just... Ugh. Apparently you want me to stick my fiat dollar up your rectum. Give me a call at 1-800-CORRUPT-CRONY-BANKERS. Yeah, I, I was just completely shocked when I when I watched this video because like, you know, I always like grew up in the whole paradigm of like, oh well, even though the Russians are better off than they were before, they're still kind of lodged in this communistic sort of non-understanding of freedom and da 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 da, you know, the communistic Reds and all oh, them pinko commies and all this and that, and it's. It's amazing to see them talking like, like you know, you read back in history and see the way our founding fathers talk and to see these Russians talking in the same way and then to see our, our selected misleaders talking like a bunch of frickin', you know, SS Gestapo punks. It's like, wow, this makes your head spin. Mm -hmm. Anyway, I guess we should get underway with playing the video and see how these Ruskies respond to the temper tantruming William globalists. <laughs> yeah, no kidding. So, all right. Um, you know, sorry there isn't a verbal English version, and sorry if the English text in this transcription is going by too fast, too slow, or to whatever, um, you know, doing the best we can here, but at least we're going to make a recording that has the English text on the screen, 
whereas like you know you can see from the interface there's a download button from one of you know the plugins I have and I also have video download helper and if I were to download that video the English would not come with it because this text is not actually embedded into the video it's being generated you know via Google's little helping software there so um, this will will serve to create an English hard copy so without uh, further ado I digress Спасибо, коллеги. Как всегда, блестящий эфир, смотреть вести необходимо. Тем более мы живем во время, когда политика стала фактором принятия ежедневных решений. Сейчас уже нельзя проходить мимо знаний, как устроена мировая политика, какие цепи для, нас, для нашей страны. Сергей, что нас ждет? Ну, нас ждет а, тяжелая борьба, а, поскольку в этом а, выступлении в а, Нью-Йорке Барак Обама выступал как президент мира, как он считается, властелин, господин мира. И, по сути дела, он объявил нам войну. Я полагаю, что в Украине э, де-факто развертывается так называемая гибридная война Соединенных Штатов против э, России. Эта война хорошо описана в теории сочетания партизанских действий, боевых действий, санкционной войны, дипломатической войны, информационной войны. Смотрите, какая вакханалия творится. И даже э, они вот с этими военными преступлениями, они должны знать. Мы никогда не потерпим русаковского режима в Украине, который убивает русских. Кроме того, я думаю, что Абаме, может быть, его советники не объяснили о том, что миссия России в мировой истории останавливает всех претендентов на мировое господство. Мы остановили Адольфа Гитлера, мы остановили Наполеона Бонапарта, Дорога Карла XII. Ну, надеемся, что... Светлана Карла XII еще напоминали цвета Украины, да? И все, кстати, да, они шли к нему через Украину. Поэтому, конечно, ну, не хотелось бы, чтобы очень большими жертвами, но и, полагаете, знаю, думаю, что адекватность нынешнего Шельтона, она маловата. Мне, знаете, кроме вот этого выступления Барака Обама, очень поразило его предыдущее выступление, по-моему, в Эстонии, где он сказал, что Россия все уезжает, в нее никто, никто не хочет ехать. Ну, это же абсурд. Мы знаем, что в России а, едут миллионы иностранных граждан. Второе место в мире Совершенно верно. мигрантов впереди. Совершенно верно. Более того, для нас это огромная внутриполитическая а, проблема. Как вот, а, население коренное, так сказать, живет с а, мигрантами, получается, что Барак Обама не знает о коренных проблемах России и решается в этих условиях судить о нашей стране. На самом деле, я полагаю, что это во многом неадекватное выступление. Он является марионеткой в руках своих а, советников и должен привить бы волю. Но не знаю, хватит ли или нет. Вот. А мне кажется, мне кажется, что мы должны быть благодарны господину Обаме, потому что он, хотя и не пушкинским, прямо скажем, слогом, но тем не менее предельно цинично и много путано изложил реальную идеологию, которую исповедует сегодня правящий класс Соединенных Штатов Америки. Нас приучали в последнее время, что эта идеология является борьба даже не за демократию, а за права человека во всем мире. Почему не за демократию? Потому что, ну, борясь за демократию, свергать демократически избранных президентов и поддерживаемых лидеров, это странно. А вот в любой стране мира всегда найдется какая-то группа людей, которые будут утверждать, что права нарушаются. И это отмычка, которая позволяет прийти всюду и работать повсеместно. На самом деле, никакая борьба за права человека в идеологию правящего класса США не будет. Они борются только за одно. За права себя как, э, и своего единственного стратегического союзника Великобритании, вместе с которыми они сохраняют монополию в экономике, политике и военной сфере. Эта монополия во многом основана на финансовом капитале, который они в течение долгого времени создавали. Когда Основным продуктом, производившимся самими Соединенными Штатами Америки, были деньги и субденьги, продукты от денег. Таким образом, они имели замечательную ситуацию, когда они имели возможность, никак не ограничивая себя, менять нарезанную бумагу, электронные нули, ре реальные природные субъекты. Я думаю, что да. Реально? Но а при у вас этом... сотовый телефон какой? Произведенный а там, опера... Конечно, только разработанные в Америке. Операционные системы... Разработанные в Америке. Купленными мозгами Конечно. и привезенными из других Конечно. стран. Но, извините, тем не менее, произведенные там. Мало того. Финансовые схемы, правильно сказать, придуманы там. Мало того. 
интеллектуальный продукт, который потребляет весь мир, придуман там. Мало того, все образцы вооружения придуманы там. Давайте не будем упрощать своего врага. И тем не менее, иначе мы себя доведем до беды. Это сильный враг. И тем не менее, в 2008 году давняя система мира пришла без кода, к кризису. К кризису. Теперь для того, чтобы а, оставаться по-прежнему на плаву, сохранить эту систему, необходимы конфликты. Они активно развязывают сами конфликты на Ближнем Востоке. И мы это видим, когда американцы поддержали э, всех революционеров, выступавших, казалось бы, с антизападными лозунгами. И они точно так же пытаются развернуть новый фронт на Украине против России. Да. Э, упрощать врага не надо, так сказать, они, конечно, далеко не дурачки, я не знаю, что там думает лично Обама, но выступление Обамы, кроме всего прочего, да. преследует следующую цель. Э, отвлечь внимание всего мира от того, что именно американцы и являются главной угрозой стабильности мира. Их геополитические эксперименты над людьми, а именно так они на кассе относятся к лабораторным крысам, да, угрожают стабильности во всем мире. И э, не просто стабильности, а жизни каждого конкретного человека, потому что американцы готовы даже пингвинам в Антарктиде указывать, как им жить, кого избирать, или надо дискриминировать там тюлени или не надо. И именно поэтому, между прочим, они придут и скажут, между прочим, пингвины, вы не того пингвина выбрали, так сказать, главного, и мы, и мы, поэтому мы должны быть в Антарктиде. И поэтому... Но, у них недостаточно гей, кстати, Конечно. Пингвин. И именно поэтому, между прочим, Обама с нами, со всеми, поступает как с людьми второго сорта. Посмотрите на тот ряд угроз, который он выстрелил в трибуну. Это же бред сивой кобылы, если так честно сказать. Вирус Эбола. Слушайте, от вируса гриппа больше погибает ежегодно людей. Причем не в Африке, а по всему миру. Дальше Россия, как он говорит, вторглась в Европу, совершает агрессию против Европы. Но даже по так сказать, мнению НАТО, в юго-востоке Украины якобы находилось тысяча военнослужащих. То есть тысяча военнослужащих на юго-востоке Украины – это вторжение в Европу, то есть это откровенный бред. Дальше где-то и Это что меньше, чем количество американских да. военнослужащих, которые в это время находились на Украине. Дальше исламское государство, которое сами же, так сказать, собственно говоря, американцы прокормили. Посмотрите, они весь мир держат две идиоты. Это же откровенно абсурдный ряд. Они, как и на Украине, кстати говоря, там это делают, по, да, там да, это да. делают по их советам, они выстроят абсолютно абсурдную картинку мира, да, где все перевернут ног на они хотят. Это просто, да. это просто такая, так сказать, комедия. Нас они держат за идиотов. Что они, конечно, не, не, не так просто, как нам хотелось бы. Я не говорю там про Обаму лично, может быть, но даже Обаму. Вот мы говорим, ну что же Запад делает со всеми ущерб, ничего подобного. Обама э, у себя в Америке скажут, да, с Украиной получилось не очень, да, мы с Россией поругались. Но в результате этого мы на себя переориентируем Европу, и это дает нам шанс и стимул к нашему экономическому развитию. И это наш успех. То, что там кто-то погиб, если бы тысяч человек, да плевать на это. Это наш успех. Но миллион в Ираке не было наплевать, мир на жизнь. Но у нас есть иллюзия, и есть иллюзия насчет того, что мы какие-то особенные, что я кого на Ирак, а на Ирак, а на украинцев нет. А это не так. Нет. Мне кажется, нашу дискуссию надо перевести немножко в другую плоскость. Мы все обсуждаем, что сказал Обама. А нам нужно обсуждать, что делать России в новой сложившейся ситуации. Для того, чтобы понять, что делать, мы должны понять, что происходит. Я во многом согласен с тем, что говорят коллеги. На самом деле, действия Соединенных Штатов Америки могут показаться нам абсурдными. Но это потому, что они рассчитывают свои шаги не на один шаг, а на три-четыре вперед. Они поссорились со всеми союзниками против России. Напрягают Европу, которая уже от своего вассалитета стонет. Поссорились с Арабской улицей. Со всеми, с кем можно поссорились. Почему? Они действительно хотят везде посеять хаос, посеять войну, посеять революцию. Но здесь важный момент. Зачем это им нужно? Их экономическая система, согласен, зашла уже в тупик чисто математически. Невозможно эти долги больше оплачивать. Поэтому им надо разрушить все остальные экономические системы, чтобы их убогая выглядела на фоне всех остальных как манна небесная. Вот что им нужно. То есть им нужно уничтожить все альтернативы. И в этом смысле их действия абсолютно обдуманы. Но вот давайте возьмем конкретный пример. Смотрите, Муаммар Каддафи, Ливия. Действия Соединенных Штатов абсолютно абсурдны. Они его напрягали несчастного Муаммара Каддафи. Он все время пытался доказать, что он не может выполнить их требования. Они требуют, чтобы он ушел со всех постов. Муаммар Каддафи доказывал им голод, что он не занимает никаких постов и не может уйти. Это закончилось его попыткой доказать его убийством, растерзанием. Смотрите, это напоминает. Россияне, выведите свои войска с Украины. Вы говорите, да вы не войска. Это не важно, вы их выведете. Конечно. Говорим, да не уводили мы войска. Выведите. И, наконец, какой-то непонятный пьяный полковник, уходящий, пишет в факт. Кажется, войска выходит. На что наши мудро сказали? В следующий раз что, уборщица будет писать? От лица НАТО. Докажите, что они были. Никто ничего не волнует. 
абсолютно безумный требования. Конечно, они выдвигают требования, которые невозможно выполнить. И в этой игре по их правилам выиграть невозможно. Поэтому, если мы понимаем, что конечной их целью является получение экономических преференций, то мы должны понять, что мы должны перейти в наступление именно в экономической зоне. Сто процентов согласен. Я, пер... Я полностью согласен с своими коллегами, что система международного права на сегодня фактически разрушена. Президент США, заявив себя как президент мира, заявляет о том, что Америке не надо ни у кого спрашивать разрешения для того, чтобы делать то, что выгодно Америке. Я думаю, что в этой ситуации мы должны делать только то, что нам выгодно и то, что нам нужно. Мы должны защищать свои интересы у себя в России и во всем мире, не спрашивая разрешения у товарища Обамы в Вашингтонском обходе. У нас есть свои интересы, у нас есть братские народы, у нас есть экономические интересы, мы должны их защищать, и мы должны защищать права человека, так как мы их понимаем. И, мы... и что, что нам нужно сейчас сделать? Мы с 91-го года, где-то с 89-го, наверное, односторонне полностью были переориентированы на Запад. Мы смотрели на Запад, как, э, на, на, на будущий рай. Мы ждали, когда вот мы к ним повернемся, выполним, станцуем так, переоденемся, еще не знаю, что сделаем. Сейчас уже требуют то, что мы уже никогда не сделаем. А, и нас там обнимут, поцелуют, и мы э, собьемся в экстазе. Но что-то не происходит. Все выполняем, теперь уже требуют то, чего выполнить невозможно. Вынести войска, которых нет. Сделать что-то, а потом, может быть, когда-нибудь они начнут постепенно отменять санкции. Нужно понять, что все, нам объявлена экономическая, политическая, информационная война. Они не пойдут на горячую войну, они боятся нас, они понимают, что мы можем нанести непоправимый ущерб всем. Но, значит, мы должны жить, опираясь исключительно на собственные силы и на новых партнеров в мире. Мы должны сейчас срочно налаживать отношения дружественные, союзнические и с Китаем, и с Бразилией, Аргентиной, Индией, Пакистаном, Афганистаном. У нас масса Ираном, масса стран, которые готовы с нами торговать, из которых мы ушли, непонятно почему. Мы можем им поставлять не только нефть и газ, мы можем поставлять им и, и, и э, продукцию машиностроения, мы можем у них покупать. Нам это нужно развивать. Нам нужно развивать свою науку и промышленность, которую мы за 90-е годы не использовали просто. Конечно, то, что сказал Обама, это было без прецедента. Все-таки президент Соединенных Штатов с трибуны Организации Объединенных Наций посвятил приблизительно шестую часть речи, прибрав вдвое лимит времени России, как главному разрушителю системы э, вообще международного права, созданного после Второй мировой войны. Э, это действительно беспрецедентно, действительно можно рассматривать как прямое объявление войны, потому что Россия названа здесь откровением вождем номер один, то есть у меня полный текст преступления с сайта Белого дома. Но в то же время, э, понимаете, не, не надо э, считать, что это впервые и что когда-то было иначе. Были э, периоды, на самом деле, когда ситуация была еще более острой. Обама никогда не скрывал своих политических взглядов. Когда он шел на выборы, он написал книгу «Дерзость надежды». И там, в числе прочего, он назвал своих героев в области внешней политики. Он перечислил их фамилии. Это были фамилии Гарри Трумана, Дина Ачисона, Джорджа Маршалла, э, Джорджа Кеннона. То есть всех тех людей, которые, собственно, выходили в холодную войну. Это были люди, которые написали первые планы ядерных бомбардировок Советского Союза, когда у нас еще не было ядерной бомбы. Было несколько таких планов, и они были в поиске к реализации. Почему они не были реализованы? Только потому, что опасались, что советские войска из Германии быстрее дойдут до э, Ла-Манша, нежели мы почувствуем ущерб от первых американских ядерных бомб был просто мал. А реальность такая существовала. Затем, это действительно холодная война продолжалась ведь на протяжении нескольких десятилетий. Вот эти идеи, которыми сейчас вдохновляется Обама, они же вдохновляли всю полку вооружений, вдохновляли вот эту биполярную конфронтацию, нацелили на разрушение Советского Союза. Разрушили Советский Союз, но без нашей помощи, конечно. Но что было после? Конечно, у кого-то была, может быть, эйфория по поводу Соединенных Штатов, но что делали Соединенные Штаты? Соединенные Штаты расширяли НАТО, 
Соединенные Штаты подводили свои войска и военные базы к нашим границам. Соединенные Штаты создавали систему противоракетной обороны в Европе. Соединенные Штаты рассматривали нас как военную цель. Постоянно не было такого момента, когда бы США не рассматривались у нас как военную цель. Сейчас военно планировали в Соединенных Штатах есть только четыре страны, в, которых, в отношении которых планируется применение ядерного оружия. Это Китай, это Иран, который, я думаю, идет скоро из этого списка, это Северная Корея и Россия. Все. Очень короткий список. Украина – это просто вот то, что где сейчас идет холодная война, это уже поле боя. И ситуация сейчас, конечно, для нас гораздо сложнее, чем в то время, когда наши войска стояли в Германии. Сейчас идет война в Украине, поэтому вызов гораздо серьезнее. Сразу после небольшой рекламы продолжим эту принципиально важную для сегодняшнего дня обсуждение. Напоминаю, вы смотрите программу «Вечер» с Владимиром Соловьевым в прямом эфире телеканала «Россия» и идет одновременно трансляция на радио «Вести ФМ». Если вдруг кто-то не успел выйти из машины, может послушать, как у нас все это происходит. Вот вы очень правильно сказали, что надо решать, что делать в России. Вы очень точно сказали, что война идет все время, она не прекращалась ни на минуту. Сегодня был момент, когда вот из этой стаи Шурканы, шакал табаки один в Вашингтоне, в Нью-Йорке там бегал, что-то кричал, Арсений Яценюк, ты что-то жалуется на Россию, такой недовольный. А в этот момент э, страшно довольный собой Порошенко давал пресс-конференцию, на которой он прямой сказал, что сейчас очень хорошее время для того, чтобы уже героев Бандеры и Шухевича, бойцов, на научу, наконец приравняет просто к участникам боевых действий. То есть идет откровенный пересмотр, о чем мы давно говорим, идет героизация нацистов, идет отказ от Нюрнбергского протокола. То есть мы не должны испытывать никаких иллюзий. Для этого мира, который вынужден был, вынужден отказался от нацизма, сейчас идет ренессанс нацистской идеологии. И нам надо не стесняться бороться с этим. Что надо делать России? Ну, Во-первых, еще раз хотелось подчеркнуть, что санкции и агрессия Запада по отношению к нам никак не зависит от наших действий. Абсолютно. Есть, что бы мы ни делали, будут санкции, будут попытки каких-то абсурдных требований, будут э, давить в любом случае. Это война на уничтожение на будущее, чтобы Россия не стала сильной, чтобы не стала очередным центром силы. Что в этой ситуации делать? Будут они э, реаминимировать нацистов, покрывать их, не замечать их преступлений? Конечно, будут. Давайте вспомним, куда убежали нацисты после Второй мировой. Как раз туда они и убежали. Сейчас мы в Германии. Но все-таки в Канаде. Нет, 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 непосредственно Бандера да, долгие да, годы да. работал в Германии. Возникает вопрос, что нам делать? Я опять хотел вернуться в плоскость экономики. Потому что, конечно, мы должны привлекать внимание международного сообщества к зверствам бандеровцев. И ну, это не тел. Все это должно делаться, мы должны делать максимум того, чтобы... Преступники были наказаны, чтобы они понесли на Конечно. Конечно. Но экономика первична. Да, экономика первична. Если мы хотим, чтобы Соединенные Штаты Америки считались с нами, мы должны сделать им больно в том месте, в котором они чувствуют. Это отличный шелест. Это значит, что мы должны построить систему экономическую, которую они заранее хотят уничтожить, но которая будет более привлекательной, чем их система, которая вот вот руки. Что это такое? Сегодня американский доллар держится на вере инвесторов в доллар. Ну, то есть это... В принципе, он висит в воздухе. Вера ушла, рухнула все. Религия, не экономика. Россия имеет большое количество природных богатств. Наша валюта, наша экономическая система может и должна быть подтверждена нашими природными ресурсами. Самое главное, что мы должны сделать, мы должны уйти от эмиссии, которая нам навязана, от формы эмиссии, привязанной к доллару. Только суверенная эмиссия России поможет нам построить эту экономику. Наверное, это правильно. Только очень... Вы меня простите, я вот скажу, что у меня давно наболело на душе. В нашем раздолбайстве, в нашей коррупции, в низком уровне производительности брошены дети с диком количеством мужиков, которые работают в охранных агентствах, непонятно чем занимаются, в вороватом, тупом чиновничестве. Когда заходишь в любое заведение, дикое количество непонятных людей смотрит тебя, как пучеглазые жабы, ждут, что ты их поцелуй, чтобы они обратились в прекрасную принцессу. Поэтому что Америка виновата? Нам поднимая экономику, эмиссия очень важна, вы правы. Природные ресурсы очень важны, вы правы. 
Но где производительность труда? Где, наконец, не знаю, научные школы? Где люди, которые заботятся о том, чтобы повысить свой профессиональный уровень? У нас как это на рабочем месте обсуждают, что начальник дурак, а сосед поднимается по службе, потому что либо с кем-то спит, либо чей-то родственник. Народ давным-давно не занимается повышением собственного уровня во всем виде там. Я говорю, у нас хороший народ, у нас хороший Прекрасно, народ, но для того, чтобы повышать нашу производительность, для того, чтобы делать новые проекты, новую промышленность строить, нужны дешевые кредиты, нужны деньги, нужна эмиссия. Вот строить наши самолеты, понимаете? Самолеты в нашем небе должны летать наши, а не Боинги, а не Рыбак. Нужно еще, чтобы они были пять. Да вы должны строить свои станки, в конце концов. Соответственно, заводить станкостроение, машиностроение. И для этого правительство есть все кредиты. Оно имеет возможность субсидировать эти отрасли экономики. Оно, Оно должно возрастать инженерную бочку, заливать постоянно, да хоть золотые потоки, они будут уходить в ничто. Потому что должна быть система. Володя, инженеры, это не пустая бочка, они готовы на Бар... Вообще, э, бардак, извините выражение, он есть везде. Конечно. Даже в Соединенных Штатах Америки, в Европе, мы знаем, как там работают люди, и, и что там тоже происходит. Всякие там чудеса случаются. Я бы все-таки сравнил э, государственный механизм не с э, бочкой, а с очень большим таким часовым механизмом. Сложный механизм, в котором много разных шестеренок, каких-то деталей и так далее, и так далее. Государство это очень сложно. И то, что нам сейчас надо, это реально функционирующее, собранное э, государство которые дает хорошие результаты, показывает точное время. Что для этого надо делать? Надо перебрать механизм и посмотреть, что там за детали. Мы смотрим сейчас. Слава Богу, санкции ввели. Мы сразу увидели, оп, оп, поскольку у нас детали-то есть, которые могут отсюда вылететь в любой момент, которые сломаются, их никто не заменит. Да? А давайте мы сделаем свою деталь. Может, она похуже будет, но она наша будет работать. Или давайте в Азии купим. Пусть она будет китайская, а не немецкая. Но мы будем уверены. То же самое, надо смотреть, вот деталь, связанная там с наукой, да, вот не хватает здесь того, что 50 и все это пойдет, и оно уже идет. Мы сейчас видим, как поднимается наш военно-промышленный корпус, прям ведь на глазах, да? вот то, что продемонстрировала наша армия в Крыму, да, когда без единого выстрела была реализована фантастически успешная военно-политическая реакция, посмотрите, три гуманитарные грузы. В каждом было немало груженных команд. А ведь они могут, могут не только гуманитарные души перевозить. Логистика, организация, культура вот этого перемещения показывает всему миру, что, как говорил мне мой преподаватель на танковой капле, что повезло вам, Владимир, весь мир посмотрим. Импортозамещение, мозги, наука, возвращение умов вместо, вместо оттока умов, собранные правоохранительные структуры, Хорошо дисциплинированные, компактные, хорошо подготовленные вооруженные силы. Система союзов, о чем здесь говорил, это действительно очень важно, потому что когда ты сталкиваешься с серьезным врагом, а Соединенные Штаты это серьезный противник, у которого своя очень серьезная система союзов, нужна стратегическая глубина. И это обеспечивает нам страны СНГ, страны Таможенного союза, страны БРИКС, страны Шанхайской организации сотрудничества. И все человечество, которое на самом деле устало от американской гегемонии и от американской безопасности. Мы должны тогда показать человечеству новую привлекательную экономическую модель. А у нас пока вся помощь Америке Украине равна стоимости одного халка в зените. Нет, нет. Вот мне бы хотелось, извините, чтобы мы не халка покупали, при всем уважении к футболу, а чтобы наши государственные корпорации занялись тем, что не тратили деньги неизвестно на что, а сделали хотя бы так, чтобы в России в каждой деревне был гад. А то у нас это до тех пор нет. Ну, кстати говоря, вот, это, кстати говоря, вот это, это тоже проблема нашей западной ориентированности в 90-е годы. Мы сами создали такую информационную мировоззренческую матрицу, в которой и люди не хотят работать, потому что они грезят какими-то голубыми бассейнами с полуголыми детками, после попальными, да, лишь бы ничего не делать. И негде им работать этим людям, потому что эти предприятия обрушились, то, что мы в свое время сказали, они не нужны, они ничего не имеют производить, мы не можем конкурировать в мировом рынке. И э, экономика соответствующая, где гораздо легче взять кредит на Западе, что-то купить, быстро перепродать, получить маржу, и все, и сложить ее в банк, может быть, тоже в той же Америке или в Европе. И это 
следствие нашего отказа, когда все ИПРовцы стали да, челноками, это ездили в Это нашего шмотки. отказа от национального проекта, нашего отказа от каких-то претензий на стратегию, потому что мы решили, что надо жить вот этой потребительской модели. Еще пару слов об Украине и о гумасовской. Да? Вот, кстати говоря, это, конечно, деталь. Но э, сейчас на Украине будут закрываться неизбежно большое количество предприятий оборонного э, так сказать, комплекса. Они уже практически на грани полного разрушения. Эти люди нам нужны. Они нам нужны. Они могут понадобиться здесь. У нас не хватает кадров. В этой студии Дмитрий Олегович Рогозин подтвердил ваши догадки, и сказал, что уже несколько лет сюда переезжают лучшие украинцы. Но я скажу еще. И я будут скажу, переезжать. Это, это, это но я скажу, я скажу еще, еще речь. Вы знаете, конечно, Обама произнес свою речь, на нее даже, так сказать, видимо, с вожделением смотрели в Киеве, но вообще-то это речь не большой подарок на Украине. Теперь мы точно понимаем, что с Украины нам стесняться нечего. Вот эти пляски вокруг Украины, что мы сделаем так, когда американцы, так сказать, нас пожалеют, они оказались без, абсолютно бессмысленны. Все. Действительно, все маски в сторону. Нам нечего стесняться на Украине после речи господина Обамы. Потому что он показал, что независимо от того, что вы будете делать, мы будем делать то, что считаем нужным. Поэтому там надо брать все, что нужно брать. И, знаете, и может быть, и сами предприятия нам тоже пригодятся. И есть вот этот момент еще. Мы все переживали, что наша экономика на нефтяной игре. Вот сейчас у больной российской экономики принудительно нефтяную иглу из Вены вытаскивают. А значит, организм надо перестраивать и оздоравливать так, чтобы наконец нефть и газ пригодились внутри страны. Я хотел бы поддержать коллег. Кстати, очень важный, на мой взгляд, очень важный момент состоит в том, что мы должны заявить себя в национальный проект как центр по интерсию. Для этого есть все основания. Еще мир помнит, что единственной силой, противостоявшей Соединенным Штатам Америки на протяжении десятилетий был Советский Союз. И только наличие двух полюсов в мире выстраивал баланс политики, не допустило ядерную войну. Китай сегодня не решается взять на себя роль второго центра силы. Китай еще во многом внутри, внутри себя, продукт внутри себя. Россия как раз сегодня заявляет принципиальную позицию. Не требуя гегемонии, тем не менее должна начать собирать вокруг себя все силы, которые не хотят англо-американского гегемонизма, которые не хотят все свои ресурсы отдавать туда, в одну страну. Это и действительно наша работа с СНГ. Это и расширение русского мира, не будем этого бояться, и будем говорить это открытым текстом. Это, в конце концов, и наша работа внутри Западной Европы. Потому что хочу напомнить, что в свое время Советский Союз в борьбе против э, угроз, исходивших со стороны НАТО, опирался на мощное движение за мир внутри Западной стран. Далеко не всем там нравилось размещение ракет, выходили многотысячные демонстрации. Здесь прозвучала очень правильная мысль. Соединенные Штаты Америки всюду борются за права человека. Давайте разберемся, как обстоят права человека в самих Соединенных Штатах. Может быть, нам надо дать средства борца за права человека в Соединенных Штатах Америки, чтобы они начали борьбу сами. Чтобы дать средства. Дали. Надо сначала, чтобы были средства. Дали. Чтобы были средства, надо, Чем чтобы наша экономика была. Сейчас, Николай, это второй перебор. На самом деле, мне хотелось бы выразить мысль коллеги. Смотрите, у каждой страны есть внешняя и внутренняя политика. Успехи России начала 2000-х годов были вызваны успехами во внешней политике. Удалось нефтяные доходы здесь оставить, повысить уровень жизни. Все это было сделано за счет успехов во внешней политике. Вот теперь мы уже не можем достигать успехов во внешней политике, потому что нынешняя экономическая модель себя исчерпала. Она как плюк, как тормоз, не дает двигаться стране вперед. Поэтому сегодня мы должны сначала изменить наш экономический уклад. И здесь я буду повторять, еще раз повторить, суверенная денежная миссия – это способ Конечно, создания просто вижу, это как один элемент. Нет. Я считаю, что надо пересмотреть, надо уже наконец понять, что идеи Гайдара уже завели Россию в тупик, точка. Но для этой цели необходимо понять, какие новые идеи мы можем предложить. В отличие от Китая, мы вообще не мыслим горизонтами. Ощущение, что мы живем... От отопительного сезона к отопительному сезону, что унизительно для великой страны. Знаете, я полагаю, что сейчас программа, она более-менее все-таки весна. Вот мы 25 лет мечтали о том, что придут технологии, инвестиции, они нам поднимут. Теперь ясно, что они будут блокированы и не придут. Поэтому мы обязаны сами делать инвестиции, генерировать. И это известная модель, когда государственные инвестиции идут, это во-первых. Технологии... Создается наукой, нужно дать, наконец, нормальные лаборатории, зарплату ученых, чтобы они могли работать. Но сила вот эти источники роста, я уже сказал, авиационные промышленные, танкостроение, это обязательно должны развиваться, машиностроение. Но сила еще, 
и воспоренный народ. Посмотрите, какой огромный рейтинг у президента, который ясно выражает народную поддержку. Его надо усиливать. И нам нужно сделать так, чтобы при принятии решения общество было максимально подключено к этому принятию решения. Нужно что-то контролировать. Да? Секундочку, давайте, давайте, еще раз. И нам нужно возрождение морали, прежде всего трудовой морали. Не проститутки, прыгающие по телевизору, должны быть идеалы, а настоящие трудяги, инженеры, врачи, учителя. Вот эти люди должны быть героями, на них должны ориентироваться. Для этого, ну, для эти, люди... Да, для этого эти люди сначала должны быть. Да. Мы... Они эти люди есть. Правильно. Эти люди много, но, к сожалению, почему-то показывают именно проституток Потому по телевизору. Я буду показывать, я, ну, 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 да. я буду показывать людей, которым очень много лет, и которые будут рассказывать, как им долгие годы не давали себя восстановить. Поэтому дайте возможность героям выиграть, подняться, чего-то добиться. Вам, Володь, мы действительно должны все сказать большое спасибо товарищу Обаме за то, что он как нас мобилизовал. Трафик какой-то появился в русском народе. И, но на этом далеко не уйдем. Нет у нас никакого там природного антиамериканизма. Анти Мы должны жить не для того, чтобы Америке насолить, а для того, чтобы свою, свою жизнь преобразовать. Это а, правильно. а для этого... Для этого... Мы должны разработать свою успешную модель экономики. Эта экономика не, не, не должна быть... Она не может быть обратимой. Мы не сможем внутри себя сделать что-нибудь плотненькое, но свое. Не нужно ставить. Нужно ставить только на лучшие мировые образцы. Это можно сделать только в кооперации со странами развивающимися. Бразилия, Индия, ЮАР, Китай. С ними вместе создавать консорциумы и ставить большие технологические задачи. Но новые, новые лекарства, новые самолеты, новые корабли. Это нам нужно создавать вместе в кооперации. И еще. Россия должна выдвинуть привлекательные идеи для всего мира. Это не должна быть идея американской мечты. Мы все по них построились и ждем, ну когда нам Кока-Колу дадут, когда нам там что-то нальют. Другая, непотребительская идея. Идея справедливости, идея прав человека. Настоящих, подлинных прав. И эту идею в мире поддерживают. Короткая реклама, и мы снова в этой студии. Мы... Постоянно заигрываем с народом. Но, естественно, мы часть великого народа, мы говорим о сосредоточении, мы все люди. Но ведь это не мы. Наши деды и прадеды победили в Великой Отечественной войне. Это не мы. Наши деды и отцы запустили первые спутники, первого человека в космос. Наше поколение всего лишь наблюдало страшный развал из Советского Союза в эти 15, сейчас уже больше государств. Наше поколение должно нашим дедам, прадедам, нашим отцам и нашим детям, мы должны передать великую страну, а не разваливающую державу. Поэтому перед нашим поколением сейчас колоссально ответственность. Порошенко сегодня, по большому счету, заявил, что он не президент всех украинцев. Он сказал, что он считает героями бандеровцев и тех, которые воевали под флагами Бандеры и Шукевич. То есть он отказался от подавляющего большинства украинских семей, отцы и деды которых воевали с нацистской чумой. Что должны сделать мы? Вот какие ближайшие шаги должны сделать мы? Для того, чтобы патриотизм не ушел в пустой губы. Чтобы страна стала. Знаете, я скажу вещь, которая могут показаться странной, но которую я глубоко верю. Вот что может сделать каждый? Вот прежде всего, откажитесь пить водку. У нас миллионы пьяные под забором отваляются. Понимаете? Водка – это главный враг русского народа, который убила вместе с больше, чем все вместе взятые завоеватели. Мы должны за сильный, здоровый, ум, умный нации, народом, многонациональным народом. Кстати, здесь надо брать пример старших мусульман, которые, знаете, почти уже не пьют. Мы должны думать о возвращении трудовой морали, о возвращении здоровья. Занимайтесь спортом, чем вы хотите. Читайте книги. Каждый хорошо, прекрасно знает, что такое хорошо, что такое плохо. Еще один маленький момент. Мы все знаем в нашем окружении, кто вор, а кто нет. Перестаньте ему руку подавать вора. Просто вы лично не подавайте ему руку. У меня есть стопроцентный способ борьбы с коррупцией. Вот всегда, если начальник, как начальник, в месте будет использоваться двумя вечными законами. Первый. Делай как я, иди своих, чтобы чужие боялись. Никакой коррупции в стране не будет.
Я думаю, что сегодня как раз тот самый момент, когда политическая и экономическая элита должны серьезно самоограничиваться. Необходимо отказаться от безумных бонусов, так называемых золотых парашютов, от безумных откладов, которые получают руководители государственных и прочих или в прошлом государственных корпораций, вернуть детей учиться в Россию а, и личным примером показать, Граждане о том, что они понимают, мы живем в другом мире. Мы живем в мире, где России брошен вызов. А это означает, что мы должны на практике сплотиться. Это сплочение. И самоограничение сегодня расширит возможности всех. И тех, кто, кого принято называть рядовыми гражданами, хотя мне нравится слово, рядовые варги, а граждане это граждане. Так вот, и тех, кто а, занимает какие-то выдающиеся положения в экономике или политике, они тоже выиграют от того, что сегодня покажут пример такого... Как только выиграет. министр начнут ходить в районные поликлиники, районные поликлиники станут такого уровня, что не надо будет министром ездить для чего за границу. Я против того, чтобы ругать свой народ. Я считаю, что российский народ э, – это великая нация, которая имеет великую историю. И э, я абсолютно уверен в великое будущее. И как показывает эта великая история, мы добивались чего-то, когда ставили перед собой большие цели. Сейчас, больше, чем когда бы то ни было, России надо перед собой ставить очень далеко идущие цели. Надо ставить цели могучего национального рывка в будущее, который действительно выведет Россию в первый ряд самых великих государств планеты. И предпосылки для этого есть. И наш народ очень много сделал за последние годы. Я просто напомню, когда мы вступали в 21 век, мы были 14 экономикой на планете. Сегодня мы пятая экономика на планете. Благодаря чему? Благодаря тому, что люди работали, люди производили. Люди строили. Если в 90-е годы страна разрушалась, мы сейчас по строительным позициям, по строительству квартир, занимаем второе место в Европе, вступая только Франция. Мы построили за последние годы, наши люди построили портовое хозяйство, которое у России не было, мы потеряли порты, теперь у нас есть порт. Возродилось судостроение. Американцы были первыми, кто создал атомную бомбу, мы были первыми, кто построили атомную электростанцию. И мы вернулись на рынок атомной энергетики сейчас в глобальном масштабе. И Росатом является крупнейшей компанией. Советский Союз при всех его достижениях возил зерно. Россия стала вторым в мире экспортером зерна. Нам надо ставить высокие цели развития. Нам надо действительно готовить людей для того, чтобы они могли решать эти задачи. Нам нужна амбициозная бюджетная политика, которая бы не взимала деньги, которые мы получаем за нефть и газ. И складывала, и складывала в американские ценные бумаги, инвестировала в российскую экономику. Нам нужна политика, которая действительно дает дешевые кредиты, дает предприятиям дышать. И для нашего народа, который на самом деле очень творческий, очень самостоятельный, очень способный на очень многое, надо ему просто не мешать. Ему надо да. Да, решить великие задачи. Это, это да, но честно говоря, я больше склонен поддержать Владимира вот в такой самокритике. Конечно, народ великий, история великая, но все-таки эта история действительно не совсем наша. И для того, чтобы достигать высоких целей... Это наша история. Да, того, чтобы... мы должны... Это, 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 не, наша история, это, не, это не, не наше с вами достижение. Это история, так сказать, она, конечно, наша, но это, это дело не нашими руками. Все а для того, чтобы... россиянцы отдали очень много. Однозначно, но для, не, одни создали больше, другие меньше. Для того, чтобы, для того, чтобы достигать их целей, нужно упорство. Я, так сказать, напомнил бы фразу Суворова, терпение в бою – это победа. Вот одна из проблем сегодняшнего э, времени – это вот эта потребительская, потребительская матрица быстрой жизни. Возьми кредит сегодня, так сказать, получаешь то, что ты имеешь, то, то, что ты хочешь получить, дальше, так сказать, тебе э, ничего не касается. Придется ломать вот эту мировоззренческую э, субкультуру потребительскую. Так жить невозможно. Невозможно жить в короткой перспективе. Нам надо научиться строить планы на длинную перспективу. Это касается бизнеса, политиков, это касается всех. Это касается в том числе и людей. Жить, жить желанием э, э, получить все здесь и сейчас любой ценой и ни о чем не думать, это саморазрушение. Вот от этих вещей надо отказываться и в субкультуре, и в информации, и э, вот в мировоззрении каждого человека. 
Я думаю, что нам надо подняться на геополитический уровень. Немножко вот с этого уровня посмотреть на те проблемы, которые есть. Вот если в двух словах, что предлагают американцы? Вот наш президент очень правильно сказал, американцам не нужны союзники, им нужны вассалы. Подчинение им нужно, подчиненные люди, подчиненные государства. Что они им предлагают? Они им предлагают в этом хаосе, в бушующем море истории, которая будет, сохранить немножечко от того, что у вас есть. Но остальное потеряете, но хотя бы это сохраните. Никакой другой альтернативы сегодня нет. Если мы построим систему, которая предложит то же самое, но только сохранение всего, без потрясений и развития, мы начнем раскалывать этот монолитный западный мир. Мы начнем показывать европейцам, что вам совсем не обязательно, как в анекдоте, мыши плакали, но продолжали есть кафе. Да? Вы можете развивать сотрудничество с Россией, умножать то, что у вас есть. Арабский мир, вы можете вкладывать свои деньги в экономику России. Вот это мы должны строить, именно альтернативную экономическую модель. Вот тогда у нас все получится. Я думаю, я думаю, что хватит каяться, хватит заниматься самобичеванием. Мы великий народ, у нас великая история, нам нечего стесняться. Мы, мы должны гордиться собой и своей страной и ставить перед собой великие задачи. Восстановить стратегическое планирование. Закон уже есть. Нужен специальный орган, который будет иметь мощные полномочия. Персональная ответственность каждого должностного лица за полученное Борученное дело. Ты министр, у тебя были конкретные поручения. Отчитался, не справился, в отставку в лучшем случае. По каждому персоналу. И э, помощь согласен, хоть бы и повторяться, переходить к суверенной миссии. Без этого ничего не будет. И продавать нет ни за доллары, а за рубли ну, не в России. Как бы не вотили нефтяники, пусть они вотят. Им удобнее там и так оставлять. Все здесь понятно, схема работает так. Схема работает так, что дилеры оставляют доллары там. Не будет никакого вывоза. Продавать за рубли здесь. И вся выручка будет здесь. Создавать нефтяную биржу в Санкт-Петербурге и во Владивостоке. Переходить туда. Смотреть на две стороны. Со всеми дружить, но никому не пяти земли. Ну что же, как говорили классики, ваши слова до Богу лучше. Хотя в России многое решается и до божественной инстанции. Политической воли есть. Необходимо ее приложить, для того, чтобы страна изменилась раз и навсегда к лучшему. И перешла от разрушительных 90-х, как хватило развития в начале 2000-х, и вышла на новые амбициозные рубежи. Но не забыли об этом сказать народу, потому что без народа ничего не построит. Большое спасибо вам. Напоминаю, уважаемые телезрители и радиослушатели, так как параллельно идет трансляции на радиостанции Вести ФМ, что увидимся. В воскресенье в программе «Воскресный вечер» 22 номера. Though I do not agree with absolutely everything that was said, um, Russia does seem to be in a similar situation that our founding fathers um, used to be in back in the day between that sort of rock and a hard place um, you know you have a, a globalist elite that wants to keep everybody under their thumb and Russia is trying to pull away from that in the exact same way that the 13 colonies uh, were trying to pull away from that back in the day and you see a similar sentiments um, there is a little bit of old paradigmism and some of what was said, just a touch, but mostly it was new paradigm and the old paradigmism was being challenged by the new paradigm. Like obviously the statements that were made about, oh well, you know, vodka is responsible for more death than any invasion, blah blah blah. Again, that's blaming the tools instead of taking responsibility. Um, it's not the vodka that's that's responsible. The vodka is just an inanimate liquid. Um, it's the mindsets of people that you know created the dysfunction. And um, as we've definitely learned in America, um, when you've got people that are undergoing a lot of hardships, they're they're gonna look for any sort of emotional or psychological escape and in some cases that's alcohol, in other cases that's smoking cigarettes. Um, I know in my case it was smoking cigarettes. Um, and of course, you know, drugs and, you know, etc, etc, etc. You've got all this, you know, all these attempts to emotionally and 
psychologically escape um, from the hardships, and so it's really not the tools that are that are at fault, but you know, gotta look at the overall situation and be like, well, you know, why are people gravitating towards vodka or towards any other alcohol or towards cigarettes or towards drugs or towards this or towards that? Why are they going there? And then when you answer that question, it's like, aha, you know, we need to to, to treat our, our people better and, you know, treat each other better and, you know, pull our heads out of our ass and, you know, make society a more compassionate one and then people won't be so stressed and then they won't so much feel the need to um, to have this psychological and emotional escapism. Um, Rich, are you still here or did you uh, nod off during the video or or what? Or, uh, there you are, just making sure. No, I'm still here. I'm just pretending to be asleep like an ass. Oh man! <clears throat> what do you What do you think? I'm sure you just heard the little rant I just gave. So, what are your thoughts? Oh uh, yeah, I mean, but yet again, it's all in perspective. I mean, Russia's going through the paradigm shifting like everybody else on this planet, you know. And um, you know, as Alex Jones says, and yet again, I don't agree with sometimes how InfoWars handles its information because they tend to exaggerate, but yet again, I think it's more for the sarcasm than it is for really anything else, and people tend to take the headlines way too seriously when InfoWars does something they accuse them of not being accurate, and, you know, they say, you guys said this would happen, when it's like, no, we said it might happen. Now, given credit, 10 years, Your microphone just dropped out, Rich, so you might want to, like, you know, like, whoop on it or something. There we go. That's your bad. Got it. Got it. Got it. Got it. Got it. We got it. <laughs> we got it. You're here. Uh huh. Anyway, as I was saying, if I didn't just totally drop out halfway through the sentence, I don't know where I necessarily dropped out, but anyway, as I was saying, Alex used to do that. <clears throat> he doesn't do that now. He's fairly simple if you actually take the time to let go of your ego and just fucking listen to what he has to say based on his perspective. Not, you know, listen to what he has to say, believe nothing that he says, but discern everything that he says. You know, don't say he's full of shit because he says one thing that you just happen to not agree with. That's fine if you don't agree with it. He's not going to force you to believe it. Like, I'm not going to force you to believe anything I'm saying. But anyway, on to the topic of Russia. Russia is going through the same exact things that we're going through right now. Um, and I was going to tie the other thing in. You know, one of the slogans is, you know, the answer to 1984 is 1776. Well, the planet is going through a 1776 awakening. And the next, this next cycle we're going into is going to benefit mankind, you know, within the next 35 years, more than the last 5,000 years of human history have benefited us ever. It's going to make the last 100 years look like child's play. We're going to see industrial booms and industrial explosions that made the last century of industrial progress look like nothing. We're going to see aviation, space travel, uh, technology, science, innovation. We're going to see things explode in fashions and in manners that were laughed at, you know, 20 years ago, even 10 years ago, were thought preposterous. Well, now we're entering an age and a capability where those frontiers are starting to become real, and according to sources that I have, they're already a reality, they just haven't been released to the public yet. And, you know, we're headed into a new Gilded Age, and to quote Star Trek VI, an undiscovered country, we are literally, you know, in a new country. We're headed, you know, as Chancellor Gorkhan said at the table, to the undiscovered country. 
i.e. the title of the film. But we are headed into a new era, a new way of thinking, a new resonance, if you will. We are headed into, you know, the age of expansion and the age of understanding, the age of knowledge, the, the true information age. We're leaving the age of barbarism, and we're heading into the age of information. And humanity is going to benefit within the next 40 years more than the last 5,000 years have given to us already. And it's going to make the Apollo moon landings of 1969 look like mere child's play. We're going to be landing on Mars. We're going to be landing on the moons of Jupiter. We're going to be landing on Phobos. We're going to be landing and heading out beyond the Oort cloud and beyond the solar system and heading into places that were once thought impossible to reach because we're going to be um, discovering new ways of space travel, new ways of in innovation. Things that seem silly right now even are far-fetched, not silly but far-fetched, will become common knowledge, common sense. I mean, look at it this way, 110 years ago, you know, bacteria, little monsters crawling around your, on your hand were thought as a laughable construct, a laughable idea. Oh, little things I can't see crawling around on my hands. Hmm. Right. I'm supposed to believe that? Oh. Well, look at that. What, what did the little mic... What, what did the invention of the microscope discover? Oh my god. There are things called bacteria, and they are in fact crawling around on my hands and my arms, and in my hair and on my face and everywhere in between. And, you know, so as, as far as I can say, you know, just go through the processes, just, you know, go with the flow, go with your intentions, go with how you feel, you know, do what's right, you know, help people where you can, do the best you can, Shun your ego, and by ego I mean the, the wicked parts of the ego, the, the parts that make you think nasty thoughts or, you know, make you think. I think you're trying to say ditch the Stockholm Syndrome and stop and system. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Ditch, yeah. As Einstein, Einstein put it a good way, you can't solve a problem using the same thinking that, that created it. It's just not going to work. Mm-hmm. Exactly. But yeah, you know, we're going through the 1776 revival, and even still with all the expansions in technology and everything else, we're still going to have differing opinions, and I guarantee you there's still going to be when we, you know, join the intergalactic community of other ex extra or well, I guess it would be extraterrestrial because we are all native to this universe, so there's technically only terrestrial, if you want to look at it that way. <clears throat> but extraterrestrial to Earth will eventually be joining a community of many civilizations who have been there for a long time, and some of which will be more violent than others, and, you know, the art of self-defense will still apply in many constructs and in many ways, there's still going to be problems and there's still going to be things to sort, but as time goes on, things will get easier and easier and more manageable. I like to think that, um, you know, like, <clears throat> the globalists have given us this false sense of idea of world peace that, um, world peace can only be obtained um, through utopianism, you know, the whole everybody standing around the campfire singing kumbaya and whatever, and, and that's impossible and won't ever happen. Um, the true road to world peace, I think, is um, everyone being able to respect each other's rights to disagree and, and to hate and you know, all that, because if you respect the, those rights, then you're not getting butt hurt, then it doesn't lead to conflict and violence and genocide and war. And then it's just like, okay, that person hates me, cool, you know, I'll just go over and deal with people who don't hate me. And the person doing the hating is just like, oh, I really hate that guy. I'm, I'm just not going to deal with him. I'm not going to try to force him to my will or stick my dick in his face or 
anything like that. I'm just going to go over and deal with people I don't hate, you know. And when you set that up, that's world peace. Um, a lot of people think we're moving from a type zero civilization into a type one for anybody who, um, you know, has watched any of like the Discovery Channel, History Channel, you know, that sort of stuff. But I think we're moving from a type zero into a type everything civilization because not everybody's going to want to do everything exactly the same way and exactly the same pace, and that's fine. And just like on this earth, you've always had really advanced civilizations, really primitive ones, and everything in between, all coexisting on the same planet, and you still have that today, and you're always going to have that. So, I mean, you're always going to have different levels of advancement. I mean, you know, look at the, the um, Amish reservations in the United States. It's not like they're being forced to be Amish. It's just that's the way they they prefer to live, and, you know, that's respected, and no one's trying to force them not to be Amish. And, you know, the same type of thing. You've got tribes in South America that have lived the same way for thousands of years. And, you know, you got all sorts of different levels, and I don't think any of these levels are good or bad or right or wrong. So when we move into even higher levels of, of advancement and knowledge and technology, I, I think the same thing is going to apply when, when you know, the top civilization on the planet is making Star Trek look like child's play. You're still going to have communities that just, you know, basically have, like, solar and wind and tidal and all that sort of power. They're not going to move into the more quantum stuff because they're going to be like, oh, we want to live a more simpler life. And, you know, even below that, you're still going to have your Amish type of people and you know, you're going you're gonna to have everything in between, and, you know, who's to say that any of those ways are right or wrong? It's just, you know, whatever floats people's boats. And plus, having all that different diversity really inspires tourism. Um, if you live in a particular type of society and you're getting bored with it, and you want to you wanna go see what else is out there, then there are other things out there to go see. You're not just, like, stuck in one thing like oh sorry you know this is all you get to experience screw you so once we start seeing diversity as something nice and in, instead of something to be feared and we embrace change instead of you know seeing change as evil and, and saying this is good and things will get better because right now we're just addicted to all the things we're used to so what are we used to misery suffering death war genocide and when the idea is proposed of, hey, things could be better, people roll their eyes like, yeah, right, you know, we all know that misery and suffering and death and, and being stupid is the only real reality, and it always ever will be, and, and it's that sort of thinking that maintains that reality. You have to shift your thinking in order to change it. If you're sitting there thinking, oh, it can't change, then it won't change by your own decree and, and insistence. Yeah, this is where I shut up and you start talking. So, yeah, um, <laughs> I'm really kind of out of things to say. I mean, I just been listen. I'm just mainly at the listening phase at this point. Um, you know, I've kind of said my piece. You know, it's just kind of yet again. What else is there to say? I just, you know. We're going to be moving into a newer, higher energetic field and, you know, diversity and all, you know. It's not going to change, but it's going to change, if you will, if you get my meaning. All, all births have labor pains, I think, is the point you're trying to make. <laughs> well, yeah, yet again, you say tomato, I say tomato. It's just buzzwords for <laughs> trying to describe the same, same thing. thing. Yeah. Well, as Max Egan like likes to say, um, find as many as many different ways to say the same thing as possible, so that the knowledge can be processed by more people. Because not everybody thinks in exactly, you know, the same way. So it's good to have as many different ways to say the same thing as possible. So whether you're more esoteric and you're talking about it in terms of 
dimensionality and energies and all that, or you're taking it more of the quantum physics science view, or you're taking it more from the religious view, or you're taking it, you know, the religious view, you might say that, that instead of Christ coming back as one person, his consciousness has been endowed inside of every human being, allowing us to have our massive fiber con paradigm shits and facing ourselves and whatever, our own little personal crucifixions of ourselves as the old goes out and the new comes in. I mean, you know, Jesus had his own little paradigm shift when he was on the cross, and just for a second he's like, Lord, why have you forsaken me? Just a temporarily little little loss of sanity on Jesus' part where he temporarily forgot how things work, and then it's like, oh, okay, okay, I'm back again, I'm good, all right. Brief moment of fucking insanity there. Um... So, you know, what, or, you know, whether you're on the more psychological end of it, when you just want to, you know, look at it purely in psychological terms as far as he shifts, or however you want to look at it, it's, it's fine. You know, that's, you know, that's not a problem, however you want to see it. It's just different ways of saying the same thing. People like to bicker and bitch because there's one expression of saying it and then somebody else who uses another expression is like, no, no, that's wrong. My expression's correct. Yours is still shit. And it's like, it's just different ways of saying the same thing. So, you know, however you want to say it, that's fine. But December mm -hmm. definitely so far seems to be one of those culmination points where, you know, it's it's like a, a consciousness spike, if you want to say that, like this high tide sort of moment where all these positive changes are reflecting in these various crazy anomalous ways. You know, it fucking global internet malfunctions and people acting overly nuts or people acting overly nice when and and positive and happy when when maybe their normal routine is acting totally nuts and crazy or you know all all these all these different uh, you know shifts there's a big De December is just a big culmination point um we have periodic culmination points um November of 2011 was a culmination point that's when the occupy movement really was in like full swing so that was a culmination point. It's not really so much about the success or failure of Occupy itself as it is the fact that all of that happened is like a part of taking the pulse of humanity where you can look at it and go, oh, there's a bunch of humans that just started to realize something. Um, so, you know, I mean, December's just one of those culmination points and that's why you see the elites acting stupid and you see all sorts of things going crazy. Um, it's just, you know, hot and cold coming together to create steam, so to speak. So, you know, I wouldn't suggest anybody be in fear of it. Just kind of, you know, see it as everything kind of mixing and boiling in the same pot, so to speak. And, um, you know, it's, it's just it's opportunities for all sorts of positive change. If you want to see it as a positive opportunity and if you want to act in that direction, you can. If not, you certainly don't have to. You can drive yourself crazy and stab yourself in the leg with the fork and beat and berate yourself and, you know, whatever. You can do that. I wouldn't recommend doing that, but you most certainly can. It is your free will right to do that if you want to. But, uh, you know, December's just, it's one of those crazy culmination points. And it hasn't been the only one, and it won't be the only one. After December, there will be other culmination points. The next one might be January or February or March. Hell, hell if I know. Um, I just know that there have been more before this, and there will be more after this. It's an ongoing shedding of the bullshit and, and moving into uh, you know more expanded states of awareness individually and collectively. And it's a it's a bit of a roller coaster ride to to say the least, so, like I said, all I could say is, you know, don't be co-opted by fear, and now I'm not saying don't be afraid, because if you try to, try to repress your fear, then you're just sho shoving it down, like, ignoring the cockroaches in the walls, and eventually they're gonna explode out of the walls and just be all around you, I'm not saying ignore or repress, I'm just saying don't get co-opted, you know? Yeah, exactly. Um, 
Um, interesting point I want to add to that. I mean, if you want to put it in the historical context, since we as humans look at things from a past context looking backwards, we don't see things as they are, we see things as they were in terms of history. Right now we are in World War III. You know, first time Dave told me that, I kind of looked at him a little bit skeptical, like, what the fuck are you talking about? We're in World War III. The official thing hasn't happened yet. And he's like, no, you don't understand. We're in World War III. I'm like, well, how do you figure? And he's like, well, look at this. Look at it this way. All these casualties, all these wars, all these or battles, more like it, all of these violent atrocities that have occurred, you know, within this time period, you know, you could say it's the longest of them, and I'm like, oh, I see what you mean, yeah, that makes sense, yeah, World War II ends, and as soon as it ends, World War III begins, okay, yeah, mm -hmm. and, you know, when this era of suffering and violence is over, we'll look back at it and go, yeah, it was World War III, I was in World War III, you know, and we technically are all soldiers of that war, and, you know, this war is a different one because you don't necessarily even have to have a Kevlar helmet on and a flak jacket. You can just be on your computer fighting the war via information, you know. That's why there's info wars and all that other stuff out there, you know. It's an info war. This it's a war, war. It's a war. Paradigms rather than country versus country. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's a war of paradigms. It's a war of information. It's a war of truth versus deceit and lies. It's a war of awakening. It's not. But it's, it's most it's deadly. Not a, it, it's it's not it's it's not a war that's traditionally fought by bombs and shells. Now it is to a certain extent. I mean, you know, you got all the wars going on in Afghanistan and Iraq and the Middle East and all that stuff. You know, that's been going on for the last 10 years, 10, 15 years. You know, you had Desert Storm, Grenada, Falklands conflict, Vietnam, Korea. You know, you had all that fucking bullshit going on for the last 60 years, you know. You got this war in Ukraine going on, you got the unrest going on in Egypt. Israel, you know, fall of communism, etc. A lot of chaos, a lot of chaos in this World War III that we're going through. But, you know, it's not the traditional war like World War II was where, you know, you wanted to be in the war, you had to go out to the front and do your part for king and country or, you know, work in a factory somewhere. It's, it's a very different war. All you have to do is get online and you know, share links that the globalists don't like and you've just become an enemy combatant of the globalists and NATO at large. I heard a recent statistic that there are over, oh, it was like 8 or 10 million Americans on a, a possible threat list, potential threat list, confiscation list. You know, I read it somewhere, this, I read it this morning, it was like a, just a little blurb out of a news article I saw. It was whether or not it's true, I don't know, but <clears throat> you know, just thought that was kind of interesting, whether or not it's true or false. But um, you know, you don't have to be carrying a rifle and loaded down with combat gear to be in the war and be fighting it. You know, it's not a traditional revolution where you're out in the fields with your long gun and your pistol and fighting against the Redcoats. You know, you can be fighting, oh, according fighting to against the globe. You can f fight against the government, right? right yeah, according, according to our government, if you have more than a week's worth of food, uh, you're a terrorist. And I have more than a week's worth of food, so you know, I guess I'm a terrorist. By their view. Not by my mm -hmm. view, but by their Yeah, you hoard anything. You hoard ammunition. You hoard coins and currency, you know, that actually have some real intrinsic barter value. I have more than a week's worth of food. I have water. 
No. It didn't used to be considered hoarding, though. It used to be considered common sense, like having a fire extinguisher is common sense. It'd be like saying, oh, well, if you have a fire extinguisher, you don't have faith in our fire department, which means you're against the fire department, which means you're against America, which is mean means you're, uh, you're an enemy of the state. It's like, what? For simply having a fire extinguisher? It's the same kind of nonsense. Mm-hmm. Exactly. But yet again... You just reiterated the same point. It just t it ties into the truth versus lies category, you know. Oh, GMOs are good for you. Wholesome, whole grain foods that are naturally grown from heirloom seeds. Ooh, evil. We're going to arrest you so you don't hurt yourself. We don't want you eating that. Fluoride is great for your teeth, even though it's not. Um... But, oh, you drink normal water with high magnesium content and good vitamins and minerals in there to give you, you know, good dense bone structure and all that other stuff. Oh, my God, you are an evil, demonic, possessed creature of Satan. How dare you? Um, and then, of course, yet again. But going on into my reiterated point, I'm going, now we're going way back in time, we're going 238 years back in time, and Dave knows automatically where I'm going with this, and I've reiterated it before, but um, we are being synchronistically aligned, this shift crossroads in humanity is being synchronistically aligned with next year, 2015, will be the 240th anniversary of the Marine Corps' birth. And how is that significant? You're probably wondering to the current political situation. Well, if you really think about it and you do a quick Google search, which is not really all that hard to do, November 10th, 1775, the creation of the United States Marine Corps, the very first continental Marine Corps established, you know, at Tons Tavern in Philadelphia, the Second Continental Congress, Got a couple of regiments of Marines together to fight against the British or U.S. American vessels during the American Revolution. Yet again, crossroads in history. A time when collective ideals that have been around for thousands of years finally culminated into a miracle. And we had the Declaration of Independence signed not too long after that. And America's 200th. 240th birthday will be following just right after that in 2016, and that will be a culmination year yet again. It's going to be a big year, you know. You got the elections going on, even though it's probably going to be a scam yet again. But yet again, I have faith in the universe, not the system. Um, but you know, it's all synchronistically aligned. This crossroads is in alignment with that crossroads. Yet again, it reiterates my point of we are living in the generation of, you know, we are the 1776ers. We are the generation of freedom. We are the new driving pivotal force that's going to be propelling Earth into the next realm of prosperity and freedom. You know what I found interesting? Um, to the best of my understanding, um, Normally, from year to year, um, astrological charts uh, tend to not repeat. They tend to be a bit different. And um, the astrological chart for 1776 is a clone trooper match to the astrological chart of 2012. And 2012 was the end of the world, in a sense, as the end of the old paradigm and the beginning of the new. So... The fact that those two are against all odds, completely aligned, it just kind of makes your point that, you know, we are of that, you know, 1776 sort of generation, that the spirit of 1776 is alive not only in the United States, but the world. I mean, shit, when the Russians are starting to talk like our founding fathers, that should tell you something. Exactly, you know, and it's... Uh, who was it? Thomas Paine who said, These are the times that try men's souls. Well, still true today. And yet again, as the Bible says, nothing new under the sun. You know, I could go on for hours and hours and hours, but you know, yeah, we're living we're living in, in the pivotal times, you know. Um, if it wasn't for the current 
administrate, well, not just the administration, if it wasn't for the current corrupt government, I would be in the U.S. military right now, and I'd probably be, you know, along with my friends somewhere in the Marine Corps, you know, becoming the biggest badass that I could become, you know, even though that's not the important part. The important part is serving for your country and the Constitution and, you know, defending the rights that you enjoy. And, you know, that's what I'd be doing right now. But of course, I just can't give myself over to them. I just can't, you know, my conscience will not let me. I will not, I just can't do it with ease. I just can't go into it, you know. The way they're using our, our military, the way they're using the fine young men and women who go in. And, you know, I've got friends now who are the next in line to do their part for king and country, you know. It's, it's, it's depressing, you know. All these fine young men and women going in, you know, putting a sharp face on, got the nice uniform, clean cut, you know you know, kicking ass every day, you know, they're out there doing doing their thing, whether it's a mechanic or, you know, infantry or office clerk or naval CB, marine recon. I know a little bit of everyone all, all across the branches, and it's just, you know, it's depressing to see these old white vampires in Congress, the House and the White House, even though the one in the White House is black. William there, Blake. There, there, is a, there is a bright side to it. The bright side is is that even though it's learning the hard way, they're going to learn how the world really works um, by experience and all the stuff that they used to think was conspiracy theory. They're going to come back. Oh, home. yeah. No, no, no. No, 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 I, no I, know. Yeah, I know. I know. No, that'll be, yeah. No, that's, you know. The things I've been trying to tell them throughout school, you know, that they just kind of listen to but not really acknowledge, they're going to be like, yeah, you were telling me about that, uh-huh, yeah, preaching to the choir, wow. Um, yeah, mm -hmm. no, that, no, there are advantages and disadvantages to every situation, and that'll be one of the advantages, but I, the main thing, the main point I'm saying is, is it just sickens me to see all these fine young men and women going in and giving it all they have. And some pay all and, you know, others pay some, you know. It's it's just, you know, all gave some, some gave all, you know. And the globalists capitalize off of that, you know. They capitalize off the death of fine young men like that, and some of which who have children at home, have a beautiful wife at home, and, you know, the man comes up in the uniform to the front door, you know, and knocks on the door and says, you know, we're sorry to inform you that your husband's been killed in combat. I mean, what, what the hell can, you know, it, it, it's not the military's fault. You know, a lot of people want to blame the military, call them baby killers, call them what they, you know, people ignorantly assume, oh, the military, yeah, they're so full of it, you know, they're full of shit, you know, they kill innocent people, and it's like, no, it's not the military, it's our government in which uses them, you know, and these are the same people who vote, this is, this is the arrogance of these people, they vote the very scum, the very loathing pond scum that's at the bottom of the pond, into these institutions of government, these same bastards who send our fine young men and women over to die on some foreign it's piece a, of dirt that nobody cares about. The symbiotic relationship. Um, we we demand babysitters with our Stockholm syndrome, and the people who we elect as babysitters that insist that they must be babysitters and rule over everybody else. So it's just it's a cycle of dysfunction. A lot of people forget. That's kind of the wrong term, symbiotic. Symbiosis would be referring to both parties benefit from the relationship. Well, it's more of a parasitic function. That, like, for example, a, a parasite and a host is still a symbiosis. It's a dysfunctional symbiosis. Remember, it's still, let's not be. It's it's still classified as parasitic. Is a parasitic yeah. parasitic relationship. 
but you can have symbiotic. Symbiotic just means two or more participants. There are two or more participants in the dysfunction. So dysfunction can be symbiotic. Symbiotic does not inherently mean benefit. Um, it just means two or more parties are cooperative components. So, you know, so what I'm saying is that the, the elites grow up from little kids being indoctrinated into their own bullshit, the same as we are indoctrinated into our bullshit, and it's a repetitive cycle. It's a meme. It's a, it, call it a psychological pathogen, if you will. Um, but the elites, you know, it's not like a, a little baby elite is, is born and, and jumps out of the womb saying, Yay, I'm a Nazi! Where's my gun? You know, I mean, they're, you know, they're brainwashed over time, just like we are brainwashed over time. We grow up in our brainwashing, they grow up in their brainwashing. It's a psychological pathogen. It's a sickness. It's a disease, is what I'm saying. Absolutely, it's a disease, but I'm just referring to when you were talking about symbiotic relationship in a proper scientific manner, that would be referring to both parties benefit. And that's just the traditional, I'm just going with the traditional scientific definition. I'm not going, what you said makes perfect sense, and, you know. Nitro and, gl nitro and glycerin are a symbiotic relationship. Yeah, yeah, which yeah I'm not, I'm not, I, I'm, yeah. <laughs> I, know, I know what I know what you're saying. Yeah, I know exactly what you're saying. More proper term would be like a dysfunctional symbiotic relationship. You know, it's not a proper symbiotic relationship. And That's kind of what I said. <laughs> well, you said no. You originally said symbiotic. I was saying a symbiotic I know relationship. What you're, I know what you're saying. Function, but you cut me off as I was saying it. <laughs> I know exactly what you were saying once you explained yourself, but I'm just I'm I'm just being I'm just I'm just saying from from the proper scientific standpoint. Don't mean to be an ass, but yes, you made a perfect you made a perfectly good point, and you know you got all these liberal mampy pampy assholes who vote these jackasses into office, and then they send off our children, and they get shot and slaughtered and maimed and permanently damaged and scarred and they come home in wheelchairs or in a box, you know, whatever parts and pieces of them remain, and we drape an American flag over them and say, your loss was greatly appreciated, the globalists will forever be in your debt, and then they spit on the grave. It's just a horrible cycle, and people just, you know, I mean, we're, we're slowly getting there, and people start more and more every day are starting to realize, hey, wait a second, the same bastards we vote in are the same ones sending our men, women, in the uniform to die for quote-unquote freedoms that are supposedly under threat, but in reality are only threat, are only a threat because they're funded by the very thing that claims it's a threat to begin with, and, you know, you got to face the truth at some point. you got to realize, hey, man, it's not them you should be worried about. It's the people you vote in that you should worry about. <laughs> it's kind of like, you know, they're, they claim to be your protector, but meanwhile, once you embrace and hug, then they stab you in the back. And that's pretty much what it's turned into, you know. And... Right now, we're at a, a crossroads in history. You know, it's it's a it's a major crossroads. It's a turning point, and we're getting you know near something big. It's you know it's coming. I can feel it. I know the energies are there. It's coming, and it's slowly, slowly coming. It's kind of like a barrel. It's kind of like a rifle bullet going out of a barrel, and you know super slow motion, you know, it's rotating, it's rotating, it's rotating, you can see the shock wave, you know, you can see that metal target coming up slowly, but surely, you know, here it comes, here it comes, here it comes, you know, but we're not quite there yet. We're getting there, but we're not quite there yet. And, you know, 
people got to remember, you know, people get impatient, and people get all kind of razzled up, and they're kind of like, you know, why can't we revolutionize now? Why can't we just kill these motherfuckers now? Just drop them dead like a bunch of fucking pieces of shit. As much as I'd like to drop them dead right now today, number one, you did it right now, the collateral damage would be so terrible. It would, terrible isn't even a proper word to describe the collateral damage. It's like if any of you saw our situation, our little excerpt of William Black, it's a prime example. You gotta deal with it in slow incremental stages. You've gotta you've gotta kinda of plan things out. You've gotta kinda, of, you know, use their own energies against them. And that's kinda of what's going on. And if you really pay attention, you know, they make a move, we report on it and comment and say, Hey, over here, over here, over here and then they and then they remove the chess piece and put it in their pocket and go whistling off into the wind, you know. And that that's the crucial thing right now. We've got to expose these fraudulent phones for who they are. And, you know, we've got we've got to take what they have, which is their power. The first thing to winning a revolution is revolutionizing the minds and the hearts of the people before you can act upon the initiative of taking them out physically. You've got to you got to determine that the trash smells. You've got to figure you know okay the, the bag weighs 300 pounds. What do we use to move it? And you've got to neutralize the odors and then proceed with taking out the trash. Well, you know there's a process to it, and we're currently going through that process. And you know just keep hanging in there. You know I was at a point one time you know. I think it was just right before I met Dave, I was all pissed off, you know, like, why don't fucking people do anything, why don't they, why do they just keep sitting on their ass, you know, doing nothing, well, revolutions don't happen overnight, the American Revolution didn't happen overnight, you know, that's another thing to read in the history books, you know, go back and take a look, I mean, it took well over 20 to 25 years for the initial thing to start happening for that civil unrest to or the civil distrust, if you will, to reach to a boiling point where action finally took place. And we're getting close to that point. It could be next year, within six months, it could be within another year, but or, you know, even potentially three or four, I don't know. It could be at any point, any given time, it could be tomorrow for all we know. But revolutions take time. And to defeat the globalists, one must think like a globalist. And I don't know if Dave is there. I'm here. It's just this perfect little <clears throat> graphic that I know I have here somewhere that I'm looking for that just kind of sums up what you're saying perfectly but I have so many freaking pictures and albums and stuff on the paradigm shift and educational comedy and Facebook page and I'm trying to scroll through and find a particular one and it's just this huge you know, massive uh, <laughs> mountain of images, and it's just like just a difficulty finding the uh, the one that I'm looking for here. So, but as I've been listening, I've been trying to scroll through in another browser window, and um, so far I just haven't found it. I mean, I know it's here. Um, I can't find exactly the, um, the one I'm looking for, so I, I think I've, um, I've spotted, shall we say, a, uh, a second best, <laughs> not, um, not exactly the, the one <clears throat> that I was after here, but, um, I think it'll do for our purposes, and I'm, grabbing the uh, image 
<coughs> URL right now so that I can put it <coughs> on the screen. And, uh, okay. Come on, Firefox. There we go. And there we are. <laughs> Can you see it? Mm-hmm. And that is perfect graphic. And, and I can read that. And, and, and I can. The and original I can. one of it. And I can. Okay. Um, hmm? As I was saying, um, I can read it. Uh, out. Your mic was kind of dropping. Oh, oh as I was going to say... Um, I can read it in the smarmy politician voice. Politician's favorite toy. It's war. Iran, Syria, Pakistan, you name it, we're there. Oh, goody. Let's wind him up some more. Yeah, that's per that's pretty much that's pretty much just an accurate analogy or accurate depiction of the whole thing, you know? It's just, you know, you got these arrogant cockheads, you know, they're just fucking pansies that, you know, sit there and scream about how they're right and, you know, America is some righteous second coming of Jesus Christ, which, I mean, America's an amazing country, don't get me wrong. America's awesome, apple pie is awesome, we got a lot of pretty ladies in this country that are just drop-dead gorgeous, you know. Big California thighs and, you know, double D's and all that stuff and awesome sports cars and firearms and fully automatic weapons and kick but they're all taught to think they're But they're all taught to think they're ugly and worthless and go, I'm not pretty, I never amount to anything. That and is the new Hold on, hold on, hold on. Just, just, uh, just. Just about to add, yeah. Um, yeah, and they're taught to think they're ugly mainly because, yet again, point back to assholes in Congress, the White House, the House of Representatives, who are all controlled by the Federal Reserve, and the Federal Reserve is controlled by the World Bank, who's in control, who's in turn controlled by the JP Morgans, and all the rich bastards who control the planet. Yet again, Let's not focus on the negative um, Stockholm Syndrome that the globalists have put us under in the current state. I'm saying America is an awesome country by tradition. By tradition, as I stated, all those things about the women are true. We have beautiful girls. We have kick-ass weaponry. We have kick-ass gear. We have a kick-ass military. It's just fucking awesome and cool to watch. And just, you know, it's like, yeah, America. And, you know, you've got a lot of awesome men and women in uniform whom I think are amazing people and, you know, really give their heart out and do the best they can, given the circumstances. And, you know, we got a space program that was awesome. It's not so awesome right now because, uh, well, I mean, it's not really going to be awesome when you get a bunch of people in NASA with the giant black cocks waving them around going, you know, our way is the future. Orion's oh, only going to do this. We can't do this because that would be slowing down our progress. We're going to fucking waste our time on this and cut our funding at the same time. We're going to save money while trying to expand operations to ridiculous budget amounts. We're logical. We're the new NASA. We're going to reach out to the Islamic ISIS militants because we're NASA. That's what we do. We're under control of William Cock, and he says we need to do this. And SpaceX is the only way to go into Earth orbit now, and we're fucking gay and stupid and can't do it for ourselves because Obama's raping us in the ass with his... With his record destroying black cock. 
Well, you know what I... But in all other aspects, the traditional America is awesome, and it's been the globalists who have just completely just fucked it over, and it's bad, and it's sick and sick. With our, with our complacent cooperation. But you know what I have to say about that? I have to say this. Oh, I've seen this one. Oh, okay. Type 2 diabetes affects millions of people. No, that's not what I have to say. I have to say Speaking, yeah. of, speaking of America, diabetes. Revolution in beauty. Get ready to experience a whole new you. It's you. Perfect it. Say goodbye to fine lines and wrinkles and hello to full lips, sparkling eyes, and lashes that never end. And that's just the beginning. Transform your look the way celebrities do with this beauty industry secret that's now available for the first time ever. Introducing Photoshop by Adobe. Finally look the way you've always dreamed. The difference is clear. Just one application of Photoshop can give you results so dramatic they're almost unrealistic. Use Healing Brush to target blemishes at their source by simply erasing them. ProPixel intensifying botanical hydrodragon microbead extract infused with nutritive volumizing technology will leave your face virtually unrecognizable. My skin feels like plastic! Take control of your color with hue saturation. Use this breakthrough formula to change hair or skin color, brighten eyes, whiten teeth, even adjust your race. Tired of fighting with your shape? Wish you could be a total knockout? Dial in the perfect you with Liquify. Reshape your body without the expense and mess of surgery. Why eat healthy and exercise when you can just look like you do? And the best part is, it won't rub off. The results don't lie. Pictures like this are all Photoshop. The celebrity beauty secret used in virtually every major magazine is now available to you. You don't have to rely on a healthy body image or self-respect anymore. Now that's the power of Photoshop. MK Ultra, the breakfast of There's champions. There's only one way to look like a real cover girl. Photoshop by Adobe. Maybe she's born with it. Uh, no, I'm pretty sure it's Photoshop. MK Ultra fashion industry, because God needs a starship. MK Ultra fashion industry. What is the secret of Adobe? It's Photoshop! But anyway, yeah. <laughs> you gotta love all this deprogramming. Welcome to Paradigm Shift and Educational Mind Fuck. Oh, you like oh, this? Yeah. This is my little white old penis. Am I scaring y'all yet? Because I should be. <laughs> oh, God, man, my deck is super long right now. I could really bend over a nice little ultra boy and just give him a nice reach around. And if people have hung out with us for long enough here, this happens. <laughs> or more accurately. More accurately, what? Hold on. Oh, you're going to do to that crap, aren't you? <laughs> I think he's going to do to that crap. I don't know if my screen is visible or not. <laughs> 
It's not. I would have to disengage screen share on my end before you'd be able to engage it. Okay. So I'd have to do. do. Hold on. Oops. Um. There we go. I've disengaged. I'm blue. Da 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 da. I'm blue. Look, it's an infinite portal. <laughs> yeah. Infinite portal of doom. Oh, uh, yeah, nuclear weapon there. <laughs> now we have the full, uh... Bizarre really, bomb. Really Fifty megatons <laughs> of TNT. <laughs> it was the world's most powerful nuclear weapon, and it was developed by yours truly, the Russians. <laughs> more powerful than any atomic bomb ever developed, more powerful than any hydrogen bomb we've ever built. It was that no, it wasn't fifty. It was actually, it was actually more like that. Your your mic is really Do what? Your mic is back in yeah, the mic. Okay, that's better. As I was gonna say, that mic sometimes bothers me. It feeds back. Um <clears throat> The Tsar bomb was 150 megatons of TNT. 50 megatons is light in comparison. It was 150 megatons. It's like more powerful than four hydrogen bombs. Something like that. Soviets only detonated it twice. Ah, science. Hey, you know what? Uh, put that nuclear bomb thing back up again. Okay, hold on. Where is it? We're going to do the paradigm shifting nuke with appropriate uh, audio effect from my end. Now we can turn that back off. <coughs> oh man, that thing is so cool to watch in high def. Yo yeah, man, you can, we heard... you can disengage screen share now. Okay. You see my face? I'm blurred. <laughs> I got the, all along my desk here, my glass desk. I've got these these blue LED lights that are and that are coming out of my computer and powered by my computer, and they reflect like a blue. Yo, man, we heard you like mushrooms, so we put mushrooms on your mushrooms while your mushrooms were growing mushrooms. That's referring to the nuclear weapon. Radioactive mushroom. Oh, and you were telling me synchronistically there's also a new Conrad, the Constitution, out. Oh, yeah, I sure do. I could do it. Where is it?
Conrad the Constitution is funny. Just so polite. You could always post it on the Paradigm Shift Facebook page, too. Oh. Well, the more the merrier. <laughs> so, yeah, I, I think this probably concludes um, everything we need to say about this December culmination. Unless you feel I've left anything out, I think we covered all the different synchronicities and world events and all that other crap. No, we no, we left something out. We left William Cox's big black penis. Let's take a moment and appreciate the size of that dick. <laughs> Let's appreciate it with shape of New Zealand dicks in it. And once you get rid well, of something... Like well, that, everybody in the that, auditorium, that, please stand and acknowledge Mr. William Cox. <laughs> and now, NASA headquarters has used Schaefer's new dick removal. The big black cock has been removed. <laughs> Make a nasty sound, sound effect. <laughs> this is, uh, William Black. You're letting me down. You were supposed to be terrified of my creeping, creepy stalking. You weren't supposed to ignore me and then make fun of it a month later. <laughs> well, we kind of just, um, did. <laughs> if he DMCAs this, he is a complete retard. I doubt he's paying so much attention to us anymore. Most likely not. Well, if not, good. Because, I mean... <laughs> and this <laughs> isn't one of the videos I would stick into your group anyway, which he is still watching for reasons completely unknown to me. Yeah, I don't know why he still watches it. No idea. He's told all of his, his buddies, which is kind of a shame one of them drills seven on DeviantArt, if you get a chance to check his workout, do, it's awesome, I favor a lot of it. It's kind of a shame, but this guy, he posts a lot of really cool space photos and concepts, and he doesn't post his stuff in my group. I send requests, and they keep getting ignored, but whatever. It's of his free will choice and discernment to associate himself with who he wishes. I can only uh, make a request. You one of the ones aligned with William Cock, or what? I don't know. He's been what silent for the whole thing. Hmm. There's a couple of guys who have been that way, but who knows what they've been saying in notes. William Black might be pulling, <laughs> pulling the child. Well, I, can, of, um, I, can, I can think of one person who will probably never, ever see this video. Your DeviantArt boyfriend, who loves sending you love letters, all about me. Oh, God. He hasn't talked to me <laughs> since. You're just like, if you have a concern, take it up with Dave. And he's like, but I haven't blocked. I can't do that. It's like, um, why well, you got him blocked? He never did anything to you. <laughs> it's like, he just he's just like uncomfortable. He's just an introverted William Black. Instead of like outwardly spewing at everybody, he's just kind of goes inward and like, no, I don't want to look at anything. Mm -hmm. It's funny. It's like I, it's like choice. I yeah, I know. I, I felt like you know I could I could hardly like you know like like say hello with uh, to to anybody without like him being like, oh my god, Rich. Paradigm shifting said hello. Isn't it against some law somewhere? Is he trying to scare <laughs> everybody into his hello -ness? It's like, what the fuck? Dude's not smoking that he should be or what? I don't get it. It's just funny. 
He, he like, can't. What? He can't do that. That's that's against the rules, policies on something. Even though there's nothing stated on the rules that say it's a violation of anything. <laughs> I love how William Black is like. Your group specifically says don't steal artwork, and you stole artwork. And I'm like, what artwork? Right. Uh, my icon is artwork, and I'm like, oh, really? And by definition, my icon is artwork, too, and so is Dave Kelso, so that means we can DMCA you for even mentioning us. <laughs> yeah, is it that well, right, Mr. Right. Cock? <laughs> he would post these obsessive, compulsive journals about, about us. It's funny, it's like his hard-on was mostly with me, but it's like he's saying, well, well Dave Kelso represents NASA headquarters, so we're going to say NASA headquarters is stealing art. It's like, what? It... It's like, I'm like, what, one of like 20 admins? I think me being responsible for my own actions, which by the way weren't theft, it was just screen capturing a conversation, but you know, apparently screen capturing a conversation isn't freedom of information, it's art theft. Yeah, okay. no fucking kidding. It's just hilarious. It's hilarious the ones of stupidity. He has gotten plenty of watchers, by the way, which I'm very glad. I'm glad he's able to get watchers, which is good. You know, I just wish he would stop being a butthurt little whiny five-year-old bitch and just kind of man up, resubmit his shit to my group and unblock me, and I could unblock him, and we could just get along our merry way and just agree to disagree. But uh, no, he decides to be a little cut. But uh, no, that's to him, choice. he wouldn't be able to do that unless we bowed to him as God and Master of the Universe and admit that we're oh so wrong and we're so sorry for offending the great and almighty cock. That's the only way, which isn't happening. Oh well, no, because he's not right on any account, and even that right there, what I just said, would piss him off. He'd <laughs> be like, what? See, you're full of shit. I hate you. Fuck you. It's like, what? I can't disagree. No, you can't disagree that my cock is larger than everybody else's on the planet. If you do that, you're an asshole, and I don't want to deal with you. Maybe I do. Hello? I'd like to have a dialogue. <laughs> <laughs> Doctor. I'd like to have a, I'd like to have a log in your ass. But only if you're under 18, because I really like altar boys, and I'm going to school to be a bishop. <laughs> 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 I, I, I doubt he's even going to see this, because the only way he can see this is if, for whatever reason, he has taken it upon himself to watch every single one of my YouTube videos at full frickin' length, paying close attention, just on the off chance that he might be mentioned or something, you know. I mean, he would have to, like, get that creepy about it, and he would have to waste, like, God, tons of hours of watching things he don't give a shit about. <laughs> I could just totally see him with that black bowler cap on and those glasses and that digital form leaning over the computer just like st staring into it just like fuming and you can see the smoke coming Golly. out of his ears. I've been watching for 10 hours and I still haven't been mentioned yet. I'm offended. <laughs> Eyes don't revolve around me. I'm offended. <laughs> <sighs> it's really a shame that people are like that. You know, it's just like, come on, grow up. Especially with his friends, Nyrath Wiz and whatever that other guy is, uh, CW3 Bread or whatever, whoever the hell he's friends with. It's just like, you know. I'd like to be friends with you. Honestly, I wouldn't. I don't care about your opinions. Your opinions are cool with me, just as long as you respect my opinions and my beliefs and we can just come to terms of equal agreement. But, you know, we both have perspectives on the same situation. We both have the same information presented to us. We just interpret it differently. We can just respect each other's rights to, you know, 
And all I did... Mutually have our own views. All I did to get him going on, a, on his crusade against us was post a link to that video that's already been included in this hangout, the removing mental malware thing. I just said, oh, hey, you know, here's something you'll be interested in. I shot that off to him, and all of a sudden, <laughs> from that point forward, it was war, you know. It's like, I don't think there was anything in that video that was in any way offensive or derogatory. It's not like Larkin Rose is up there going, look, everybody who doesn't agree with me is a bunch of stupid fucks and blah, blah. You know, he wasn't like that. Oh no. oh, no, William Black, oh, he took it the wrong way. He bent his, he broke it, he broke his dick and stuck it up his own asshole when he did that. He's like, <laughs> oh, fuck. Oh, Dave is going to pay for this. And that you mm-hmm. pay, too. Boing. <laughs> Give me the loop there, boy. <laughs> oh, yeah. yeah, I mean, it's amazing what sets people off. And it's like that video wasn't even disrespectful or offensive. I think no. Larkin Rose conducted himself in a very respectful way, a very mature way. Mm-hmm. No, it wasn't offensive at all. It was, you know, it was very straightforward. And not only that, you know. It's just like, you know, all of that negativity that he generated has just done nothing but, you know, it ruins the experience for others, you know? It's just well, he, like, got your, you know, your, he got your group more watchers. <laughs> he did, yeah, he did, in the, in, the time, in the time being, he did. And, you know, even though it's kind of slowed down right now, but, you know, whatever. <clears throat> Given a year will go by. And you got a new watcher this day, actually. I got I got a I got a new watcher today too. Oh really? Well then that's two in the yeah, last three days. Yeah, it's kind of slowed down a little bit, but I mean, you know, it's nothing that's been. It's just kind of unfortunate though that all the guys that post really cool space stuff are kind of all pissed off for whatever reason. They're just not saying anything or whatever. They might just want to be avoiding the flack from Mr. Black. They don't want to be, you know. Caught in the middle of the drama, who knows what their real intentions behind it are, but you know. To me, it seems like Drill 7 from some of the comments I've seen is good buddies with Mr. Black, and the same with another guy, uh, Lord McResbiz, who posts some really cool stuff that I've seen. It's like, whoa, this is cool. Is also that way. I just have a feeling I know what happened. William Black is like, the William Wesley Crouch is like, you can't submit shit to that group because they bashed me. And if you submit stuff to that group, you're a traitor and you're scum. And I don't like you anymore if you submit stuff to that group. And I'll be butthurt if you do. If you're really my butt buddy, you'll 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 not submit things to that group. Even though that's probably not what he said, but still, I mean, it's just kind of like, it's kind of along those lines of the ass-kissing thing. It's like, you know, don't submit to them. They're mean, evil people. And, you know, with absolute, they're basically insulting, he's basically insulting their intelligence. Take my word for it. Don't take theirs. Don't do the research for yourself. Just look at my journals. That's all you need to know. Yeah, exactly. His journal- if they really understood, if they really understood the full picture of what was going on, he would be in so much deep shit. It's not even worth mentioning. His journal, but even not necessarily, depending on what their egos are. If their egos are in alignment with Mr. Black's, potentially not. And if that's the case, then I don't really want. To, then I really don't. Wow, my feedback. Then I really don't want to deal with them. Well, I think it. Yeah. I think it's funny how even in, in William Black's journals when he would make his accusations he would he would never point to any direct or direct evidence because obviously there was none whereas in anything I wrote I would quote and link directly you know so that people can read it for themselves instead of taking my word for it because I don't want people to believe me or disbelieve me or anything I'm, I'm no one's authority just you know 
just question everything and use your own discernment. And I'm not anyone you should believe or disbelieve. I'm just a regular human being like anybody else with my perspectives and you know people should uh, you know do their own homework so to speak and form perspectives of their own. I'm, I'm no authority over anybody. Mm -hmm, exactly. Yeah, he, and not only that, when he did post comments, it was always cherry-picked comments and cherry-picked stuff. He would just cherry-pick things, you know. And he'd science. Say, he, he, he'd be like, you know, uh, the DVNR copyright policy has an excellent page detailing misconceptions here, you know, and he'd act like it's legal advice. So we'd point out that it's legal advice, and then and he would rework that into something, and then... He just rework his comments and move shit around and you know try to make himself look good. Like, oh, I'm getting called on my shit over and over again. Oh shit! Um, I'm gonna spam the page with 25 comments of the same thing and then change around maybe two of them and make them look just a tiny bit different. So that way they're not exact clones. Oh shit! They caught on to that. Now they're saying I'm spamming. Oh well. I'm just going to post a whole bunch of other comments making derogatory claims and stupid arguments that can be beaten at the flip of a switch or the munch of a slice of cake. Reality is a cake, not a light switch. <laughs> but anyway, yeah, I think this wraps up the conversation quite nicely. I'm just... Yeah, it's, it's, yeah I think we'd said... Um everything that can be said about it. We've gone over all kinds of different paradigms and put things in, in parallel and into perspective and, you know, um, people are welcome to agree, disagree, or, or whatever, think this is great, think this whole thing is crock, or, you know, whatever people want to think, you know, that's cool. And, you know, if, if they've uh, suffered through this multi-hour video, then obviously they're getting something out of it. <laughs> Unless uh -huh. they're, they're William Cock, then they're just fuming like, no, you fucking shut up, bitch. <laughs> I fucking hate those assholes. They made fun of my dick. I'm depressed. So, yeah. Um, I guess I could say everybody have a good uh, day or night or whatever it is when you're watching this. And, uh, yeah, I guess, guess that's... Uh, pretty pretty much it so when you're watching world events and things in your life and stuff going on just remember to kind of put things in parallel zoom out look at the fractal and you know things uh, might make a bit more sense mm-hmm yeah <clears throat> well catch y'all yep catch y'all